Recorded books and one-click digital present Metal Town by Kristen Simmons, narrated by Sunila Nankani. Chapter 1 Colin Go halves with me. You want pigeon or rat? Ty swiped at her nose with the back of her hand, making the threadbare, fingerless glove bunch around her wrist. The cold had drawn bright blotches to the exposed skin between her hat and tattered scarf, and as the line to Hayek's corner cart shortened and pulled them beneath the yellow glow of the streetlight, Colin could make out the hooked scar on her chin and a fading brown bruise on her jaw. What's the difference? They all looked the same to Colin. Charred fists of meat. He stamped his feet and shrugged deeper into his wool coat. It was too big. Big enough to fit another sweater inside if he'd had one, which he didn't. The bitter pre-dawn wind clawed right up his stomach and back, freeze-burning his skin. Ty's thick, straight brows lifted, but refused to arch. One flies, prep school. Surprised you didn't know that. She snorted, revealing a crooked front tooth. Colin frowned. He hadn't been to school since he was 13, more than four years ago. That life was in the past. Rat, he said, because it was her least favorite of the two. And I call the nose. Course you do. She spat on the ground, then rubbed it into the cracked sidewalk with the heel of her boot. You talk. Hayek likes you better. That's cause I'm likable, Ty. He grinned now and she rolled her eyes. Another customer served and they moved to the front of the line. Hayek, a greasy man three times their age with a shock of white hair and a peppered beard, looked up from his rotisserie and grimaced. No, he said. No, not you two. Not today. Hayek cannot feed you today. You go away. Colin flashed his best smile and pulled off his hat in an attempt to look less shifty. Come on, Hayek. You said we could pay at the end of the week. No. He shook his finger at them sternly. No, you say you pay at the end of the week. Hayek say you can pay now. Colin looked over his shoulder and winced at the grumbling line behind him. Stepping off to the side, he cuffed the man's burly shoulder. You know I'm good for it, Hayek. You know I wouldn't lie. He hit a smirk as Ty eased up beside the cart behind him and stashed a handful of fry scraps up her coat sleeve. If he could just turn Hayek a little more, she could reach the black spit and the hunk of charred meat pierced on the end. The man directly behind her was crowding up in line, making a quick circle with his hand for Ty to pass him some. She raised a silent fist like she might punch him, and he fell back a step. Hayek, you're right. I should have given you money last week. Only I didn't get paid, okay? So it wasn't my fault. That much was true. Hampton Industries was fat on green. So fat, it didn't get off its lazy ass to pay its workers half the time. As Hayek shouted back, his face turned progressively redder and his eyes began to bulge. It was just a matter of time before he went for the tongs to beat Colin upside the head. Colin pulled his hat back down over his ears, taking the lecture with a feigned look of shame. Shifting left drew the cart man's gaze further away from Ty. She was just about to make a grab for the prize when motion behind her caught Colin's eye. A man approached, wearing clean trousers and a coat swollen with enough stuffing to make Colin shiver at his own lack of protection from the cold. He had that yellowed, sunless skin, pockmarked at the tops of his cheekbones, and long hair, greased nice, and pulled into a tail at the back of his skull. Jed Schultz, the people's man, the voice of the Brotherhood, the people who represented the workers' rights at the steel mill where Colin's ma was employed. He was flanked by a man twice his size, but half as bright. A hammer hired to watch Jed's back so the greenback bosses couldn't stick a knife in it. Colin thought his name was Iman, and had heard he'd come from somewhere in the mountains, north of the Tri-City. A place so cold your breath turned to ice before it left your mouth. Colin coughed once, and Ty abandoned her mission without so much as a glance up. 
Morning, Hayek, said Jed. He walked straight to the front of the line. Those who'd been waiting didn't mind. Jed did right by the poor folks, so Jed got whatever he wanted in Metaltown. Mr. Schultz, good morning, yes. Hayek recovered, keeping Colin in his sight. How's the bird? Jed asked. Good, good. I give you my best one. Here. Hayek stepped back behind the center of his cart and rotated the rotisserie once over the flames to warm the round carcass Colin had been eyeing. His stomach grumbled. Saliva filled his mouth. He'd eaten yesterday, but it felt like longer. He swallowed as Hayek wrapped the bird in paper and handed it to the people's man. Jed nodded, just slightly, cueing Iman to step forward and withdraw a wallet from the breast pocket of his coat. There was a stack of bills in the fold, and as he unfurled one after another, Colin's eyes grew wide as dinner plates. Jed was flush as a greenback. There was a bite of jealousy, then a swell of admiration. He wondered what it would be like, just once, to walk up to Hayek's cart and buy whatever he wanted. Your money's no good here, Mr. Schultz, said Hayek, a huge smile plastered across his face. Colin couldn't help gagging, to which Hayek responded with a glare. Good man, said Jed. Iman put his money away. Jed turned to Colin. You like pigeon, Mr. Walter? Colin's eyes went wide. He wiped his hands off on the front of his coat, aware of ten pairs of eyes that swung his way. They were surprised, Colin knew, that Jed knew his name. He was surprised himself. Yes, sir. Colin's mouth gaped like a fish when Jed handed him the steaming, charred meat. White bubbles of fat had already begun to congeal against the puckered skin in the cold. A good sign the bird was thick, not hollow. Whoa. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. How's Cherish, Colin? His eyes were dark and piercing. Powerful, Colin thought. He wondered if he was capable of such a commanding stare himself. Jed and Iman had stepped in front of Ty, and she was slowly backing into the line opposite them, head down, hat pulled over her ears. Colin gave her a puzzled look. It wasn't like Ty to back away from anyone, famous or not. She's okay. The money you sent helped. Thank you, sir. The doc said she needs clean water for drinking. That's what we bought. Colin had stiffened at the mention of family, but tried to play it cool. Jed didn't need to be bothered with all the details. Good boy, said Jed, nodding with interest. Colin relaxed. So, Colin, Hayden was supposed to meet me this morning. He say anything to you about it? Jed reached for another hunk of meat. Rat or pigeon, Colin couldn't tell, and returned Hayek's smile. Colin tensed again. His brother had grown unpredictable these last few years. Hayden was three years older than Colin, but had never adjusted to Metaltown the way Colin had. Ma said it was because he'd gotten his heart broken when they'd pulled him out of school. She didn't know the half of it. Colin's fingers were beginning to thaw beneath the crinkling paper holding the bird. Dawn was coming turning the darkness to the chronic steely haze that burned off the chem plant across the bridge in thick white plumes. The air had a sweet, heady odor that would only grow stronger as the day plowed on. He's been sick, said Colin. He did say he was going to meet you, but I guess he fell behind. He was up puking all night. Which was probably true, wherever he was. Colin hadn't seen him in two days. Ty's chin lifted in surprise before digging back into her scarf. Jed scowled. Not the flu, I hope. No, sir. Just ate something rotten. He was going to punch Hayden square in the face when he surfaced. Well, that's okay, then, said Jed. Since he's indisposed, maybe you can do me a favor. Jed leaned against the cart, tearing a hunk out of the meat in his grip with his chew-stained teeth. Colin took Jed's lead and bit straight into the wing. It was tough and gamey, 
but warm. He felt Ty's glare from behind Jed. Yeah, sure, okay, said Colin. A friend of mine lost his girl to the corn flu a few weeks past. He's been missing work, and I'd hate to see them lose their place over it. Colin nodded. Jed did this kind of stuff a lot. Just two weeks prior, Colin's ma hadn't made her quota at the mill, and the foreman had refused to pay her. Their cupboards were already bare, and just before the heat was shut off, Hayden came home with a wad of cash, courtesy of the people's man. It had been enough to keep their lights on and put food in their bellies for days. Jed stepped away from the cart, and the people in line tentatively resumed their shuffle. They live in Bakerstown, by the cat's tail. You know where that is? Sure, said Colin, taking another bite. He used to live in Bakerstown before he'd left school. Iman removed the wallet again, this time taking out a stash of green bills half an inch thick. Colin had to remind himself to keep chewing. Just one of those bills could fill six jugs with clean drinking water. Another could pay the power at his apartment through the next month. One more could mean food, real food, bread and beans and salted pork, for dinner, not just broth like they had every night. Can you take this down to him this morning? 114 Fifth Street. Colin waffled, glancing at Ty. She was shaking her head no, but when Jed followed his gaze, she immediately fixed her eyes on a hole in her shirt sleeve. He faced Colin again. I can count on you, right, Colin? Yeah, of course, Mr. Schultz. It's just that I've got work in an hour, and the cat's tail is way up Fifth Street. I mean, I'll do it. It's just, you know how the foreman gets if you're late. Colin couldn't afford to push his luck with Minnick. The man had fired two workers just last week for getting sick on the job, something that happened a lot on account of the hazardous material they dealt with. But he didn't want to get on Jed's bad side either, not after how good Jed had been to his family. Jed smiled. I'll talk to your foreman. You're in small parts labor, right? Yes, sir, said Colin. Good. Go ahead and take your pal. He stuck a thumb behind him in Ty's direction. Okay. The concern that had come into Jed's face while he'd been talking about the family dissipated. He slung a hand around the back of Colin's neck and gave a companionable squeeze. You're a good kid, aren't you? Remind me of me when I was your age. Man of the house. Colin grinned and felt his ears grow warm under his hat. Technically, Hayden was the man of the house, but Hayden wasn't here, was he? Colin wasn't so irritated that his brother had blown off Jed anymore. In fact, Hayden could go right ahead and stay gone as long as he liked. Iman handed him the stack of money, and Colin, fighting the urge to count it, folded it into the front pocket of his trousers. Say hello to Cherish for me. Jed turned back the way he'd come, disappearing into the gray smog. Colin felt ten feet tall. Breakfast, a personal hello from the biggest man in Metaltown, and the morning off work? It couldn't get much better than that. Wipe that grin off your ugly face. Ty snatched the remainder of the bird from his loose grasp. He pulled his hat back, smoothed one gloved hand over his buzzed head, and winked at her. Ugly, Ty repeated. Then they turned the opposite way, toward Bakerstown and the rising sun. Chapter 2 Ty Ty bit down on something that crunched and pulled a white shard of pigeon bone from her cheek. It was thin as a needle, and she used it to pick at the food stuck in the gaps between her teeth. She may not have liked where the feast had come from, but she wasn't about to turn it down. Pride didn't fill your belly like a roasted pigeon. Smells good out here, Colin said from beside her. She glanced over, but he wasn't smiling like he had been for the last mile. He was biting his pinky nail. She felt her own brows draw together in response. The air did smell cleaner. 
anywhere outside the grasp of the factory district did. But though the sun didn't have to cut through a filter of smog, it wasn't like the place was perfect. The poor ran thick here, crowding the street beside them, begging at each red brick shop front for food and work. Funny how they didn't come to Metaltown to beg for work. Don't lie. You know you love the smell of nitro in the morning, she said, glad to see his hand lower from his mouth and his grin return. The crumbling sidewalk they walked down ran beside an iron fence that twisted and spiraled like the ivy that clung to it. It would have been posh had the park within not grown over like a jungle. It was even stocked with wild animals. Dopers and sellers and the kind of people who knew how to get anything you wanted for the right price. At least half of them were in the earliest stages of the corn flu. She felt the switchblade lodged into her boot and another knife in her waistband. Always ready, just in case. How much did Jed's man give you? She asked, changing the subject. She would have suggested pocketing a few bills for themselves, but she knew better. Nothing was free in Metaltown. She'd bet a week's pay that Iman's muscle work wasn't limited to greenback thugs. I don't know, but it's burning a hole through my leg. Colin was thinking of lifting it, too. She knew he was. They were two like minds. Had been since she'd taken him under her wing four years ago, fresh out of prep school. She glanced his way, noticing the changes in him. Metaltown had made him hard. His sky-blue eyes had turned to steel, and his dark, shaggy hair had been shorn close to the skull to cut the heat inside the plant. Hands, used to writing facts and figures, had grown strong and calloused, and he had muscles, too, beneath those baggy clothes. She'd been eleven, and he'd been thirteen when they'd met, but their ages might as well have been reversed. He'd known nothing about work, and for some unknown reason she'd taken pity on him and called a safety. According to street rules, that made her responsible until he could stand on his own two feet. Now he was a leech. She couldn't shake him if she tried. Let's count it, she said, feeling a different, greedy kind of hunger take over. Even if they couldn't lift it, she could feel the paper in her hands and imagine what it'd be like to buy whatever she wanted. Yeah, right, he said, and his shoulders pulled forward again. We passed the beltway. We're on McNulty's turf now. One sniff of green and they'll be on us like flies on rot. Let him come, then, she said, tapping the handle of the knife she kept in her waistband. I'm not scared of any Bakerstown pansies. His barked-out laugh had her cheeks suddenly warm. Just like you were going to take Jed and his man, right? She fought the urge to sock him between the eyes. I could take him. Course you could have, he said. Iman only outweighs you by a hundred and fifty pounds. She tossed the bird carcass into the trash-filled gutter. I'll take you in a second. Such a tease. He shoved her off the sidewalk. She pushed him back, maybe a little too hard, irritated that all the layers of clothes she wore suddenly made her too hot. He bounced off the iron fence, laughing. The clang of a doorbell from one of the shops across the street drew their attention to a couple exiting a deli. They were flush. That much was obvious. Smart clothes. A black peacoat and slick leather shoes on the man, a swanky black dress on the woman, and clean brown skin. The woman's small, brimmed hat with its fishnet veil had Ty wondering what purpose such ridiculous clothes could possibly serve. The couple waited for the doorman to clear a path through the beggars, then headed down the sidewalk around the corner, making no attempt to hide the shiny, handheld diffusers they each wore on their waistbands. The crowd cleared around them. One shock from those things and a person would be out for hours. Must be hard being so damn rich, said Ty, wading through all this muck. It's disgusting, really. She hiccuped a laugh, pleased with herself, but Colin didn't find her funny. 
His eyes were round as he watched them go. What was wrong with him? He was standing taller and smoothing down the front of his shirt. He'd been acting strange all morning, ever since they'd run into Jed and Iman. She shifted her weight from one side to the other. They shouldn't have left Metaltown. Jed was trouble. She refused to trust a rich man she'd never seen work. He probably wasn't even going to keep his word and tell the foreman. Then they'd be sacked, and she'd be no better than these bums here, begging for a job. Colin had begun walking again. If I was flush, he said, I'd buy a separate sidewalk so me and my greenback friends didn't have to get our shoes dirty. Ty's shoulders loosened, and she fell into step beside him. If I was flush, I wouldn't walk at all. I'd make scraps like you pull me around in a cart. He smirked. If I was flush, I wouldn't even need a cart. I'd make scraps like you go get me everything I need. Anything for you, great one, she said. But her laughter failed when he lapsed into silence. Most of the time, the quiet didn't bother her. She preferred it, actually. There was nothing more annoying to her than mindless chatter. But here, so close to a home she knew he still missed, she felt a strange pressure to keep him talking. Where is Hayden, anyway? she asked, thinking back to the whole reason they were on this venture. And why is he working for Slick Jed Schultz? Collins scowled. He's not slick. He's all right. Ty took his answer to mean that he didn't know where his brother had landed. He was all doe-eyed again, thinking about Jed, and she didn't like that one bit. A couple stiffs in black uniforms walked by, and Ty pulled Colin down off the sidewalk so they could pass. Bakerstown police were as crooked as they came. Word was their chief was owned by Big Boss Hampton himself, who could use them as his own private army if the mood struck. They wouldn't take kindly to a couple metalhead kids with pockets full of cash. Here's Fifth, she said when they reached a corner. A bike messenger swept by them, nearly clipping Ty's arm. She swore and gave him the finger. Old, rusty cars were parked on the curb, relics from a time when gas wasn't just for the rich, before the war between the feds. Most people used them for shelter, though half of them had been dismantled for parts. A parking garage entrance came up on their left, and though their pace didn't quicken, both of them kept their eyes sharp. A lot of shadows in there, a lot of places for someone to hide. Two guys were sitting on the concrete exit ramp and jumped up as Colin and Ty approached. They were both shorter than Colin and well-fed, dressed in hand-me-down wool slacks, nice ones but not new, and shirts tucked into their waistbands. Their belts were painted green, flaking around the buckles. Muscle, hired by McNulty. Ty thought they looked soft and out of practice. Colin sighed beside her, which made her lips quirk into a small grin. But when a girl about their age sauntered out of the shadows with her shirt tied in a tight knot behind her lower back, the scowl returned to Ty's face. Well, hello, said Colin, eyes traveling from her darkly painted eyes and thick brown curls down her curvy form. She smirked and pushed her chest out, hand resting on one cocked hip. Ty made a noise of disgust. Let's see, said the first guy, a dark-skinned boy with dreadlocks. Holes in their boots, eyes dumb as a dead pig, and the stink of acid. Must be metalheads. His friend laughed into his fist. Colin smirked, then wiped his grin away with the back of his hand. Was that an insult, Ty? I just can't seem to catch on. He scratched his head. I think so, she shrugged. The other two looked at each other and laughed, but the lines around the first boy's eyes had gone tight. Damn, he said. That's a girl. Thought for sure she was a man. That's because she's twice the man you are, Colin shot back. 
His hand on Ty's arm stopped her from smacking those smirks right off their fat faces, even as her skin prickled with resentment. He'd meant it as a compliment, but it didn't feel that way. The girl giggled. Maybe at them. Maybe just to flirt with Colin. Girls were always losing their heads around him. He sent her a smile, blocked immediately by the second boy, whose hair was curled so tightly against his skull, it looked like it might break. Why'd you cross the lines, metalhead? You know better. Jed Schultz sent us to see a friend of his. Colin told them. Easy as he might have said, nice weather today, or say, you all have matching belts, how about that? Ty's jaw locked. Why was he pulling the Schultz card? They could have handled this on their own. It took a second for her to figure out he probably didn't want them finding out about the money in his pocket. Jed Schultz had immunity in Bakerstown, which meant they had immunity in Bakerstown. She wasn't used to that kind of protection. She wasn't sure she liked it. A reputation like that came with a cost. McNulty's boys sighed and took a step back. Yeah, all right, said the boy with dreads, the disappointment thick in his voice. Why didn't you say so? McNulty and Schultz go way back. I'll bet they do, said Colin. Jed was the white knight of the gray city, the middleman between the people and their wealthy employers at Hampton Industries. McNulty was the king of the underworld, a big northerner who made his money from the wealth of Bakerstown through girls and gambling and dope. Word was, McNulty used to run Metaltown before Jed came along. But after Jed won the workers over, he booted McNulty across the beltway. There was a truce in place. As long as their interests didn't clash, their people didn't clash. But that didn't mean they liked each other. Shouldn't you Bakerstown pricks be in school? Ty asked. I think I hear your teacher calling. School? Dred's patronizing tone made her hands curl into fists. Surprised you know what that is, she-man. Are they teaching factory workers to read now? His friends laughed. She laughed with them, despite the bite of annoyance. She could read. Kind of. We graduated early said the boy with the curly hair. McNulty handpicked us to run his crew. Least he got it right with one of you. Colin leaned around them to grin at the girl. She twirled her hair around one finger. Ty's eyes narrowed. Look, interesting as this is, some of us actually got things to do. A long, hard stare passed between her and Dreads, kicking up her pulse. He was the first to back down, bringing a smirk to her face. When he turned away, curly hair balked, but followed. McNulty's clan let them pass without further trouble, though Ty could hear them arguing with the girl all the way down the block. Still think he's slick, said Colin when they were out of earshot. Jed's even got Bakerstown showing some respect. Ty grunted. If McNulty was letting Jed do business in Bakerstown, it could only mean one of two things. That McNulty didn't see Jed as a threat, or that Jed was even worse than his Bakerstown rival. Either way, she would have rather they'd fought, better than hiding behind some slick's back. The intersection opened to reveal two twin stacks of apartments up ahead, cut down the center by the remainder of Fifth Street. The place was worn by the weather and by the hodgepodge add-ons that folks had done over the years. Tattered sheets and clothing hung to dry outside the windows, some of which were covered by cardboard or trash bags. Half the place was marked by graffiti, most of it green for McNulty's clan. Somewhere in the distance, a baby was crying. It was good, somehow, to see that even Bakerstown— the middle ground between the empty pockets of Metaltown and the high society of the River District, was just as sorry as where they'd come from. She hoped Colin saw that, too. Then he might stop thinking things were so much better across the Beltway. We're here. 
Colin stopped before a bar with dark windows and a set of stairs that went down into the entrance. The sign protruding from the doorfront said, Cat's Tail, in pale gold letters. Harsh words and harsher laughter filtered outside. Beside the stairs was another set of steps, these leading up to an enclosed concrete landing. They climbed around the paper trash and a stray tabby that hissed at Ty and stopped before the first door, 114 Fifth Street. Colin took a deep breath, reminding Ty to breathe, too. She registered the nerves in her belly then. They'd been brewing since she set foot out of her own territory this morning. They needed to get this over quickly and get back where they belonged. Colin knocked twice, and they waited. Stupid. Ty thought, for them to come now in the middle of the day. But Jed had said this man hadn't been to work in a while, so maybe he was home. They didn't wait long. From the inside came the sound of locks releasing one at a time. Three clicks, and then the door pulled inward. A skinny boy about their age, with yellow hair and dark rings around his swollen eyes, answered the door. He was wearing a thermal shirt and pants that were too short, and his apartment stunk of boiled cabbage. Ty heard Colin's quick intake of breath and braced defensively, but he didn't make a move. A second later, the stranger's eyes rounded with recognition. Colin? the boy said. What are you doing here? Chapter 3 Lena Lena set down her electronic reader and stared out the study window at the stone steps that led from the great room downstairs to the gardens and then to the dock. The river was bright blue, as it always was after a recent color treatment. An illusion, of course. The water was filthy. The street people from the surrounding districts bathed and laundered in it, and disgustingly enough, fished in it as well leaving it even more sludge-like than the sticky black oil water of the Whitewater Sea. "'Is there a problem, Miss Hampton?' asked her tutor, an angular, bird-like woman with a hooked nose. Her dark hair had become speckled with gray over the last year, and she wore it in a short cap around her skull. "'I'm tired of this, Darcy,' said Lena. She rubbed her eyes the satin fingers of her gloves making the perfect blue water disappear behind her fine lids. If I have to read one more word of this nonsense, I'll be forced to throw you in the river. Darcy flattened any expression she might have had and adjusted her simple black dress. Now, Miss Hampton, there's no need to be hostile. Not according to the advocates, she argued, pleased to have elicited a sigh from her tightly strong tutor. Hostility seems to be working quite well for them. Just last week she'd read that the advocates, Eastern Federation radicals desperate for food, had taken out a supply train headed toward the southern border. The contents, not rations but Hampton industry weapons, had all been stolen, a large painted A marking the side of the empty boxcar. For a group who claimed they wanted peace, they seemed to have no problem killing Northern Federation soldiers to get it. She glared down at her reader again. Poetry was useless, especially poetry in a foreign tongue. If the purpose was to make her worldly, she'd rather learn about the war and what news there was from the front lines. She certainly wasn't getting any information about it from her father and brother, who rarely included her in business discussions. The advocates are misguided, said Darcy, looking out the window now as well. Hunger makes people dangerous. Hungry or not, they were ignorant if they thought there was enough food and clean water for everyone to share. Resources were thin. Just last week, the Hamptons' cook had run out of bread for her morning toast. A flour shortage, he claimed. The effects of the crisis were felt even in the River District. Well... Crates of military-grade weapons make people dangerous, too, said Lena. Maybe they should try eating them if they're so hungry. Sometimes her father liked to say that it wasn't a war about resources, but a war about entitlement. P. 
people fighting for what they thought they deserved, rather than what they actually needed. Even the North, who claimed defeating the Eastern Federation's military would enable them to offer aid to the poor, starving citizens there, really just wanted their enemy's land. She wasn't naive. More than once she'd heard whispers during her father's parties at the house of what Hampton Industries could do if they expanded their factories into the Eastern territories. You've been doing some extra reading, I see. Darcy's thin brows pulled inward. There was a fine line between geography and politics, and her father's orders were that Lena only study the first. I read that their leader, Aquila something, wants a seat on the assembly, Lena pressed. The article about the supply train attack had mentioned as much. Apparently, he'd lived on the streets and worked in the cornfields. There were no pictures of him. Perhaps he was hiding, just like his advocates. She could hardly imagine a laborer from the East serving on a board entirely composed of northern citizens. Her father had served his elected six-year term alongside military commanders, police chiefs, and other businessmen and women when she was a child. Every other month, they'd met to discuss Northern Federation issues, to govern the North, including anyone from the Eastern Federation, much less the leader of a rebel group, would have been like inviting a traitor over for dinner. Perhaps he just wants their voice heard, said Darcy. Then perhaps he should tell his people to stop stealing our weapons and ambushing northern troops. Sometimes people feel opposition is the only way to get attention. A vein appeared on Darcy's forehead. She appeared as if she might say more, but her mouth snapped shut at the creaking of footsteps in the foyer. They both turned toward the front of the house, but the noise had stopped. It was probably a maid, dusting the hallway paintings. Let's return to the task, Darcy said quickly. Did you encounter a problem with the poem? I just want to know the poem, she said firmly, ending their previous talk. Yes, said Lena. She leaned forward in her desk chair. The bolts of fabric tightened around her waist and made it difficult to breathe. The problem is, it's pointless to learn the ancient languages when they serve absolutely no practical purpose in the real world. And what would you know of the real world, my dear? Lena stood sharply at the sound of her father's voice from the study door. Joseph Hampton was statuesque as always, his face clean-shaven, smooth as bronze, his black hair neatly combed. The gray suit he wore had been pressed to crisp lines. Its gray vest was open at the front, an indication that he'd just finished his morning meeting. She hadn't expected him home so soon. He normally kept to his office, a separate cottage on their estate, until evening. Lena smoothed down her hair, tucking a flyaway into the tight knot at the back of her neck. She cleared her throat noting the way Darcy's hands had folded in front of her hips and her head had fallen forward in respect for her employer. "'Good morning, father,' said Lena, unsure yet if his cool smile meant he was pleased to see her. She hoped he hadn't overheard too much. "'Good morning, Lena. Please, continue,' he said. "'You were just telling the tutor about the faults in your curriculum.' Lena's neck warmed. She lifted a gloved hand and waved off the comment. I was just trying to lighten the mood. She laughed. She couldn't hear Darcy breathing. Lena hoped she didn't plan on passing out. I only meant, continued Lena, that I wish I could study something more useful. The old languages get their best use as party tricks these days. Everything now is in the common tongue. Joseph's face did not change. And what if I told you an education in the arts is one of the few things that separate us from the working class? Lena turned back toward the window, wondering how it was possible that her father, the most brilliant man in the Northern Fed, could be so impractical. Then I would say that Hampton Industries rests on the backs of the workers, not the back of the arts. 
and that there are a great many other things that separate us beside that. Circumstance, for instance. Circumstance, chided her father. Is that what children are calling money these days? She wouldn't know. She rarely socialized with others outside of committee parties, and her father didn't approve of her mingling with the families of their subordinates. The Hamptons remained untouchable, leading the Northern Federation's Tri-City area, the River District, Bakerstown, and the Factory District, in revenue. But they hadn't always been so fortunate. Her great-grandfather had worked his way up from poor means, living in a space smaller than her bathroom, while he built the foundation of their empire. She often imagined him alone, tinkering with various forms of ammunition in his tiny shop, while the people who would one day make him rich squabbled outside on the streets. Because of his diligence, her family had a legacy, one that thrived on a bloody violence they would never see up close. Their various factories manufactured military supplies, bombs, guns, all grades of weapons and ammunition. A necessary business, according to her father. The survival of the Federation depended on it. Miss Hampton, piped Darcy, perhaps we should study outside today. It's quite lovely. Lena chewed the inside of her cheek, unable to turn around and face her father for fear of the disappointment in his eyes. She didn't know why her mouth ran away with her sometimes. But Joseph had begun to laugh, a deep, honest sound of amusement. Lena faced him then, consciously holding back a smile. Such a sweet girl, he said, dark eyes gleaming. Darcy, perhaps you should be teaching Lena a trade of some kind. Welding, perhaps, or sewing. There are always open positions in the kitchen. Lena acknowledged the chill in the room and forced her chin to stay level. I meant no disrespect, father. He smiled at her and approached slowly, stopping a few feet away. I know, he said. It's in your nature to question. I sometimes wonder if you had a mother. He trailed off eyes focusing on the river outside. Lena felt herself drawn forward, wanting to hear more. He rarely spoke of her mother apart from when he was acknowledging Lena's faults. She felt an emptiness creep into her chest, a feeling of loss. But that was ridiculous, of course. The only mother she'd ever known had been her nanny, and even as a child, Lena had wished for more. The woman was no more bound to the Hamptons than the rest of the staff. What was she like? Lena found herself asking. She was beautiful, like you. If he'd meant it to be a compliment, she couldn't help feeling disappointed, like there was little else to her. I was thinking I could work, Lena said. Perhaps not in the kitchen, but somewhere else. Surely there's something I can do for the factory? Otto can barely keep up the books for his division. Your brother is still learning responded Joseph. He's only been manager for a year. He'll figure out what needs to be done. He'll run it into the ground, Lena said under her breath. She'd heard her brother just last week telling the foreman to do whatever he wanted, just as long as the division's output increased. If she had to guess, she'd say he hadn't spent more than an hour in his factory in the past month. If her father knew Otto was drinking his days away at the boathouse, she doubted he'd have such confidence in his tone. But since you are so eager, there is something you can do, said Joseph, either not hearing Lena or ignoring her. We'll have guests this afternoon. Clients, the kind with deep pockets. I'm sure you recognize the importance of fostering such relationships. Yes, father said Lena, sparking with hope. Clever girl, he said. You'll sing for us, I hope. Let them see the Hamptons' softer side. Lena's shoulders fell. He didn't want her to sit in on the meeting, to be part of the negotiations. Of course he didn't. Otto was called in for whining and dining, and she, just a year his junior, would be the entertainment 
Her father faced her, waiting for her gaze to rise and meet his. When it did, he nodded once and left the room. Lena climbed the stairs to the third story, the heels of her shoes clicking with each contact against the cherrywood floor. In the hallway mirror, she caught a glimpse of herself and paused, blowing out a controlled breath she hoped would dispel the flush that had climbed her neck and blossomed on her high cheeks. Automatically, one hand went to smooth her black hair, though it hardly needed a touch-up. It was neat and flawless, as were her olive skin and the arches in her brows. Not alluring, not like the women that attended her father's parties with their wealthy patrons, but polished, so like her father. She sighed in frustration, removing one glove to fix her makeup. Leaning toward the mirror, she could see her amber eyes clearly, and wondered, as she had a thousand times, if her mother's eyes had been this strange lion's color. Her father's and Otto's eyes were dark, nearly as dark as the black hair they all shared. Perhaps that was why he favored his son so much more than his daughter, because he was a nearly perfect replica of the powerful, untouchable Joseph Hampton. Quickly, she replaced the glove and continued past Otto's bedroom to her own. Her quarters were large, composed of a sitting area, walk-in closet, bathroom, and sleeping room. Antique furniture had been sparsely arranged by her family's interior designer. Lena moved immediately to the window, before which hung a white decorative cage, half her height, and shaped like the palaces across the sea. Inside was a bird, a brilliant yellow canary that trilled a happy greeting and hopped sideways along the wooden dowel. Good, Lena said. Why don't you go downstairs and sing for father and his colleagues if you love it so much? She poked one finger through the cage, frowning when the songbird only tilted his head from side to side, but drew no closer. When he warbled again, Lena's lips turned up into a small smile. He was extraordinary. She'd thought so since her father had brought him home three years earlier from a business trip. They'd set up the cage together, one of the few tasks not left to the servants, and he told her she must take care of him herself in order to learn the value of responsibility. Sometimes she wished her father would come upstairs to see what a good job she'd done, but he rarely came to this level, unless to look for Otto. Pretty thing, Lena murmured, longing to feel the soft, downy feathers, but only feeling the inside of her glove. Outside, the breeze rattled the gray limbs of the oak tree against her windowpane. How exciting, said Darcy, stepping into the room in one jerky movement. What will you sing, I wonder? Her tone didn't reflect her words. She was always on edge after a visit from Lena's father. Lena rose, already defeated, and walked to the table beside the tall bureau where she kept her clothes. I don't think it really matters, do you? In the center of the room, Darcy had already begun rifling through the sheet music on its intricate wire stand. Something that shows your range, I think. Not that piece you performed at the last recital. Something classic. Your father will like that. Darcy wasn't listening to her. She had a way of picking through a conversation and only extracting the things she wanted to hear. It was that way with all of Lena's servants. All but one. Ignoring Darcy, Lena went to her sleeping room and closed the curtain separating the chamber. Her bed was neatly made, the plush gold comforter hanging nearly to the floor, a menagerie of decorative pillows scattered around the head. She kneeled beside the mattress and shoved one hand beneath it until she came upon what she was seeking. A doll no larger than her fist, handmade from rope that had once belonged to a mop. Smiling wistfully, Lena laid down the doll's dress and removed her glove once again to feel the knotted rope that made up the head. Then, taking care, she placed it back in its hiding place, where the servants could never take it out with the garbage. Chapter 4 Colin Colin, you know this kid? 
Ty sized up the tenant before them, eyes scanning over his lanky arms and tired face, as if he might try to get tough. Colin knew better. Gabe Wachowski was a runner, not a fighter. Had been since they were kids. But that didn't mean Colin knew what to say. His mouth opened, then closed like a fish's. He wiped a line of sweat off his brow. The apartment was hot as a damn furnace. Gabe's family had lived down E Street, not on Fifth. It pissed Colin off that they lived here. Bakerstown held enough memories of what he'd had to leave behind without him running into old ghosts. What are you doing out here? Gabe asked, glancing at Ty with a confused expression. I thought you moved. I did, said Colin finally. Sorry, took me a minute to remember how I know you. He didn't know why he said it. Four years was a long time, but the guy didn't look that different. Not like Colin did. Standing in the doorway of the Wachowski's home, he became acutely aware of the holes in the elbows of his coat and the scars slicing through his eyebrow, a badge he'd earned in a fight a few years back that served as a warning to others that he wasn't afraid to take a hit. But as Gabe glanced over it, the look on his face was more pity than fear, and Colin didn't know what to make of that. School, the boy frowned. Gabe Wachowski. Right, I remember now. We had class together every year. He turned to Ty. Assigned seating charts. They always put you in order by your last name. Yeah, they do that in the factories, too, said Ty with her usual bite. Colin wished she'd stop glaring at him. You work in the factories? Gabe asked her. In Metaltown? Is this kid for real? Ty jabbed a thumb his direction. Gabe's face turned red. Colin cleared his throat. Listen, Gabe, we need to talk to your dad. They were here for business, not to catch up. Maybe flush schoolboys didn't have to work, but Colin had responsibilities. Gabe withdrew into the house and let them in. It was a small apartment for Bakerstown, dingier than the Wachowski's old place on East Street. They could hardly take a step before bumping into a blue patchwork couch, which they had to shuffle by sideways in order to get into the kitchen. The walls were decked out in old lady needlework pictures, flowers and such, and several pairs of shoes that had been kicked off randomly across the floor. Colin remembered when he'd had more than one pair of shoes. He remembered when he'd had a bicycle, too, like the one hanging from a hook against the back wall. He and Gabe used to race home from school. Ty crinkled up her nose at the cabbage boiling in the pot over their single burner stove. It was hotter in here. The oven was cranked high and had been left open to heat the room. Dishes, coated with crud, were stacked up on the counters. A fly buzzed against the window frame. There's stew, said Gabe, picking through the mess in the sink. It's mostly cabbage, though. Smells like it, said Ty. Not as good as pigeon, huh, Colin? He winced when she elbowed him in the ribs. So you live in Metal Town? Asked Gabe, testing the word again. I thought your family did all right. Who said we don't? Asked Colin. Oh, right. I only meant... I thought you were moving uptown, that's all. I thought that's what you said. Gabe scratched his head. Looks like you heard wrong, said Ty when Colin didn't respond. Colin loosened the scarf around his neck but didn't take it off. His eyes flicked down to a worn book on the kitchen table and stumbled over the title. Flight of the Fox, it was called. Probably a kitty book with a name like that. Maybe Gabe had a screw loose or something. It had been a long time since Colin had read anything but factory manuals. Well, I'll just go get my dad then, said Gabe after another moment. He wound his way around the chairs and down a narrow hallway. You going soft in the head? whispered Ty. 
If it's bad blood, let's just drop the green and be done with it. Colin didn't know what was wrong with him. It wasn't bad blood. In fact, he and Gabe had hung out together as kids, so it didn't make sense why this apartment, which was twice the size of his place over the beltway, seemed to be shrinking. Or why he didn't care what Gabe had been up to for the last four years. Or why he wished Ty had stayed in Metaltown. Colin. A man in a loose-fitting shirt and slacks approached from the back of the apartment. He was fair-skinned, like his son, with light hair that had lost some of its luster over time. He smiled warmly, but his eyes were tired. Only then did Colin remember that Jed Schultz had sent them here because Mr. Wachowski had lost his daughter to the corn flu. He pictured her now, red hair, mouthy, always trying to tag along. She'd been a few years younger than him. Callie or Kaylee or something. Hi, Mr. W., said Colin. I... I heard about your daughter. We came to pay our respects. Mr. Wachowski's face fell. Thank you. He nodded slowly. And how is your family? Your mother? And her friend, I heard. His voice broke. They're real good, thanks. Colin glanced down at the book again. What about you? Gabe says you're working in the factory district. Colin pulled at his scarf, wishing they'd crack a window to let in some air. The room was as hot as the factory floor. Just for a little while, he said. Then I'm going to the coast, a place called Rosie's Bay. My brother was out there for a while working a fishing boat. One of those rigs that go way past the oil slicks to the clean water and net sharks and tuna and stuff. Real stuff, not the synthetic kind. I'll be doing the same. He pictured the route he would take from the train map Hayden had brought home not long after his return. The Northern Federation was mountainous, marked by swells and potholes where the people and the smog had gathered and stuck throughout the ages. Winding through valleys, the train would climb the Yalens higher and higher until you could look down and see the southern border of the Eastern Federation, where most of the fighting took place. His brother had told him the North's military guarded the supply trains heading toward the ocean. Once he got to the water, it was just a matter of walking the coastline until he reached his destination. That sounds wonderful, said Mr. Wachowski. It is said Colin. He saw Rosie's Bay clearly in his mind, just as Hayden had described it. Green cliffs cutting down into the frothy waters of the Whitewater Sea, a small fishing village right on the sand, lots of space and as much food as you could catch. Mr. Wachowski nodded. It's a good day when friends come calling. Behind him, Gabe shifted and moved something across the stained carpet with his bare foot. You have some good friends, I guess, said Colin, feeling more at ease talking to Gabe's dad. Like Jed Schultz. Mr. Wachowski's face shot up. His eyes had narrowed. Why do you say that? Ty, who could always read a room, sucked in a breath. Colin reached in his pocket his fingers, calloused and cracked from the cold in the factory, closed over the smooth bills, and he felt a pang of regret. With this kind of money, he could set up his folks and get the hell out of Metaltown. He could be on the northern coast within the month. But Jed Schultz had been good to his mother when few others had. He wasn't about to stick a knife in the man's back. Gabe, go to your room, said Mr. Wachowski suddenly. Dad, I... Go. Colin scowled, seeing his old friend bow like the child he'd once been and withdraw into the shadows. Mr. Wachowski stepped forward. Please thank Mr. Schultz. Tell him we could not be more appreciative. Tell him that, will you? Tell him we're fine without his money. And I will return tomorrow to work. His voice had gone all wobbly and thin. He didn't want you to lose your house, explained Colin. He wasn't mad or anything. He was just trying to help out. Of course, 
said the man, eyes so round you could see the whites circling the brown irises. His gesture will never be forgotten. I was planning on returning tomorrow anyway, and my wife's pay has covered the rent this month. We are all right. But, come on, said Ty. Let's get out of here. Jed told me to give you this money, insisted Colin. Turning it down is crazy. Colin, said Ty. She grabbed his arm. He shook her off, staring at the old man who seemed to wither before him. Colin didn't like that, either. He didn't want Mr. W. to be afraid of him. The man was acting like a child. Here, Colin said, slapping the money down on the arm of the couch, where it spilled across the floor. No. Mr. Wachowski dove to the ground, scooping it up like melting snowflakes. Still on his knees, he shoved it at Ty, who took it with a look of bewilderment on her face. She stuffed the bills into her coat pocket. Colin couldn't believe it. When someone offered you something so generous, you didn't turn it down. You said thank you and used it to keep a roof over your head. Fine, he said. I guess you were right, Ty. Bakerstown is full of pricks and pansies. Mr. Wachowski's jaw locked, but he didn't say another word. As Colin left, he saw Gabe in the hallway, braced with a tire iron over one shoulder, but looking more like a kid than ever. Chapter 5 Ty They moved fast out of Bakerstown, like their own shadows were chasing them. Fast enough to make Ty's shins burn, but not fast enough to leave Colin's dreams and demons back where they belonged, in the past. She watched him, ready, but for what she didn't know. His shoulders were bunched, his fists bald, his eyes shifting side to side, looking for a fight. She felt strangely powerless, and had the urge to hit something just to know she still had control over herself. It wasn't until they'd crossed the empty beltway marking the barrier to Metaltown that Colin finally exploded. Stupid, hard-headed bastard! He kicked the ground and sent rocks spraying into the concrete partition separating the empty lanes. How could someone turn down that much green? That was two months' rent. At least, said Ty. At least, repeated Colin. I get he's sad about his daughter. I get that. But come on. That's no excuse to be stupid. Ty kept walking, hands in her pockets on the cash. It felt dirty, just like slick Jed Schultz. What's with you? she asked. Why do you care so damn much? I don't. Right, she said. You must think I'm pretty dense, prep school. Stop calling me that. He turned on her, stare burning, and she glared right back at him. Then stop acting like it. Ty's voice echoed off the empty streets. You're not one of them anymore. You don't belong there anymore. You think you're all big and bad because stupid Jed Schultz knows your name? Well, you're not. You may have been high and mighty once, but you're scum just like me and the rest of Metaltown now, and don't you forget it. She was breathing hard, watching his face change from fury to shock and back to fury. How, he said through his teeth, could I ever forget it? Something pinched inside of her. She hadn't meant to spout off like that. She didn't know how he got under her skin the way he did sometimes. That guy's dumb as a rock, she said finally. Forget him. Forget this whole place. He started walking again, and she walked a few feet back, feeling the anger still clouding the air around him, hating herself for adding to it. Push him back home, she thought. He'll be all right. Just get him back home. Jed won't be bent at you for bringing the money back, she said. I don't care if he is, said Colin. But his tone told Ty differently. It was important that he play nice with Jed. If he didn't show he was grateful, 
Jed wouldn't give Colin's family a bump. And if they didn't get the money, Colin was going to lose Cherish, just like Gabe Wachowski had lost his sister. She hated Jed Schultz. They wouldn't have even had to come to this stupid place, and Colin wouldn't be in such a bad spot now if it weren't for him. Let's just steal it, she said. Go to that place you always talk about. Go fishing. The sky was growing overcast, a change that had nothing to do with the weather, but with the chem factory across the river. Rosie's Bay, he said after a while. Yeah, she said. They'd never go there, of course. They'd never get out of Metaltown. But it was nice to think about sometimes. Jed's office was at the back of Market Alley, where the vendors set up their wares in hand carts and canvas tents, or sometimes right on the ground. Most anything he wanted could be found there. Clothing, ripped off from Bakerstown or the River District, discarded food that hadn't met control standards at the testing plant, and piles of junk to swap, teapots and cracked dishes and scrap metal. It was late in the afternoon by the time Colin and Ty picked their way down the main drag. Colin had taken the money back from Ty a few blocks back and stuffed it in the hidden breast pocket inside his coat. Market Alley was full of pickpockets, and someone could stand to make a fortune if Ty and Colin weren't careful. They came to a water cart, and Ty gave up her last two coins to buy them both a drink from the metal cup. As soon as she was finished, she wished she could hand over one of those bills in Colin's pockets, but knew that wasn't an option. She found herself hungry again, passing by a fire pit, edged with bricks. A little woman with short black hair and close-set eyes shoved a skewer of yellow bulbs in Ty's face. Roaches, she said. Crispy. Try a wing. Ty felt a sudden clenching in her gut. Anything fried was dipped in cornmeal batter, and anything on the street hadn't passed food inspection standards. Roadkill was one thing. Synthetic corn, another. And even if she had occasionally taken her chances, she wasn't about to do so in front of Colin, not with Cherish in the shape she was in. At Ty's dismissing wave, the vendor's eager smile flipped upside down. Colin chuckled as she flung curses at their backs, and Ty felt a knot loosen inside of her at the sound. There was something strangely comforting about metalheads. What you saw was what you got. At least that was the way with most metalheads. Ty cringed as the warped wooden door at the back of the alley came into view. Two clasped hands, the mark of the Brotherhood, were carved into a sign hanging from a peg just below a peephole. As they approached, the door pushed outward and Iman wedged his enormous body through the opening. What am I supposed to say? Colin said under his breath. Iman stepped aside, allowing them entry. It was creepy the way he never talked. Ty found herself wondering if he had a tongue, if he was one of the poor, unlucky saps who burned their mouths out in food testing. Tell him the guy wasn't home, said Ty, suddenly worried that Jed really would be mad they'd botched the delivery and what that would mean for the both of them. Colin nodded, and they stepped through the dark entry into a tight corridor. Iman squeezed past them, sending a jolt through Ty as he brushed by her. She didn't like tight quarters like this. She preferred an open area, enough room to move, to defend herself if necessary. Colin walked just behind Iman, making an immediate left into a small office, thick with the bittersweet stench of cinnamon cigarettes. Fancy stuff, Ty thought not your typical hand-rolled tobacco. Jed was sorting through some papers atop his desk while he stood behind it, a heavy scarf hanging loosely around his neck, despite the warmth of the room. He'd changed since this morning. He was wearing a clean suit, beige with fancy black stitches, but his hair was just as greasy as ever. There he is, said Jed as they entered. He didn't even glance at Ty, and she was glad for it. Hi, Mr. Schultz, said Colin. He sniffled and wiped his nose with the back of his hand, then reached into his pocket and withdrew the money, carefully folded, 
just like when it had been received this morning. Jed's smile melted, and in its place flashed a look so cold it made Ty's spine tingle. Bad luck, eh? With his words came an expression of understanding. Colin released a breath he'd been holding, but Ty was still on edge. Sorry, said Colin. We went to the place you said, but no one was home. He placed the money on the desk before Jed and took a step back, bumping into Ty. If you ever need anything else, I'm good to help, he added. Jed picked up the bills slowly, flattening them in his hand and counting them one by one. The tension thickened the air between them. Colin's face darkened. I didn't take any of it, sir, he added. I know that, son, said Jed, continuing to count. You're a good man, like I said. They waited. Ty glanced back toward the door, but Iman was still blocking it. Her toes stretched to the ends of her boots. I used to work in small parts like you back in the day. Did you know that? Asked Jed, still counting. Ty rocked forward and back on the balls of her feet. I was about your age when some slots opened up at the stamping mill. It was a pretty ugly place then. Wasn't unusual to go weeks without pay, or have the foreman knock you around for looking at him wrong. McNulty let it all slide. He used to run this town back then. At the name of his old rival, a wistful look spread over his face. I know it's not perfect now, but it's better. You know why it's better? Because of the Brotherhood, answered Colin. The corner of Jed's mouth lifted, but he didn't look up from his task. That's right, because of the Brotherhood. I started the Brotherhood because the people needed protection from the men upstairs and the gangsters that controlled them. Because they needed someone they could trust to take a hit when they couldn't. Or help them meet the rent when they were short. That's what the Brotherhood does. It helps people. For a small fee, of course. Ty knew what the Brotherhood did for the stamping mill. The employees handed over 20% of their pay to Jed Schultz, and that tax went to help the needy. Small parts didn't have a brotherhood. Small parts was made up of small people, kids, and no one cared if a kid got a check or if a kid worked long hours because kids were hardy and had their folks to fall back on. Well, not all kids. When Jed got to the bottom of the pile, he pulled two bills out and handed them back to Colin. For your troubles, he said, smiling. You could use some new trousers, looks like. A sweater, too. It's cold outside. Ty swallowed. She willed Colin not to take it. Owing money to the wrong sort was worse than being poor. But what choice did he have? Like Colin had said earlier, when you got a generous gift, you took it, and you survived. Thank you, said Colin. He reached for the bills, but Jed didn't let go when Colin went to pull back. Ty's jaw tightened. Sick joke, she thought. So they were in trouble after all. Colin, you don't have to lie to me, said Jed softly, leaning forward over his desk. Sir? They didn't want the help. No problem, said Jed. I didn't intend to make anyone feel awkward, least of all you. He released the green into Colin's hand. I... okay, said Colin. I just couldn't believe he didn't want it, I guess. Jed laughed then, and Colin joined in weakly. Isn't that the truth, said Jed. Some folks just don't know what it means to struggle. Not like you and me, huh, kid? Colin nodded. Sorry, Mr. Schultz. It won't happen again. All right said Jed. Get out of here. The foreman at Small Parts is expecting you back in an hour. Why don't you get some new things before then? With the conversation closed, they left the office, but the cinnamon smoke had given Ty a headache and left a nasty taste in the back of her throat. 
Colin bought new wool trousers that only had a couple fixable rips in the back pocket. He bartered fiercely with a vendor over a pair of boots, but when it was all done, ended up with a fleece blanket thrown in for half off with a thick knit sweater. Wanted this anyway, smirked Colin, folding the blanket under one arm as they exited Market Alley. You sure you don't want anything? I still got some change. No, said Ty quickly. She had a bad feeling about spending Jed's money. A feeling like he might want it back someday. Suit yourself, said Colin. Just past the alley on Factory Row was Whore's Corner, where half a dozen girls were flaunting their goods. They were all fishnet and cleavage, even as the cold patched up their skin, and Ty swung into the street to give them a wide berth. She'd work doubles every day for the rest of her life, long as it meant she could keep her clothes on. As they passed, a blonde in red leather whistled at Colin, and he winked back at her. Two for one, baby, called another. She opened her waistcoat and flashed them. I work for small parts, too, she cackled. I still got some change, Colin repeated, tripping over his own feet. Ty pushed him on past the daunting stone archway that marked the entrance to Division One, the stamping mill owned by Hampton Industries, just like the rest of Metaltown. Even outside, you could hear the loud crunch and squeal of metal through the tall, barred windows behind the gate. Another block, and they came to small parts, a fat, deep building just as gray and drab as the rest of Factory Row. There were no windows here. No chance for break-ins, or break-outs, as the case may be. That was because small parts worked in explosives. Not all the unstable stuff. That was done at the chem plant just across the river. But in the back of the factory, in a corner they called the hot room, was enough white phosphorus to blow the cap off half a city block. So small parts was kept locked down with a deadbolt across the door and a signed contract that sent thieves straight to lockup in the district prison. Ty didn't have to read well to know the sign said, Hampton Industries, Division 2. They passed the front double doors, there more for show than anything else, and rounded the alley to the employee entrance on the west side. Ty had never been late before, and the nerves were already dancing in her stomach, when Colin banged three times on the metal grate. Jed Schultz better have kept his word and talked to the foreman. Colin stepped back as the familiar sound of a chain pulled off the inside handle. A moment later, the door flung open to reveal a short, ill-tempered man with a glistening bald spot right on the top of his head. Minnick, his thick red brows furrowed, glanced down the alley as if to make sure they weren't followed, then picked out a sore on his grisly jaw. I bet you two think you're pretty hot stuff, don't you? He growled, sending the Brotherhood to my door. I thought it was Hampton's door, said Colin. Ty shot him a quick glare. Oh, very nice, very nice. Schultz got you on the payroll, does he? Guess you won't be needing your job here anymore, then, will you? Smartass. Colin, warned Ty. They were two of the most productive workers on staff, but that didn't mean Minnick wouldn't fire them. The foreman was a pain, but not someone you wanted to push. Mr. Schultz said he talked to you, Minnick, that you should expect us back this afternoon. Oh, my apologies, bellowed Minnick. Yes, my liege. I have indeed been expecting you. May I show you to your regular station? He grabbed Colin's collar and jerked him down. Ty's hands fisted in her pants' pockets, fighting the urge to strike out in defense. Brotherhood has no jurisdiction over small parts, you little brown-nosed rat. Brotherhood protects the stamping mill and the chem plant, the grown-ups. You know who protects small parts? Me and I'm about to take real good care of you. White-flecked beads of spit sprayed from his mouth onto Colin's cheeks. One ruddy fist wound back, daring them to do something, anything. 
Colin didn't even flinch. We can work something out, said Ty. Overtime, janitorial. I know you got something for us. She hated giving in to slime like Minnick, but where else were they going to go for work? They weren't old enough to catch a shift at the chem plant, and she'd rather die in food testing than start working a corner like the whores outside Market Alley. Colin breathed in slowly through his nostrils, then stuck a hand in his pocket and retracted a handful of coins that he held out for the angry foreman. Oh my, oh my, said Minnick. Now we're talking. Something shiny for your good friend, Minnick. That's right, mumbled Colin. What else you got? Let's see that scrap of blanket there. What else? New duds? Given to me by Mr. Schultz, said Colin. And even if Minnick talked a hard game, Ty knew he wouldn't try to steal something Jed had given Colin. He liked to rough up the kids, but when another adult dressed him down, he practically pissed himself. Minnick spat a brown wad of chew out the corner of his mouth while he considered this. Get your asses inside, he finally said. Cross me again and you're done here. Ty exhaled. They followed him in, placing their personals and weapons in the employee lockers while Minnick bolted the door. Colin, still grumbling over the lost green, stripped down to a thermal, frayed around the neck and thin enough to show patches of his skin. Ty glanced away quickly. Fool should have bought one of those when he had the chance. She took off her coat and hat, but kept on all three sweaters she wore. She'd grown used to the heat of small parts. It wasn't comfortable, but it was a lot better to be hot than to remind a room full of guys that she wasn't exactly built the same as the rest of them. They picked a high locker, like always, where anyone trying to lift anything would have to make an obvious show of it. No one tried much anyway. Stealing got you fired as fast as fighting. And besides, they all came in and out at the same time of day, for the most part, anyway. Past the metal detectors, from out on the floor, came the familiar grind of gears and the consistent hum of the supply belt. The heat hit Ty like a furnace, and with it, the sharp tang of sweat. She moved to the rail, looking down over the factory floor at the hundred young workers who stood at their line stations, as they had since dawn. Cutting tube casing or fuses, attaching wiring to batteries, springing the waterproof coils, placing their finished products on the belt that snaked across the floor. This was what Ty had done every day for half her life, ever since she'd been kicked out of the orphanage and sent to find work. It was better than begging. That's what she always told herself, anyway. Uh-uh, said Minnick from behind them. I think we're going to go with that idea you had earlier. Janitorial, right? I don't believe anyone's cleaned my toilet since last summer. We'll start there, then move to the floor latrines. How's that sound, little rats? Ty sighed. Better than begging. Chapter 6 Lena The businessmen came in the late afternoon and gathered in the parlor room on the bottom floor of the Hamptons' home to smoke cigars and drink. Otto, a younger, less serious version of Joseph, had graced them all with his presence, wearing a pressed black suit to match Lena's floor-length gown. Their attire was one step more formal than the rest of their guests. There was never any doubt whose children they were. Lena was positioned in the center of the room, fully exposed on all sides. Eight men, including the two from her own family, surrounded her, and half a dozen of the house staff were serving liquor and hors d'oeuvres. Otto was near the bar, speaking to a man she'd never seen before. Middle class, from the look of his suit, and with a tail of hair that hung down to his sweat-rimmed collar. Her mouth tightened with disapproval as her brother withdrew his wallet and passed the other man a series of bills. She wondered why Otto owed him and imagined it had something to do with a gambling debt at the boathouse. This would not be the first time she'd seen him pay out for losses. 
Her father approached through the sweet-smelling haze, accompanied by a man with thinning gray hair. He wore strange boots, unfinished leather with a wide heel, and pants creased right down the center of his legs. A thin bolo tie was fastened by a silver clip just below his collar. She couldn't place where he might be from. No one around here dressed that way. My daughter Lena is a master of songs, boasted her father, and despite her irritation at being dragged to this party as a centerpiece, she found herself blushing. Lovely dress, the man said with a lopsided smile. The hand not holding a tumbler reached for her waist, and before she could sidestep, it slid along her stomach. Lena fought the urge to jerk back and remained composed despite the swelling anxiety. Her father had raised his glass to summon the staff for another drink. When he looked back, his flat gaze met hers, dipping to the man's hand for only a moment. He said nothing about it. Gracefully, Lena slid away. May I sing for you? she asked, a calm tone masking her revulsion. Yes, please, said the man, but only if you answer one question. Lena froze. Her father's stare had hardened, his intentions clear. Do not let me down. Normally, he would have redirected the conversation away from her. The fact that he was letting this man say whatever he liked made her realize the significance of their pending deal. Why should I do business with your father? Lena balked for only a moment before composing herself. She didn't know what this man did, much less how his company could serve to support Hampton Industries. How could she answer correctly without the proper background? Well, Lena? Her father smiled, though the lines of his throat twitched. Perspiration beaded on her hairline. Anyone who goes into business with Hampton Industries is making an excellent decision, she said slowly gauging her father's response through her long black lashes. She tried to remember everything she'd ever heard her father say to a client. In his silence, she continued. The company evolved during the war, and though we have no hand in agriculture or food production, our profit margins increased twelvefold during the famine. Why? Because we make weapons, sir. Mass-produced, of the highest quality, and as long as humans roam this world, they will find something worth killing each other over. Lena held her breath, bracing for her father's disappointment. The man's mouth had held a straight line, but when she finished, he placed his cigar between his thin lips and clapped generously, spilling liquor from his glass onto the floor. The maid hurried to clean it up before he could slip. Quite a showing, Joseph. Ice cold. The man began to ogle Lena's body in a way that made her want to slap him. She hated that her father still had said nothing. Had her words earned none of his pride? Finally, he smirked. What can I say? She's a Hampton. The man in the boots chuckled appreciatively. She recognized the cue and smiled pleasantly, though she felt ill. Sing something, dear said her father. As if she were one of his factory machines he could command with the press of a button. But she was a machine. She was a Hampton, emotionless and hard as steel. Lena closed her eyes, summoning calm, drowning out the smoke and the boisterous male voices. Gradually, her pulse slowed. She took a steadying breath and sang. It was a ballad, She'd chosen one in the old language, despite her earlier argument. She knew immediately from the silence filling the room that she'd made the right decision. This was what they wanted to hear. A song about a working man who'd become rich on love, only to see his beloved killed by a storm. A song about things as foreign to them as the lands across the sea. A song about a love that didn't exist. She ended on a soft, haunting high note, and the room erupted into cheers. But when she opened her eyes, she found her father was no longer standing beside her. He had disappeared. 
Lena gave a small curtsy and quickly excused herself before the man in the boots could follow. By the time she stepped through the double doors onto the patio, a sharp pain had lodged inside her chest. She hated these parties, hated being put on display, hated the drinks and the smoke and the men's careless hands. Her father hadn't even stayed to hear her sing. Lena's eyes drifted over the river to the district beyond Bakerstown, smoldering in the distance. Metal Town, the staff called it. The third section of the northern capital, Tri-City, where Hampton Industries was located. A gray haze hung over the place, like a perpetual storm cloud blocking out everything beneath. Brava! Lena stiffened at the sound of her brother's voice. Otto left the patio door swinging open and stalked toward her. She read his face. A lifetime of training had taught her to be ready when the lines beneath his dark eyes tightened, and when he threw his arm over her shoulders and squeezed, she went rigid as a flagpole. I'm so glad you liked it, she said flatly. Did I say I liked it? He rubbed his jaw with his free hand. Oh, well, it doesn't matter what I think. The rube did, and that's all that matters. What did you say to make him so interested? He needs a bib for all that drool. Shouldn't you be down at the club? Lena asked. I hear they send out a search party if you roam too far away from the bar. He whistled through his teeth. Don't be nasty. His arm lowered, hand gripping her waist as he jerked her closer. He pinched her hard on the ribs, grabbing the skin and twisting it until she knew it would be black and blue and perfectly hidden beneath her clothes. Aware of voices near the door, she sucked in a harsh breath and held it while her eyes watered. She had to bite the inside of her cheek to keep from crying. I'm sure you'll be happy to hear that whatever you said got father all out of sorts, Otto said, finally releasing his hold. He wants you to come to the factory with me tomorrow. Thinks it might be time you learn the family business. He does? Lena asked, still gritting her teeth. You know him. He's probably trying to teach a lesson of some sort. The importance of failure or something. Someone called him from inside, and he raised his hand, waving companionably. As he strode away... The pain in Lena's side receded, and she turned a curious gaze back toward Metaltown. Chapter 7 Colin At the end of the day, Colin smelled like bleach and piss. If there was one thing he hated more than scrubbing toilets, it was scrubbing toilets while Minnick the Perv watched, and knowing there wasn't a damn thing he could do about it if he wanted to keep his job. Didn't stop him from visualizing 40 different ways he could kill the bastard. At least he and Ty were released on time with the others. Everyone knew that if Minnick didn't bring a fix to work, he got twitchy near closing time, and today the foreman wasn't about to stay late. They lined up like usual and walked one by one through the metal detector into the locker room. Colin was itching to get back out on the street. Maybe they'd only stayed half a day, but it had felt like three times that long with Minnick drooling at his back. After this morning, patience wasn't on his agenda. John's look real shiny. Zeke, a boy near Colin's age with a shaved head and deep brown skin, elbowed in beside him. I could see my reflection in the bowl. I aim to please answered Colin. So did I, said Zeke. Why were you out anyway? Colin turned to see Matchstick, a kid Ty had known from St. Mary's who'd earned his name because he liked to lift the defective pieces from the scrap bin and rig many explosives. He was only 14, but as tall as Colin. We thought you'd been thacked, said Martin Balzac, scratching his yellow spiky hair. He lisped a little on account of several missing teeth. Heard you were doing work for Judge Schultz, said Zeke. If he ever needs more guys, you tell him I'm good, okay? How'd you hear that? 
Colin asked, straightening up a little. No neck saw you guys at Hayek's cart. Said Jed bought you something to eat. He did, said Colin. Bought me some new duds, too. You'll tell him I'm good to work? Asked Zeke again. New duds, said Martin, laughing. Though that's why Minnick keeps giving you the eye. He batted his white blonde lashes Colin's way. Colin shoved him into the lockers as they headed toward the door. They snagged what they could from the corner vendors and met on the beltway, the stretch of road over the train yards that separated Metaltown from Bakerstown. It was deserted, just as it had been when Colin and Ty had walked back from Gabe's house that morning. Folks stuck to their side of the tracks, especially at night. Even the cops, who housed themselves in McNulty's territory. That's why Colin and the others liked it. No minic breathing down their throats. No one telling them what they had to do. Most were from small parts, though some of the younger workers from the uniform division or the chem plant came here to set fights, to make trades or make out, or smoke the herbs they stole from Market Alley. Zeke was still pressing Colin about the morning and how he might get on with Jed. He had his sister to look after, currently over with a group of older girls getting her hair braided. Colin watched them, a scowl on his face. The more he talked about Jed, the more he thought about Gabe Wachowski and Bakerstown and how different things had been before Cherish had gotten sick. Hi, Colin. A girl waved to him from the pack of females, curly hair tied back with a rag. She smiled sheepishly, and when he returned her wave, she ducked back into the huddle and giggled. Hi, Maggie, said Zeke, far too late. He made a show of waving, though the water girl from small parts didn't return the gesture. What do you think they're talking about anyway? Probably you. Zeke looked hopeful. You think? No. He tensed his gut a second before Zeke punched him. Other days, Colin would have braved the group, flirted with Maggie, maybe even convinced her to go somewhere private. But he didn't feel up to socializing. He should have been home, anyway. It was Hayden's night to take care of Cherish, but that didn't mean anything. Colin had been hoping to find him here, but he was probably down at Lacey's, or one of the other bars, gambling. A lone figure sat on the cracked sidewalk, staring out into the divide between the two towns and the still train cars below. Colin tossed the blanket he'd bought in Market Alley on the ground and took his place beside her, fitting his legs through the railings and letting his feet dangle as she did. This was often their spot, and always ties. They didn't talk about all the places they might go, like they had when they were younger, but they thought about them all the same. I need to go get a bunk, Ty said after a while. She slept at the board and care, where beds were doled out on a first-come, first-served basis. I need to go home, he said. Neither of them moved. An icy wind swept over the beltway, and he hunched deeper into his coat. The sun was setting. Here on the edge of Metaltown, you could actually see the sun, or at least a round white ball through the haze. Your home or Maggie's? Ty launched a pebble onto a train car below. He didn't know why he was surprised Ty had seen Maggie wave at him. Ty saw everything. She's a pinhead, you know, Ty added. Colin smirked. Maggie did have a pretty narrow face, but so did Ty. For a moment, he looked at her, wondering if she might be pretty if she cleaned up a bit, or smiled every so often. Then he felt weird, like he was staring at his ma, and shook the thought from his mind. What do you care? I don't, Ty retorted. I don't care what you do. Do whatever you want. She crossed her arms over her chest and shivered against the cold. Colin suspected the black mood had followed her from the morning. He passed her the blanket, and she jerked it around her shoulders. They were quiet for a while, watching the crane trucks below load freight into the rusted metal cars. Then Ty said, 
You ever have one of those toy trains when you were a kid? The wood ones with the metal tracks? An image formed in his mind of the small rectangular blocks on tiny wheels. He painted it red, but only because the store had been out of yellow. Sure. Didn't everybody? He regretted saying it when she gave an exasperated sigh. No prep school. Not everybody. She tightened the blanket around her shoulders. I had a dream about one last night. He didn't know why she was frowning. That's sweet, he said. I'll get you one for your birthday. You can set it up on the line and play with it during your break. He braced for a shove, but instead she just snorted. A hiss behind them caught their attention, but before either could untangle their legs from the railing, there was an ear-splitting crack from over by the concrete dividers, a flash of light and a spray of dirt, and then silence. Match thick! Martin, smeared with grime, emerged from the cloud of dust and charged after the rail-thin boy, who darted through the crowd. A cheer rose from those around, always game for a little demolition. Lifting from small parts again, said Ty, but her lips quirked up. From the opposite side of the street, Matchstick hollered for someone to save him. Colin laughed, and then Ty laughed, the ugliness of the day having burst like Matchstick's explosion. He laughed so hard the tears burned his eyes and his stomach cramped and it was only when he saw that Ty wasn't laughing anymore that he realized he'd slapped his hand on her leg. He followed her gaze down and then withdrew, feeling a little awkward. Not that he should have. Ty was family. He stood. A kid rammed into him from behind. He was smaller than most, pushing through the others like he owned the whole beltway. His dark hair was crunchy with sweat, and his shirt was dusted with the white powder all the workers used to keep their hands dry. That meant he worked at small parts, though Colin had never seen him before. As he went to shove past, he tripped over his own feet. Colin reached down automatically to grab his arm and almost laughed. The kid's shoes were huge. Men's shoes. Clown's shoes, more like it. And white leather, like part of a chem factory uniform. Exactly like part of a chem factory uniform. The kid was a thief. You had to be 18 to apply there, and he couldn't have been more than 10. Plus, it was just plain stupid to steal uniforms. The workers all wrote their names on them so they wouldn't mix them up. It rubbed Colin the wrong way. Not that he hadn't taken things he'd needed before, but the way the kid was tromping around, showing off, irritated him. It was plain disrespectful. He kept a hold of the boy's arm, mind set on telling him to watch himself. But when he leaned down, he recognized the inscription on the instep, scratched in black marker. H. Walter. Hayden Walter. In an instant, he'd wrapped the boy's collar in his fist and shoved him against the railing. Small, narrowed eyes burned up at him with fury though not as hot as Collins. Ty jumped up in surprise. What are you doing? She'd immediately gone for their hands to break them up. Where'd you get those shoes, kid? Colin rammed him against the railing again. The metal clanked, drawing the attention of those packed closest. Colin, Ty hissed. Get your hands off me, the boy squeaked. No one dared defend the kid. No one pushed Colin when he was angry. Fight, someone called. The word caught like wildfire, and after a brief, frustrated moment, Colin released the boy. He wasn't looking for attention. He wanted answers. The shoes, Colin said, jaw locked. There could be ten H. Walters working there, Ty said after a moment. But Colin recognized the handwriting, and he remembered the night Hayden had marked them, just after he'd started at the plant. The kid tried to run, but Colin snagged the back of his shirt and dragged him back into place. Where did you get those shoes? Colin asked again. 
Last chance to tell me before I make you tell me, kid. And trust me, I don't care if you're six or sixty. I will. Ty swore under her breath. She was going to intervene. There were rules about picking on someone half your size. Rules she'd taught him once upon a time. Even metalheads had a code. Fine. So Colin wouldn't kill him. Try it, you big stupid giant! The kid managed, practically walking on his tiptoes as Colin hoisted him up. The crowd of bodies grew denser as Ty attempted to drag them away from the railing toward the center of the bridge. In order to get a better grip, Colin abandoned the shirt for the kid's arm, bending it at an awkward angle behind his back. He was careful not to break it. Good God, it didn't hurt nearly as bad as the kid was carrying on. Ow! The kid whined, falling dramatically in a heap against a concrete barrier. Several workers Colin knew had stopped what they were doing and were watching with interest. He stepped forward. Ty slapped a hand on his chest, a stubborn look on her face. Don't make me stop you. He glared at her. I lifted him fair, okay? The kid belted. From some junkie sleeping off his bender underneath the bridge. When? Colin bent down and ripped one shoe off, then the other, tying the laces together. Hey, I got those fair, I told you, said the kid. You stole them. How's that fair? But he knew as well as anyone, what you didn't claim was ripe for the picking. Last night, the boy pouted. Got him last night. You happy? Ty kneeled beside him. There's free shoes at the charity house. Wood shoes, maybe, he spat. Shoes that don't fit, maybe. Shoes that got holes in them, maybe. Ty crossed her arms over her chest. He was mouthy, that much was for sure. One good smack across the jaw, that was what the kid needed. God knew Colin had gotten his fair share of them after moving across the beltway. But the flash of fear in the boy's eyes stayed his hand. Ty was right. What did picking on a kid prove? That he was minic, that's what. A final hard look, and Colin stood. He had to find Hayden, make sure he was alive. He hadn't been home in three days now. A shudder passed through him as he considered just how cold the previous night had been. He shrugged into his coat and tucked the blanket under one arm. The switchblade in front of his belt beneath his shirt moved, reminding him of its presence. Turning toward the river, he paused when he felt Ty's hesitation. She was staring at the shoes hanging over his shoulder. Go get your bunk, he said, letting her off the hook. He could have used her help, but winter nights in Metaltown were too cold to sleep outside. Maybe Hayden knew firsthand, but Ty didn't have to. He was on his own. Get out of here, she said, the strange, sad look on her face sticking with him as he jogged away. He searched for hours. Hayden wasn't under the bridge where the kid had said. Even the normal bums had scattered, leaving the tagged concrete pylons and asphalt to the rats. Part of him was grateful for it. His brother could have frozen so near the murky river water. After clearing the area, Colin pulled up his collar, hid the blanket inside his coat, and began his normal drill, a systematic check of all the places he'd found Hayden before. He ducked into shady clubs and talked to bouncers, a few who knew his brother by name. He asked a couple working girls if they'd seen someone tall like him, but a couple years older and with longer hair. Not a sign. Dusk had long since faded to black, and with the night came a familiar tingling at the base of Colin's neck. He palmed the blade from his waistband and cursed himself for telling Ty to get her bunk. He could have used an extra pair of eyes, if for no other reason than to watch his back. Resigned to kicking Hayden's ass all the way to Bakerstown when he found him, Colin returned to the bridge and climbed the concrete steps to the pedestrian path. 
Half the suspension wires had busted since the famine, but that was back when cars traveled this route. Now it was all foot traffic, and only chem plant employees who came this way, though he doubted they did so this late at night. He kept his eyes sharp across the bridge, ignoring a man near the edge who was yelling at no one, and a trio that eyed him suspiciously as they passed around a glowing dope pipe. The air smelled sweeter over here, sweet enough to make the bile rise up Colin's throat. Still, the river rushed twenty feet below him, and for a moment the water, lapping against the man-made levees, brought a small sense of calm. He wondered if the ocean spoke this language, or if it made a different sound when it hit the sand. In the dark, it was impossible to see the hulking stone asylum or the sign that hung from the edge of the bridge, but he knew it was there. Hampton Industries, Division 3, Chemical Plant. Half a dozen biohazard signs had been erected on the path, but most of them were rusted or tagged with graffiti. At 13, he thought this was the creepiest place he'd ever seen. His opinion hadn't changed much in the last four years. He gripped the knife harder, wishing he had some source of light. If Hayden wasn't dead, Colin was going to kill him. The gates were close. He could hear the clink of metal on metal as a breeze came through. And then the slide of a chain against it, like fingernails scratching up his spine. Hayden? He called. And damn it all if he didn't sound like a Bakerstown pansy. He swore and stood a little taller. Something stirred near the base of the gate. Everything inside of Colin told him to run. Every muscle flexed against his skin. Who knew the type that came out here this late? The type who killed people and palmed their effects. That's who. The type who'd gone crazy from the food testing plant. Who lured orphans down to the river and maimed the girls who worked the metal town corners. The thing moved again a shuffle of cloth and a scrape against the dirty pavement. Colin almost guessed it was a rat, until a distinctly human moan whispered over the breeze. Who's there? Colin's voice cracked. Now part of him was glad Ty was across the river. She would have ridden him for weeks about it. Another moan. I'm looking for Hayden Walter, Colin said taking a risk and stepping closer. He was only a few feet away now. The knife was braced before him, but the stranger wouldn't have been able to see it unless he had cat's eyes. Hayden, the man repeated, in a voice Colin knew as well as his own. Damn you! Colin tucked his knife away and knelt down beside the pile of rags on the cement. A sliver of skylight, just for a moment, revealed the soiled white canvas of his brother's uniform. A deep breath, and Colin's head spun. Hayden smelled worse than he did. Sticky sweet like the air, like the plant. Nitro? Colin asked in disgust. He swore again. Nitroglycerin. The stuff was worse than dope. Workers in Hayden's team breathed the heavy, colorless oil all day while they packed it into bombshells. Anyone outside would have gotten a headache from the fumes, even had a heart attack if they'd gotten too much. But those on the inside developed a tolerance, which turned the hours after work into a slow grind of withdrawal. Good thing you could huff the fumes to fight off the ticks and aches. Took the edge right off those clenching muscles. Of course, after a while, your body couldn't survive without it, but who cared about that? Obviously not Hayden. Get up, said Colin. We're leaving. Get your sorry ass up. Hayden groaned when Colin squatted beside him and felt around for his arm. He stood up fast enough to tweak his brother's shoulder and relished in the little grunt of pain. He wished Hayden was sober enough to fight, because Colin would have worked him up and down the walls. What you doing? Hayden slurred. God, you reek. Colin? Walk, asshole. 
They took a few steps toward the bridge, and Hayden stumbled, taking both of them to the ground. Colin pushed him off, feeling a sudden uncontrollable swelling inside his chest. He couldn't look at his brother. He shouldn't have come out here. This was unbelievably stupid. If Hayden wanted to die, he should just get on with it and leave the rest of the family alone. The air stunk, and he stunk, and Hayden was high on nitro. Nitro! Why was it that Colin felt like an idiot when Hayden was the one stoned out of his mind? Little brother, Hayden said slowly. In the darkness, Colin could see his brother's glassy eyes blink once. His chest clenched again, harder than before, so hard he could barely breathe. After a while, he stood and helped Hayden back up. Come on, he said. He moved slowly this time, so that Hayden could take each step. Don't tell them, Hayden said. Colin sighed. I won't. Chapter 8 Ty Watching Colin walk away, Ty felt the cold shudder through her. A reminder that she was about to face another night alone. She wasn't scared. She refused to be scared. And she didn't need anybody looking out for her. But having Colin around did make it a little easier to breathe. Sometimes being around him was the only time she ever really felt relaxed. And sometimes she couldn't relax around him at all. Looks like that makes two of us got stiffed. The boy with dark, sweat-crusted hair shoved off the wall to a stand. She'd forgotten about him. What? Ty frowned. He stole my shoes, and you got ditched. He didn't ditch me. I told him to go. She didn't know why she was defending herself to a boy half her age. Anyway, you're the one who stole the shoes first. Yeah, whatever. The alley outside the employee entrance had cleared. Most of the workers scattered as soon as they realized there wouldn't be a fight. Just a few remained now, people she knew but wasn't friendly with. And this boy. The gray haze was lowering, turning purple with the sunset. The boy glanced upward warily. He wasn't looking forward to the night any more than she was. You hungry? she asked. As he turned to face her, it hit her how small he was. A bony body draped in tattered, oversized clothes. The chill blisters on his cheeks were easier to see when he wasn't mouthing off, and the curls at the ends of his hair made him seem almost babyish. He stepped gingerly down the alley, holy socks providing limited protection from the cold, dirty ground. Why? You sharing? He tracked the movements of her hands down by her pockets like a stray dog, and she wondered when he'd last eaten. Her stomach was already grumbling. It had been since they'd gotten back to small parts. Come on. She led him down the alley, watching the way his eyes darted to every shadow how he hesitated before every corner. What's your name, kid? Augustine, he said. But the guys call me Chip. Augustine, repeated Ty. You're from St. Mary's, then. She knew the orphanage well enough. She'd been brought there when she was little, after a woman had found her wandering the streets. For five years, she'd schooled under the iron fists of the nuns, only to be turned out when she was eight, with a half-assed prayer and an order to find work before she starved. If she had to guess, it hadn't been long since Chip had been given the same farewell. There were three Augustines when I was there, she continued when the boy didn't answer. The nuns like that name, I guess. I said to call me Chip. He glared up at her. The corner of her mouth turned up. Where are we going, anyway? You'll see. She led him the back way, down a dingy cart path, past a pawn shop to a dimly lit bar. Jack Slyes. The windows were covered with plywood and tagged with graffiti, 
but hard, growling music seeped out from beneath the door. In there? Chip asked. Not unless you're paying. She led him around the back side of the building and dragged him down behind a stack of cardboard boxes. What are we doing here? He whined. She shushed him. They waited with bated breath as the minutes passed. Ty's legs began to cramp, and her stomach became more demanding. Unable to hold still, Chip started tearing the boxes into chunks and shoving the pieces of his shirt. Kid was smart, Ty thought. Cardboard was a good barrier against the cold. The back door opened, and a hefty man in a white undershirt, stained around the pits, hoisted a bag of trash toward the green metal trash bin. The garbage was already overflowing as it was, and after attempting a few times to push it down to make more room, he simply tossed the bag on top. Then he wiped his hands, hawked up a mouthful of phlegm on the wall, and disappeared back into the bar. Dinner time, whispered Ty, eyeing the trash bin. It said a lot that Chip's eyes were round and eager, and he didn't get snobby. They tiptoed across the way, grabbed the bag, and pulled it behind the dumpster. One rip of the plastic, and a blast of fumes hit them. Rotten vegetables, probably. But deeper inside was a mixed meat sub, half eaten, and a few pieces of fry bread. You gotta get here before midnight, okay? Ty told him. That's when they throw rat poison on it. When the kid didn't look up, she snapped a finger in front of his face. I showed you my stash. Now when you find one, you show me. Got it? Those are the rules. What rules? Street rules, she said. He nodded. Fat on their feast, they cut through an abandoned building filled with squatters and made their way to the board and care. Ty found she didn't mind Chip's company. He hadn't said much, and she liked that. Still, she couldn't help wishing Colin was there. She wondered if he'd found Hayden, and if he had, what kind of shape he'd been in. Stupid junkies. Colin should just cut ties and be done with it. He couldn't see that Hayden wouldn't have gone looking for him. Sometimes you chose your family, like she'd chosen him all those years ago. The light of day was just barely hanging on by the time they reached the Tri-Belt Interchange, or Beggar's Square, as the people in Metaltown called it. There, three roads converged into a narrow roundabout, encircling a small, dry fountain. Any day of the week, that fountain was lined with pigeons and bums, and tonight was no exception. On one corner was St. Mary's Orphanage, on another the board and care, and on the third, Charity House. Go get some shoes, Ty told Chip, lifting her chin toward the flimsy wooden building. So many additions had been tacked on to Charity House over the years that it hardly looked like a house at all, but more like a big cancerous mass. The boy shifted back and forth. What's the problem? asked Ty. Nothing. I don't need shoes, he said. She barked out a laugh but swallowed it down when his obstinate little face scowled up at her. Come on, she prompted, leading the way. Across the street, outside St. Mary's, the orphans were clearing up the broth bowls they'd given out to the first hundred lucky people in line. No, Chip dug his heels in. I know what's in there. I'm not catching it. Ty tilted her head, then huffed. You can't catch corn flu from another person. You can't catch corn flu from another person. Someone had told her that when she was little. She couldn't remember who. Probably someone from St. Mary's. Oh, yes, you can, he argued. Oh, no, you can't, she retorted. I promise. My friend's mom got it from food, and he sees her all the time, and he's not sick. Your friend who stole my shoes... That friend? That friend. Like I'm gonna believe anything he says. Ty sighed. Fine, suit yourself. I'm going to get a bunk, and unless you're planning on sleeping outside, you better get in there too. Chip lifted his chin defiantly, 
glancing back at the charity house. Swear on your mother's life I won't catch it. She barely remembered her mother, but supposed it wouldn't hurt swearing on someone who was already dead. Sure, Chip, I swear. Ty pulled Chip through the swinging doors, not giving him a chance to waste time thinking. The sight that greeted them always made her insides turn to jelly, but she wasn't about to show it, not while the kid was watching. The low-ceilinged room was packed with cots, drawn so close together the workers had to inch sideways to get between them. The bodies on the beds were in different states of decay. The worst were gray and ashy, so thin they might blow away with lips tinged red by the blood that spewed from their lungs. Others still had a normal color to them, but were marked by the unmistakable red blotches on their cheeks and skin. And the best off, the newly diagnosed, they worked the place, having come here before they couldn't walk, in hopes of gaining a bed when the sickest kicked the bucket. Thick, hacking coughs ricocheted off the walls. Chip, eyes wide with fear, covered his mouth and nose with his dirty hands. Ty made a note to ask for mittens, too, if they had some to spare. They're just people, she told him quietly, like you and me. Not like me, he said, voice muffled through his sleeve. A frail man hobbled by, his cheeks cherry red, his eyes bloodshot. A handkerchief stained with blood was held tight in his fist. Ty stopped him, careful not to knock him over. Can we get in the donation room? She asked. He nodded and pointed toward the back. They'd have to walk through the clinic to get there, and he was too busy and too weak to lead them. How'd they all get so sick if they didn't catch it? Chip asked. She flinched when he grabbed the tail of her coat but didn't make him back off. It started with the famine, she said, picking her way through the cots. Her stomach began to pitch. The smell made her want to vomit. She focused on the back door. Too many people, not enough for everyone to eat. People were starving, so they started fighting for food. And for the land to grow it on, and the sea to fish it from, and the rights to transport and pack it. The nuns had given this lesson more than once in her youth. Then the fighting turned into a war, and even more people went hungry. Then these scientists started making synthetic corn. You've heard of that? I'm not stupid, you know, he said from behind her. She rolled her eyes. They thought it would end the fighting because people would have enough to eat. They made a ton of it in factories all over the world. But it wasn't tested, and it made people sick. They reached the donation room, and Ty commanded herself to stay calm as they passed through the threshold. There were stacks of clothes here, piled from floor to ceiling. Shoes, too. Nothing was organized. It was as if the workers had just thrown it all inside and slammed the door. Which was exactly what they'd done. Soon as someone at Charity House died, they stripped them, recycled their clothes, and burned their bodies in the incinerators out back. She could smell it working even here. The charred, sour smoke dried out her nostrils. I never knew all this was here. Chip dove into a pile as if he were being timed. Ty didn't tell him where the clothes had come from. Chip sat on the floor, trying on mismatched shoes. She sorted them for him, hoping he would hurry up. He may have been more comfortable, but she was about ready to pop. They needed to get back outside fast. So why do they keep making the poison corn? He asked. She cleared her throat. They don't. But too many people had already eaten it, and it was already put in all sorts of food. That's why you've still got to be careful. She threw a pair of gloves down for him to try. And that's why the Federations are all still fighting. Because testing food is so expensive, half the world's starving to death. Why doesn't somebody just make some medicine? He laced up a pair of scuffed boots, prodding the toe with his thumb. 
The look on his face said they were a good enough fit. You don't think they're trying? The medical division tested their cures on the inmates at the local jail. Sometimes the inmates were released when they were no longer considered a danger to society. Most of them were so sick they didn't last long. A worker opened the door and tossed another armful in. Before the door closed, they caught sight of an emaciated, naked male corpse being pushed outside on a gurney. Chip jolted up, face pale. Can we go? Yeah, Ty said. Later, Ty lay in the bunk she'd chosen, the one closest to the door and flush against the wall. She kept her knives out at night, one in her hand, the other close to her chest, attuned to the snores and heavy breathing of the fifty others that occupied this wing. Chip was upstairs with the juniors, probably curled up around his shoes, snoring like a baby. He was a brat, but he was tough, and she liked that about him. She hadn't been all that different at his age. Alone, her mind drifted to Colin and whether or not he'd found his brother. She hoped so, more for Colin's sake than Hayden's. He was a worrier, always trying to keep track of too many moving parts. His family, work, cherish. She thought of the look on his face when they'd left Bakerstown and blew out a heavy breath. There was nothing to be done about that. But maybe she could talk to Hayden, convince him to clean up his act. Colin had called him out more than once, but if Hayden heard it from someone else, he might listen. Normally, she'd say it wasn't her business, but it was different with Colin. The things that hurt him, they hurt her, too. She made up her mind to do it the next time she saw him, and immediately felt something loosen in her chest. Imagining Colin's grin, she smiled, and then quickly wiped the look off her face, feeling like an idiot. A heavy hand fumbled over her chest, and she bit back a scream. Like a shot, she was up, scanning the darkness to see who'd had the stones to touch her. One of her knives was knocked to the floor with a clatter. When she dove for it, something hit her hard against the side of the head. Bright white stars burst in the darkness. A slimy hand clutched around her mouth. She bit down hard, drawing a muffled scream from her attacker. She was thrown down on the thin mattress, and it squeaked and groaned beneath her weight. Her mind was reeling. Fight, fight, fight. She kicked, opening her mouth to bite again, but a putrid sock gagged her as it was shoved inside. Her arms were pinned overhead, locked in place by a strong grasp. She began to panic. Not this time. Not again. Hands on her shins, her thighs. More than one pair. Two. Three pulling at her waistband, trying to get past her belt. She squeezed her knees together as the tears burned her eyes. Fight! People were getting up. She could hear them shifting on their nearby cots, but no one came to help. Two bodies laid across her to pin her down. Hold her, one spat. She could smell the corn whiskey on his breath. Fury broke loose inside of her, burning down her limbs. She bucked back, knocking one of them against the wall. Again, she was hit. Her eyes felt like they would pop out of her skull. Her mouth opened wide in a silent scream. But she didn't stop. She would not stop. The clothes she wore twisted around her. But this was why she wore so much. They might get through one layer, but then they'd find a second and a third. Finally, somehow, she twisted and with a thud landed on her back on the floor. She spat out the gag, and a second later was out the door, running through the entryway, past the snoring patrons in the other rooms. Running. Running, and no one was ever going to catch her. Chapter 9 Lena Lena sat at the table in her bedroom, surrounded by neat stacks of paper, staring at her wall monitor with tired, blinking eyes. Miss Hampton, it's time for bed. Darcy was perched beside her, on a stool Lena often used during her singing lessons. The fatigue was heavy in her tone. How late was it? Midnight? 
No, Lena realized. Several hours passed. I had no idea how ill-prepared I would be, Lena said, straightening her back. She was still wearing the slim-cut evening gown that she'd performed in, but it was now wrinkled and losing its shape. Her satin-gloved fingertips pressed against her temples. You'll do fine, assured Darcy. No one will expect you to know any of this. She motioned to the electronic files on the screen displaying countless facts and figures that defined the rise of Hampton Industries and the history of Lena's family. I expect myself to know it, said Lena. And if people are going to do business with me, I'll expect them to know that I know it. Darcy turned to face the dark window, her expression hidden by shadows. Very well, then. What exactly have you learned? Lena looked at her a moment, the sudden wave of relief washing away some of the tension between her shoulder blades. Sometimes she forgot she wasn't alone in this massive house, that Darcy was here beside her. The company was started by my great-grandfather before the war, Lena began. It was just a small arms shop then, with a firing range attached to the back of the building. Shooting had once been a recreational activity, an activity for stress relief or hunting practice, as the game still ran thick in the mountains surrounding the Tri-City area. But the droughts had changed everything. Season after season passed with little or no rain, and the farmland in the center of the country dried up, forcing a mass migration into the already packed cities. The famine brought a surge of business as people began to quarrel. Lena continued. Hampton Ammunition, as it was then called, was able to expand. Neighbors wanted guns for protection from each other, and increased violence led to increased sales. The statistics from that time show that one out of every three people in the Tri-City had a weapon. Orders were being shipped from the northern border to the small farming communities south of the Yalen Mountains. South? said Darcy a wry smile quirking her mouth. But everything south of the Yalens belongs to the Eastern Federation. Lena changed wall screens to a map of the Sila Peninsula, finger trailing down the eastern coast to a series of bays on the southern tip. Darcy was testing her, but she was glad for it. It was before the Federations were formed, she told her tutor. From their history lessons, she knew that the fishing industry had survived only a little while after the start of the famine. Overfishing and pollution from the congested coastal cities had turned people back inland to farm the last viable crop, corn. Scientists developed chemicals to increase the harvests and prolong the growing season, not knowing that they were actually creating the first strains of the deadly corn flu, a disease that would kill hundreds of thousands. People were starving, too desperate to think of the consequences. They fought over control of the fields and how to distribute the rations, forming alliances. Those in the East used their Hampton Industries weapons to defend the southern crops, defeating the northern troops that retreated behind the protection of the Yalen Mountains. There, the Northern Federation became self-sufficient, withdrawing trade agreements with the East, who ended up with nothing but dry fishing ports and deadly fields of corn. Her grandfather, Colton Hampton, had taken over the company as soon as he turned 18, only a year older than she was now. He died when she was three, a hunting accident in the Yalens, and her memories were only what her father had told her of him, mostly that he was stern and hard-working. She'd found a picture of Colton on the stone steps in front of Division One surrounded by smiling workers and cutting a fat red ribbon with a comically large pair of scissors. Though he looked like he could have been Otto's twin, Colton's drive was far greater. My grandfather made the company what it is today, Lena said. He branched out from the small munitions orders and purchased similar businesses, putting them all under the Hampton name. After the Northern Federation was established, the companies in other nearby cities were closed and moved to a more manageable central location in the capital, 
later known as the Factory District. The various focuses were organized into divisions, everything from handheld weaponry to military-grade arsenals, including explosives. And now, thanks to my father, Hampton Industries is the exclusive provider for the Northern Federation's military. And Otto was next in line to take control. She slumped in her chair, as much as the dress would allow. The men in her family had worked too hard to have a spoiled playboy lose it all. That's very good. Darcy rose to stretch her back. When she leaned closer to the desk, her gaze landed on a small scrap of paper bearing an address. She squinted at it, but before she could ask, Lena tucked it beneath the stack of papers. Perhaps too tired to care, her tutor turned away and walked the length of the room. It was a good start, but there was still so much Lena didn't understand. She looked back down at the statements, brows drawing together. I didn't even know that we owned a medical division, she said. I mean, the medical division. It oversees the hospital, the medical school in the River District, the clinics in practically every town, even research facilities. Basically, everything that involves a pill or a bandage in this entire federation belongs to Hampton Industries, and I can't even find any contract outlining the transfer of ownership. Oh? asked Darcy. The branch's income is noted on every quarterly report for the last decade. It constitutes half of our earnings. Once upon a time, it was a lot more than half, Darcy said. Lena glanced up, surprised that Darcy knew this. It was? Once upon a time, saving lives was more important than ending them. Her tutor rubbed her eyes and shook her head. I mean... There wasn't so much need for the weapons division because we weren't at war. I'm sure the contract is in there somewhere. She finished quickly. Lena returned to the screen, sliding through the documents with the sweep of her finger. Darcy was probably right. Healthcare would take priority in times of peace. But this was wartime, and it was still earning a substantial chunk. I bet Otto lost the documents she muttered. I'm sure the previous owners will be ecstatic to hear that we've been profiting off a company we don't even hold the title to. The owners died, said Darcy, and Lena again met her gaze with curiosity. Her tutor sighed, looking away. You were talking about the medical division, correct? Lena nodded. Yes, I believe the family that owned it all died of the corn flu. Ironic, isn't it? The people dedicated to finding the cure succumbed to the illness. She blinked away a rare, jaded expression. Their heir disappeared. It was all the gossip at the time. What if this heir still lives? Lena asked, thinking of the earnings on the quarterly income statements she'd seen. How much would Hampton Industries owe them? The losses would be devastating. If such a person existed, they would have claimed their family's fortune by now, don't you think? Yes, Lena supposed so. Besides, your father had people looking into it, and when they didn't find a lead, the company was absorbed. I believe the people across the river call it the Food Testing Division now. Something like that. Darcy stood, putting the stool back against the wall. Better to leave the past in the past. You have more pressing things with which to concern yourself. Now, if you're not going to go to bed, Miss Hampton, I'll have to say goodnight. That's fine, Darcy, said Lena absently. Her thoughts were still on the hit the company would take if they ever lost the medical division. The hit the entire Federation would take. Beyond the economic implications, it absorbed a huge amount of responsibility. Research facilities within that division had created the quality standards that deemed food safe, hazardous, or consumed at one's own risk. They were researching a cure to the most devastating epidemic the world had ever known, the corn flu. It was not the sort of business one wanted to misplace the title paperwork to. Her concentration was broken by footsteps on the stairs, 
and her father's voice from the landing below. Is this humorous to you? You don't cancel important business meetings just so you can go gallivanting with pretty young women. The footsteps stopped. Both Darcy and Lena froze, listening as her brother answered. She was very pretty. He spoke too slowly. Drunk, Lena realized. Drunk and in trouble. It was not the first time, nor would it be the last. The click of hard-soled shoes on wooden floors, and then a slam that made both Lena and her tutor jump. Near the door, her framed pictures rattled, and in his cage, her bird fluttered his yellow wings and jumped from one dowel to the next. The next words were low and too muffled to make out. A few moments later, she heard the quiet click of Otto's bedroom door and her father's steps descending down the stairs. Well, said Darcy, I suppose it's time for me to go to bed. Lena nodded. Whatever her father had done, her brother deserved. But that didn't stop her stomach from twisting. Locking the door behind Darcy, she turned off the wall screen and walked to her dresser. There, she removed her satin gloves and placed them neatly beside her hairbrush. With effort, she unzipped her dress and slowly peeled out of it, wincing at the purple welt Otto had left on the right side of her ribcage. She touched it gingerly, biting down against the responding ache and looking again to the door where a nearby picture frame still hung crooked from her father and brother's argument on the stairs. The house was quiet now. Otto was probably already passed out. The dress went in the hamper, and she hesitated, as she always did, before opening the tall mahogany bureau. She had to check to make sure the lock was still broken, that the metal bar would not emerge with the twist of a key. Only when she was satisfied at its defectiveness, the only imperfection she allowed in her life, did she open the double doors. Now, Mr. Bird, what shall I wear tomorrow? Hmm? An hour after dawn, Lena paced in the foyer, a storm cloud brewing over her head. She'd learned from the house staff that Otto had left only minutes earlier to breakfast with a Ms. Dwyer, the young daughter of one of the Hamptons' investors. It was hardly a shock. Expecting Otto to follow through on anything was like expecting a rabid dog not to bite. But it still surprised her after their father had chastised him for gallivanting only last night. It was possible she'd misunderstood their fight, that the bang against the wall hadn't been a manifestation of Joseph's anger. For hours she'd lain in her bed, staring at the ceiling, listening for any sign that Otto might be creeping across the hall to make her suffer for his own transgressions. He only ever pinched her or said nasty things when her father had first done something of the like to him. But the house had remained still. She hadn't even heard him sneak out. Unwilling to let him ruin her plans, she asked Aja, their driver, to transport her to Otto's division in Metaltown so that she could await his arrival. With Aja in the driver's seat, Lena slid across the padded bench in the back of the electric carriage. She disliked car travel. The passenger compartment was much too small, and the bumps gave her motion sickness. But the factory was several miles upriver, and it was too cold to have Aja pull her in the handcart. Are you ready, Miss Hampton? Came his low, polite voice from the front. He was a big man, with skin the color of red mud and hair as black and thick as hers. He barely fit in his singular driver's seat and was forced to drive with the window open to have some place to stash his elbow. For this, he wore a long, heavy trench coat and a thick wool scarf. Yes, Aja, thank you, Lena answered. The engine wound to life, and they pulled out of her family's circular cobblestone driveway. Away from the main house with its three sprawling stories and landscaped grounds. Past the coach house where the help lived, and the driving range where her father took his associates to golf. By the time they hit the main street, Lena's heels were tapping hard enough to dent the floorboards. She didn't know why she was so nervous. She was a Hampton, and no one crossed a Hampton. But her father had taught her at a young age 
that a hungry dog will bite the hand that feeds him, and these people, though grateful for their employee, were unpredictable. Lena didn't do unpredictable well. What she did do well was organize, and that was what she intended to do, starting today, first with Otto's division to show her father her capabilities, and then with the rest of Hampton Industries. She'd be the first woman to run the company, a legacy like the line of men before her. She dressed professionally in fitted black pants that disappeared into knee-high boots and a cream-colored button-up blouse topped by a short, rib-hugging coat the color of cherries. Her black hair was tucked in a bun at the nape of her neck, and she'd worn leather gloves to show the workers that she wasn't afraid to get her hands dirty. In her breast pocket was a scrap of paper, and on it, an address she'd looked up from the payroll department. It was from an old file, a domestic worker who had taken care of her as a child. Lena hadn't seen the woman since she'd left the Hamptons all those years ago, but she thought of her often. For more than a year, she'd held on to this address, convincing herself that it was probably no longer good. But now that she was heading across the beltway, there was no reason not to check it out. Once the work was done, anyway. She was just going to shadow her brother for a little while. Nothing was going to go wrong. But in case something did, she tucked a diffuser, an electroshock weapon meant to incapacitate an attacker without fatal damage, into the back of her waistband. She'd been trained to use one when she was five, and felt more than competent to defend herself should the need arise. They passed through Bakerstown, where most of the Hamptons extra staff who didn't stay on the grounds lived. It was a rundown place, but there were pockets of good shopping, including the markets where the cook staff bought their groceries. Only a few electric cars like hers were on the street. Mostly people traveled by bike cart or hand cart or walked among the homeless. She shivered at the thought, glad for the firm feel of her diffuser against her lower back. A few miles farther, and the way cleared of all traffic, car and pedestrian alike. The sky, which had been glowing with a hint of morning light, grew heavy with a sweet, suffocating kind of fog as they continued on a desolate beltway. Below were the train yards, and the chug and high-pitched whine of steel penetrated the car's thin windows. They'd been driving less than an hour, but she had the distinct impression they'd traveled a world away. She saw the gray buildings first. She'd heard talk of how drab this area, Metal Town, could be. But her father didn't think it was fitting for a lady, so she'd yet to see it with her own eyes. As they drew closer to the factories, her excitement began to crystallize into a cold, hard ball in the bottom of her stomach. People, the kind she didn't want to find herself alone with, were all around. A sea of dirty clothes and dirty faces, they were all staring at the car like a cat tracks a mouse. She placed a hand on her weapon unconsciously and leaned forward. Otto said he would meet us here? Yes, Miss Hampton, within the hour. Which meant at least two in Otto speak. She removed the address from her pocket and passed it up between the seats. Aja, can you bring me here? I'd like to check on someone. It will only take a few minutes. Miss Hampton? Aja's tone was wary. Your father wouldn't be pleased with any unexpected stops. This isn't the kind of area where... It's fine, Aja. I'll have you with me. He hesitated. Very well, Miss Hampton. They turned down a side street and passed by what looked to be a flea market. Most of the carts and tents were still covered for the night, but there were a few people up and about, picking through the leftovers. Aja slowed the car and looked out the opposite window. We should be close, Miss Hampton. I believe the address you're looking for is just down that way. Who are we visiting? Just an old friend. A woman with a red shawl around her shoulders caught Lena's eye from across the street. Her long, dark hair was braided down her back, and she tucked her pants into worn boots that blossomed around her ankles. Even though her clothes were baggy, Lena could tell that she was slim. 
Familiarity had her hands pressing against the window, had her straining her eyes for a better look. As if the woman could sense she was being watched, she turned to the side, giving Lena a glimpse of her profile. Everything within her snapped into place. Every muscle, every nerve, every piece of her once broken heart. Joy lifted her mouth to a grin. She was here. Stop! Lena screeched. Aja slammed on the brakes, but he was too late. The woman had already left the flea market and disappeared around the corner. Lena jerked the handle of the door open and spilled out onto the street. Miss Hampton! She heard Aja yell, but the choice was upon her. Follow the woman or wait for protection. Her feet made up her mind. She was already jogging toward the corner. Aja, come on! Hurry up! She called over her shoulder. There were a few women, prostitutes, sitting on crates against the stone wall, and Lena felt their confused stares pull toward her. More people were emerging from the nearby streets, dressed in their work clothes, moving with a sense of purpose. Look at Miss High Class, one of the girls yelled. Lena's throat grew tight as her happiness plummeted. Her eyes strained in all directions, but the place was becoming more and more crowded. Where was Aja? There was plenty of room to park the car. He should have reached her by now. Instead, she found herself alone in a sea of sneering faces, all staring at her clothes. She looked at the doors of the buildings around her, but none of them were marked. Sorry, she said as someone bumped into her. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you, she said to a tall man, but he had already passed and didn't look back. She scanned the area, searching desperately for that familiar face, for that red shawl. The force of her impulsivity caught up to her, slamming around her ribcage. She'd never done anything so uncalculated and reckless. What do we have here? A man asked, fixing his hat as he moved toward her. She felt for the diffuser in her waistband, and gripping the handle, turned her head down and skirted to the side. Again, she wished for Aja to appear. She ducked into a narrow alley, glancing back out onto the street with a shudder of panic. He should have caught up with her by now. She'd made a mistake. The woman wasn't here. The address was wrong. There weren't even numbered apartments in this area, and she wasn't about to go knocking door to door like a crazy person. Defeat sagged her shoulders. Her old nanny could have gone anywhere in the Northern Federation after her father had laid her off. She had no reason to come to this place. Feeling intolerably stupid, Lena forced one solid breath and peeked out into the street at the heavy flow of people. Part of her considered stepping into the rush, but it was hard to see exactly where she'd left the car or to know where she should go to find Asha. If she was being honest... The crowd frightened her a little, and staying put seemed like the best course of action. Damn it all to hell, she said to herself, and then in a burst recited every curse she'd ever heard Otto say. I always thought pretty girls weren't allowed to say dirty words. She spun around to find a boy leaning against the alley wall with his arms crossed. He was dressed warmly, like the others she'd seen, in an oversized wool coat and heavy slacks. A gray-knit cap was pulled back, revealing his eyes, piercing blue, like the river water just after it had been dyed. He had stubble on his jaw and chin, and a cockeyed smile that made all sorts of warning bells sound the alarm in her brain. He must have come out of one of the dented metal doors that lined these rain-stained walls, or climbed down the fire escape from a window above them when she wasn't looking. Surprised, her mouth gaped, but she shut it quickly. Excuse me? she asked. You don't have to excuse yourself, he said. I've heard a lot worse. I... no, Lena said, shocked by his forwardness. I'm sorry. I'll say what I like. So why are you apologizing? He moved toward her with long, confident strides, slowing when she took several quick steps back and nearly tripped over a broken chair someone had discarded. Stop right there. Please, she added, pulse flying. If she backed up any more, he'd push her right into the crowd and she'd be swallowed up. 
He stopped, grinned. Since you asked so nicely. Irritation heated her blood. She was not about to be undermined by a cocky boy from the factory district. She set her feet, set her jaw, and stood up as tall as she could. Even in her boots, she didn't quite reach his shoulders. If you're trying to intimidate me, it won't work. She tugged at her gloves. What's your name, anyway? His head tilted to the side, and as he gazed slowly down her body, a flush rose in her cheeks. Whoever had taught this boy manners had failed, miserably. Tell me your name and I'll tell you mine, he said. She gawked, but quickly pulled herself together. A Hampton remained composed, even under the most trying of circumstances. Lena, she said, cursing the waver in her voice. It's Lena. He held out his hand, calloused fingertips extending through the holes in his woven gloves. I'm Colin. Chapter 10 Colin She was pretty enough, he'd give her that much pretty and definitely in the wrong place. Her smooth, honey-colored skin and soft, clean hair stuck out just as much as those high-society clothes. Girls in Metaltown dressed for the cold outside and the heat inside the factories, layered up so bulky you could hardly tell their shape. Their faces were pale from long hours of work, and they certainly didn't wear makeup, not unless they were working a corner. She'd been the last thing he'd expected to find when he'd come up from the basement apartment, and he'd been caught so off guard that he'd glanced back inside just to make sure he'd dumped Hayden in the right place. Once he'd figured out he wasn't crazy, he settled in for the show, entertained by her nervous pacing and the curvy shape of her thighs. She was little, but full in all the right places, and something about the way she spoke made him think of the way kids balance on a curb, teetering faster and faster right until the moment they fall off. So, he said, How's your stay so far in Metaltown? Has the staff been helpful? Obviously, she was lost, but for some reason, he didn't want to point that out. She was probably from over the Beltway. Bakerstown, maybe, though if that were true, he had no idea what she was doing here. One gloved hand rose to smooth her perfect hair. I'm fairly certain no one would come here for vacation. He smiled at her condescending tone. I don't know. Metaltown is full of secret hot spots, you know. If you wanted a tour, I'm here for work. Her eyes darted to the flow of people outside the alley, then quickly back to him. The muscles in his chest clenched just for a moment. A Bakerstown kid, clearly out of her element, looking for a job. Something about that story rang familiar. What a coincidence. So am I. Colin took another step forward. She backed into the wall, her face drawn with worry. You should know, I have a weapon. Three guesses where you stashed it. Her cheeks turned bright red, the same color as her snug little jacket. One hand shot behind her back. Easy, he said, realizing he'd scared her. I surrender. He raised his hands over his head to prove it. She was shivering, trying to hide her chattering teeth, but the breath was clouding in front of her face. Not the smartest move, dressing so thin, but he'd made mistakes when he'd come here, too. If not for Ty setting him straight, he wouldn't have lasted a week. He wondered if she had anyone setting her straight. Not from the sounds of it. Definitely not from the looks of it. Here. He took off his scarf and offered it to her more than a little regretful when the cold air gripped his throat. Oh, I couldn't. Don't want to freeze to death. Besides, you can give it back next time you see me. She didn't laugh. That was promising. Her prissy little nose crinkled up, but she took it and folded it around her neck. He liked the way it clashed with her outfit. Soon enough, Metaltown would work its way into her clothes and her pretty skin, and that scarf would blend right in. It was kind of a shame when he thought about it. 
I'm a little lost, she admitted after a moment. You don't say. Her eyes narrowed, and now she took a step toward him. You don't need to make fun of me, she said. I haven't done anything to deserve it. I've got things to do, and I don't have time to play games. Is that what we're doing? he asked, amused at her scolding. Playing a game? Her lips parted slightly, and his gaze lowered there and stuck. Then he looked up, hoping she hadn't noticed, and jammed his hands into his pockets. Miss Hampton! A big man in a suit barreled into the alley, a line of sweat dripping from his black hair down his jaw. As his gaze moved from Lena to Colin, he bared his teeth. Finally, Lena muttered. Colin staggered back quickly. Hampton? He managed. Miss Hampton, the car is waiting across the street. Lena nodded, eyes flicking between the two of them. Hampton? Colin said again. Then he began to laugh. You've got to be kidding me. So much for both of them having the same sad Bakerstown story. Is this boy harassing you? The man glared at Colin. I suppose that depends on your definition of harassment, said Lena, clearly more comfortable in the other man's presence. Colin choked a little and she waved a hand. We barely spoke, Aja. Barely spoke? It became immediately clear that she didn't want to be seen associating with him, and he nearly laughed at the irony of it. She looked at him a second longer, as though expecting him to say something more. But what was he going to say to a Hampton? What was a Hampton even doing out here? They had middlemen like Minnick to run their factories. There was no reason for them to cross the beltway. Well, goodbye, she finally said, shoving her hand out so quickly he flinched. Tentatively, he shook it. Again. And when he squeezed her fingers just a little, she jerked away. Goodbye, she said again. Bye. He tipped his head forward, and she huffed, like he'd done it to annoy her. With her servant clearing the way, she marched back into the crowded street, leaving Colin bewildered in the alley. On his way to work, Colin stopped at the smoke shack outside the employee entrance of the stamping mill. The night crew was just about to get off, and there was still a half hour before he had to report for his shift at small parts. As he waited outside the door, the chill hit him. The girl had taken his scarf, he realized, a little annoyed now that he knew she probably had thirty of them at home. He could still see how she'd turned up her nose at the offer. He could still see all of her, perfectly. I suppose that depends on your definition of harassment, she'd said. Cold. Why he'd expected different was beyond him. But something about her was different, the way she'd acknowledged him at all, instead of blowing him off. The way she'd shaken his hand when they said goodbye. He didn't know how she was related to the big boss, but it didn't matter. She wasn't just flush, she was powerful, and that meant hands off. Not that he was ever going to see her, anyway. The door opened, and a rush of people exited the building. A few he knew greeted him with tired smiles and slaps on the back. Ida, your boy's here, a man named Fritz called, one hand clasped on Colin's shoulder. Sweat had etched lines through the powder smears on his forehead and cheeks. One more day down, eh, Colin? Till what? Colin asked. Till I die, Fritz answered with a wink and I can get out of this rat hole. Fritz, stop pestering my baby. Colin's ma was tall for a woman, built thick and strong. Her face was much like his, with a broad jaw and tired blue eyes. The sleeves of her stained shirt were rolled up to her elbows. Colin leaned in automatically for her to plant a kiss on his cheek. You look tired. Everything all right at home? She cracked her neck, rolled her shoulders. Yeah, he said. Everything's fine. She slept through the night. He didn't really know if that was true, of course. He'd only been home for a few minutes after he'd dumped Hayden at their friend Shima's to sober up. But when he'd come in, he'd heard Cherish's heavy breathing from the bedroom, and she hadn't roused when he'd rinsed her blood-soaked rags. 
Did Hayden check in? With a heavy sigh, she pulled a hand-rolled cigarette from her pocket and stuck it between her teeth. It took her four strikes to light the match. He hated that his brother made her worry. He did, Colin said. He left early for work, though. You look okay? Looked fine to me. Which he had, when he wasn't doubled up with the fever chills on Shima's floor. Ida took a handkerchief out of her pocket. A few crumbled crackers were inside, and she handed them over to Colin. I'm okay. He'd eaten at Shima's, and besides, he knew this was all his ma would have until the end of her shift. All right. Ida pulled his collar tighter around his neck, her lips thinning to hold the cigarette in place. Anything big I should know about? I talked to a Hampton this morning. Nope, said Colin. Anything new at the factory? Minnick made me scrub the Johns because I ran an errand for Jed. Where's your coat? Inside. Another full? She nodded. Colin felt bad for her. She'd been working more double shifts over the past few months. She paid her dues to the Brotherhood like everyone else, but her salary was barely enough to keep the lights on, and the money Jed Schultz sent was never enough. If Hayden could get himself together, they'd do better. If Hayden could get himself clean, he could be the one helping out, and Colin, like Fritz, could get out of this rat hole. Bastard was set on ruining everything. Colin chewed a sharp edge off his pinky nail. A buzzer went off inside the factory. Ida crushed the end of her cigarette against the wall and tucked it back in her pocket. Then she hugged him, and Colin could feel how skinny she was getting. Damn Hayden, and damn his stupid nitro. Love you, he said. I love you, Colin. Be good today. Do the right thing. Don't I always? He smirked. Yes, she answered, her brows still furrowed. You always do. Ty was already inside by the time he reached small parts. He recognized her things in the locker and placed his beside them. Minnick didn't even glance up as Colin passed through the metal detector. Either he was in need of a fix, or they had an inspection today. He was pastier than normal, and his collar was already soaked with a ring of sweat. The warehouse was warm, but the machinery had just started up, and it would just be a matter of time before the room was blazing. The place was already alive with the crank and hum of grinding metal. He wasn't surprised by Matchstick's black eye or by Martin's self-satisfied smirk. Zeke only yawned when Colin passed. He ducked under the moving belt and made his way toward the center of the floor where he and Ty were stationed. She was in the usual place, wearing her usual padding. How she could stand the heat, he'd never know. Her eyes were down her bare fingers twisting together two narrow metal rods. You're late, she said irritably. I've already done a dozen pieces so far. You better hurry and catch up. Beside her on the hip-high table were the fuses that Colin would connect to the waterproof copper wiring and transport down the line. Another few stops, and that detonator would be packed into a plastic sheath and screwed onto the nose of a bomb. By the time they reached the hot room a curtained area in the back, the workers would pack them with white phosphorus and nitroglycerin, sent over from the chem plant. Those jobs were the worst. First the burns on the hands, then the red eyes, then the sores around the nose and inside the mouth. Most workers there lasted six months before they started getting really sick. Once they started missing work, they got sacked. They didn't have protective gear like they did across the bridge at the chem plant. There was no reason to. They were just rats, like Minnick always said. Colin made certain he was so good at building detonators that Minnick would never have reason to transfer him down the line. How'd you get in here so early? He asked Ty. Minnick crashed in his office last night. She wiped a line of sweat off her cheek with the back of her hand, and it came back streaked with blood. Colin's muscles went tight. He removed the handkerchief from his pocket and walked to the water barrel to dampen it. When he came back, he passed it over to her without a word. She hesitated a moment before pressing the rag into the side of her head. When she looked up, 
Colin could see that her lip was split open again, and that half of her short, messy hair was matted with dry blood. He took his place beside her and picked up one of the pieces, exhaling slowly as he fitted it to the wire. His palms were already beginning to sweat, though, so he put it down and dipped his hands in one of the powder bowls near their station. When they were dry, he grabbed some needle-nosed pliers and went to work. "'Where are we headed tonight?' he asked. She knew what he meant. "'I took care of it,' she said. "'You find your brother?' "'Where?' he said carefully. "'The board and care?' "'I said I took care of it.' Colin pierced his thumb with the sharp copper wire and swore. He didn't look at her. "'You hurt, Ty?' "'I'm fine, all right. Just drop it.' He shook his head. He knew Ty, and he knew when she'd taken care of business. She came back haughty and good-tempered and talked more than usual. But when she was like this, when she wouldn't tell him what had happened, he knew she'd lost. If he hadn't been with Hayden, he could have had her back. "'I found him,' said Colin. "'He's burning it off at Shima's.' Shima made her rent money watching people's kids while they worked. He'd met her just after he'd moved here. She'd made Ty and him rice after she'd found them begging in Market Alley. She'd been there for him ever since, cleaning him up after a fight, nursing Hayden through a bender. She was a lockbox of secrets, and he thought she was as good as gold. Ty nodded, glad for the change of subject. They worked in silence as the time passed, finding a rhythm, twisting wires, inspecting pieces, throwing defective parts into the incinerator carts. They stretched their necks and backs and dried their hands with white powder, but did not sit down. Minnick would have had their asses if they had. The hours were marked by Maggie, the water girl, coming through with her jar and cup. She liked to linger. Normally, Colin didn't mind, but today he found himself wishing she would just move on. Don't you have a job to do? Ty finally barked. Maggie glared at her and continued down the line. On the floor, Martin yelled from the battery section. On the floor, Colin automatically passed on to plastics. The workers focused on their jobs, heads down, back straight. The foreman was coming through. Minnick appeared at the top of the stairs, flanked by two individuals, a slender man in a dark suit that Colin recognized immediately as the boss of small parts, and Lena. Colin dropped the part on the table, and the coils snapped off the metal bar. What the hell are you doing? Ty said between her teeth. Quick, throw it in the pile before you have to count it as an error. He spun around and tossed it into the defective's cart, just as Minnick walked through. And as you can see, we do the detonator piece work here, the foreman was saying. An unnatural, almost scary smile plastered on his face. Lena was still back with Martin, watching how he put together the batteries. Colin thought the poor guy was probably pissing himself being that close to a girl like her. Ty followed his gaze and grumbled. If I was flush, I'd buy some damn clothes that fit. Colin thought Lena's clothes fit her just fine. Lena, for God's sake, will you please focus? Otto Hampton said. I don't want to be here all day. Colin's shoulders tightened involuntarily. Lena's head cranked back, a tight look in her eyes that her brother disregarded with a wave of his hand. Good work, she said to Martin. She wasn't wearing Colin's scarf anymore, and he was more disappointed at that than he would have guessed. She'd probably burned it the second she'd left the alley. He kept watching her, ignoring Ty's hiss that he keep his eyes on his work. He willed her to see him, to recognize him, to say anything. It was killing him that she didn't see him. What's down that way? She asked, pointing to where the chemicals were packed into the metal canisters. Oh, nothing you need to be concerned with, said Minnick quickly. Just more wires and coils. The foreman didn't want her to see the kids with the red eyes, with the burns on their fingers, didn't want her to smell their puke in the trash can. Colin wondered what she would think when she saw that, if it would bother her, if she'd care, or if she'd just ignore it like her brother. 
Then her gaze turned and caught his. Her eyes went wide with surprise. She gasped. He smiled. And she lowered her eyes and walked by. What are you doing? Ty snapped. You want to get us fired? That was the boss and his sister, you idiot. Colin scowled. She'd acted like they hadn't spoken. She hadn't even acknowledged that he existed. He didn't know what he'd expected. She was a Hampton. So high above him, she probably had to squint to see him at all. The anger sparked inside of him again. This whole town was pathetic. Ty getting jumped, his ma working doubles, his brother on nitro. He needed to find a way to make some green, and then he'd be gone on a fishing boat, netting tuna and stuffing his face with food. Never before had he wanted so much to get out of Metal Town. He was still pissed when he saw Lena and her brother climb the stairs and disappear out the main doors. Seething by the time the runner came in carrying a message from one of the other factories and knocked on Minnick's door. But when Minnick came out, his face back to its normal, ugly expression, Colin's anger turned to curiosity. On the floor, he called, warning the others. Minnick stomped down the steps and made his way to the sorting area where the youngest kids worked. He grabbed one off his stool, the mouthy boy who had lifted Hayden's shoes, and dragged him toward the stairs. And then Ty, who would have cut off her own foot to keep this job, left her post and began to follow them. Chapter 11 Ty Whoa, Ty! She heard Colin call behind her. Ty! He grabbed for her arm, but she was already jogging toward the stairs, following Minnick and the boy up to his office. Let go! Chip was yelling, wriggling in the foreman's grasp. I got work to do, okay? Minnick boxed him hard against the ear, bringing a bright, angry mark to the side of his face. Stamping Mill needs someone to go over and help with something, he said. You do whatever they need, then get your scrawny ass back here and finish up. I won't finish if you make me go, he threatened. Then we'll stay as late as we need to until you do. Minnick's mouth twitched, and he licked his peeling lips. Ty's stomach twisted. She didn't know what she was doing. Her head was pounding, had been since last night. Combined with the heat and the noise, it felt like her brain was about to explode. Pure foolery. That was the only explanation for her abandoning her station, for why she was standing right behind them. She didn't know this kid. Not really. They'd only spent a few hours together. She hadn't called a safety on him. He wasn't hers to protect. But for some reason, she was remembering all kinds of things she didn't want to remember. All the times she'd taken a beating. All the times no one had had her back. She watched her hand lift saw her fingers not in the shoulder of Chip's shirt. What the hell is going on here? Minnick slammed her back into the banister at the top of the stairs. Her breath caught. She tilted back and nearly would have fallen over the ledge if not for her grip on Chip's shoulder. Kid has work to do, she said, blinking back the vertigo. If he doesn't sort my materials, I can't do my job. Minnick scoffed. Well, look at this. Small parts pride is alive and well. He raised a fist toward the sky. Why don't you go with him? Is that what you want? Ty, come on, said Colin behind her on the stairs. Oh, I see. It's a mutiny. Abandoned ship. Minnick went to shove Ty again, but Colin stepped between them. Don't push me, boy. Spit flew from Minnick's mouth. He jerked Chip toward his side, but the boy arched away. Ty's lip curled back in rage. We need this kid, or else we'll all be here for the rest of the night, said Colin. And Ty felt a surge of affection for him. He didn't like Chip, but he trusted Ty. Minnick considered this. He's that good, huh? He's a solid worker, Ty growled. And you he said, looking up at Colin. We all know you're good, don't we? Ty swallowed thickly. 
Colin's always over goal. Her friend was ramping up for a fight. She could feel it. She didn't want him to get fired. She didn't want anyone to get fired. She just wanted to make sure Chip was all right, that's all. And he wouldn't be with Minnick. Then I think the choice is clear. You two rats. Minnick pointed to Colin and Chip. If you're not at your posts in 30 seconds, you won't ever be back at them again. And as for our hero... He sidestepped when Colin moved closer to Ty. You can go see what the stamping mill wants. And I swear, if they fall behind while you're gone, all three of you can kiss this fine establishment goodbye. The stamping mill was only a block up factory row from small parts. She entered the gray stone building from the employee entrance, where she and Colin met his ma sometimes. Ty had never been inside before, but always thought the screaming grind of the metal inside and the tall, barred windows made the place look like something out of a nightmare. Inside wasn't much better. The noise hit her first, like she'd walked straight into a wall of screeching gears and crunching steel plates. It stole her breath and intensified the throbbing in her head. The main factory floor was so congested with machines and bodies, it was hard to see what was really happening. But the ceiling was three stories high, and some of the metal monsters went straight to the top. She followed the runner around the edge of the floor, searching for Colin's maw. But it was impossible to tell who was who when they wore those face masks and goggles. Small parts didn't make them wear gear like that. Probably better. They'd just fog up in the heat. What the hell is this? Ty looked up to see a burly man with an orange beard and a handkerchief tied around his forehead. He was wearing navy coveralls, same as the other workers, but had a clipboard in one hand. I said a kid, a little one. What's so confusing about that? The runner, a jaundiced boy with stringy black hair, shrugged. I'm small enough, said Ty, fearing they'd send her back to retrieve Chip. You're tall as me, he said, and hefty. I'm small enough, she repeated. Taking a deep breath, she pulled off her sweater and another underneath until she was just wearing a long-sleeved thermal. The bottom had ridden up over her knife handle, revealing two puckered circular scars on her stomach. And when he narrowed his gaze there, she shoved her shirt back down. She felt practically naked. Christ almighty, you stink, he said. And if I can smell you over the sulfuric acid, that's saying something. So don't stand so close, she said, avoiding his eyes. He blew out a long breath. All right, all right. You're scrawnier than you look. He cut straight through the middle of the room, and Ty followed, feeling too crowded with all the noise and people. Her heart was pounding by the time they reached the problem. A squat steel machine, still smoking, with red lights blinking near the handlebars. It's a steel press. The sheets go in there. He pointed to the right side of the belt, which was currently frozen. They get treated there with the acid. He showed her a spray bar that was meant to move down the pieces. Then they get flattened when you pull this lever. Clear? Yeah, said Ty. Yes, sir. Something's jammed in the compression chamber. Need you to shimmy up there and get it out. It looked easy enough, Ty thought. She'd have to climb the belt, move through the chamber, and jerk whatever it was free. If she did a good job, maybe this foreman would remember her and hire her before she was 18. It's off? She asked, checking the power switch. Course it's off, said the foreman. Think you were with the Brotherhood with the way you're carrying on. Without delay, she hopped nimbly onto the belt, feeling the rollers dent her knees as she crawled into the entrance. She had to flatten a little, but it was still big enough for her to fit. They didn't need Chip after all. Squeezing her body under the spray bar took a little work, and she coughed as the acid fumes burned her throat and nostrils. A glance to her left told her that the foreman and a couple other workers were watching. She needed to do this quick and right. Carefully, she flipped over on her back, staring up at the metal stamper above her head. A sudden thrill shook through her. 
If that came down, it would flatten her. It would crush her. If they turned on that switch, or if she shook a piece loose, she'd be a goner. Breathing fast, she searched the area for something out of place, but she didn't know the machine well enough to know what she was looking for. Finally, a sliver of steel caught her eye. It was lodged inside one of the gears near her right shoulder. Hoisting herself up on her elbows, she grabbed it and yanked twice before it fell loose. The machine gave a creaking moan. Ty held her breath. The stamper didn't fall, but she'd had enough. She didn't even bother flipping over. Still facing up, she clambered out like a crab, knees bent, arms holding her chest up. She moved as quickly as she could. So quickly, she banged her head on the spray bar. A fizzling sound and a clear liquid bubbled out from one of the nozzles. She saw it gather as if in slow motion. Then it fell and landed with a hiss just above her left eyebrow. It felt like liquid fire. Ty screamed. The acid burned straight through her skin to her skull. She swiped at it, but accidentally hit the bar again, and this time a wave of droplets sprinkled down over her. Pull her legs, she heard a woman yelling, but she couldn't move. Ty covered her face and tried to wipe away the acid, but it was tearing her skin away. And then it was in her eye, and everything went white on one side. Panic scored through her. She was going blind. Hands on her legs, jerking her from the machine. A smack of her head against the plastic rollers on the belt. Then she was on the floor, and someone was trying to pull her hands away from her face, but she wouldn't let go. It hurt. It hurt. It hurt. Ty, listen to me. Put your hands down. Do it. Ty recognized the woman's voice, as if she were coming from far away. But one eye saw only white, and the other was pinched so tightly it saw only black. The left side of her face felt like it was being buffed with sandpaper. A cool liquid was sprayed over her skin, but it brought only a little relief. Then she was being lifted by the shoulders and dragged into the office, where she was laid out on a lumpy couch. She curled into a ball around her knees, rocking back and forth. She needs a doctor. The woman's voice again. More cool water was sprayed over her face. It ran through her hair and made the cuts on her head burn, but it soothed a little of the edge off. Ty blinked open her good eye and recognized Ida, Colin's ma. She'll have to go to the charity house, said the foreman with some uncertainty. What are you talking about? Call the Brotherhood's doctor. Watch your mouth, Ida, said the foreman. You know as well as me, Brotherhood docs are only for charter workers. Ida swore sharply. She's a kid. A strange, unbidden desire rose within Ty. She wanted her parents. She wanted her father. Why, she didn't know. She couldn't even remember the shape of his face. No doctors, whispered Ty. She couldn't afford them. I gotta go back to work. Absolutely not, said Ida. Ty felt her body clench up, tighter than the panic. She was going to be fired, and the only other work for minors was in food testing and whoring. But she couldn't see. Shima, she whispered. What's that? the foreman asked. The pounding in her head had turned to a sharp throbbing in her skin. Each beat of her heart brought a new choking pain. All right said Ida with a frustrated sigh. Shima's a friend. Give me an hour to take her, will you, Max? I'll work over to make up for it. Ty felt herself pulled up and tucked under Ida's arm with a tenderness she'd never experienced before. Even though her whole body hurt, she grew stiff. Her legs barely worked when Ida pulled her to a stand. Can you walk? Ida whispered. Ty nodded. When Ty opened her eyes, she had no idea how much time had passed. The small room was lit by candles. The flickering flames threw bright waves across her vision. She kept blinking, but something blocked her left eye. 
She tried to push it aside, but her hands were wrapped. With a groan, she turned her face and saw two wide, blinking eyes staring back at her. The memory hit like a sledgehammer to the temple. Minnick and Chip. The stamping mill. The poison machine. She scrambled back, a blanket falling off her shoulders. She was only wearing an old T-shirt, one that wasn't even hers, and socks had been tied at the wrists over her hands. Her legs were bare. She tried to cover them with the blanket, but couldn't separate her fingers in order to do so. Up, screeched the child who'd been staring at her. Up, up. Hush. Ty registered a shadowed figure that entered from her bad side, and she tried again to loosen the socks from her hands. Shima grabbed her wrists and held them down. Ty, be still. She purposefully adjusted to Ty's good side, showing the feathers of black hair and a sturdy, calm gaze. Her amber eyes were lined with crow's feet, the only hint of her age. What'd you do to my hands? Ty slurred. She felt dizzy. You were scratching. Shima untied the bindings. You need to see a doctor. At least when McNulty ran these streets, you could go to the damn doctor. Ty couldn't remember a time before the Brotherhood. It was hard to imagine a metal town that Jed Schultz didn't rule. A hazy memory slid into place. A white office. A doctor's office. Strange devices that let you hear a person's heartbeat. Someone must have told her about it. She'd never been to a clinic before. How do you feel? Shima asked. Doped up? said Ty, shaking off the image. You gave me something. She hated feeling woozy and tired, out of control. Corn whiskey, said Shima. Little Benny's dad pays me in the stuff, knocked you right out. There were more children around her now, all blinking at her with their mouths open. None of them were older than five. Ty inhaled sharply. I've got to get back to work. Where are my clothes? I'm washing them, though maybe I should have just lit them on fire. Her voice took on a tone of reprimand. Ty suspected her clothes weren't the only thing that had been washed. She smelled like lye soap. The panic rose within her. She was practically naked. My clothes, Shima. I need my clothes. You'll get them assured the woman. Your shift's over. Ida covered for you. She told small parts that you were staying at the stamping mill through the afternoon. Ty felt a little relief, but was reluctant to believe Minnick would grant her a second pass after missing so much work. Here, said a little girl, placing something in one of her hands. For your owie. It was a little rope doll, the kind Shima made from mops for the kids she watched. Ty had never been given a doll before, and didn't really see the point in one. Still, she took it with a curt. Thanks. A knock came at the door. Shima, it's me. Ty recognized Colin's voice and jolted up. Head still muddled, she grabbed for the blanket. Shima stood, but Ty stopped her. Having him see her like this without her clothes, without her pride. It was too much. Ty, are you in there? Let me in, okay? Sounds worried, commented Shima, quirking an eyebrow. Tell him I'm sleeping, Ty said. Tell him I'm not here. Tell him whatever you want. Just get him out of here, okay? After a moment, Shima nodded. Ty stumbled into the tiny bathroom and pressed her ear gently against the door. She could hear Colin telling Shima that his ma had filled him in. Shima was right. He did sound worried, and that made her buzz even stronger. A few minutes later, the room fell silent. He was gone, and she was glad, but part of her wished he had stayed, too. That was the crazy corn whiskey talking, she told herself. There was a little aluminum mirror above the sink, and Ty startled when she saw her reflection in the low light. The bandages had been wrapped at a diagonal across her head, 
and her cropped hair stuck out through it like a patch of grass. Gently, she unwound the dressing, shuddering when the vision on her left side stayed bright and unseeing. Through her good eye, she saw herself in the mirror, saw purple skin and hideous welts and yellow-tipped blisters. Her stomach turned, and she dry-heaved into the sink. She looked like a monster, like someone half-human, half-dead. Good, she thought. No one will ever want to look at me again. Then she melted into the floor and covered her mouth with her hands and wept. Chapter 12 Lena For three days, Lena locked herself in Otto's office at the Hamptons' estate. He made no attempt to stop her, but instead gave her free reign of his case files, stating that he could care less how she wasted her free time. So while he was gallivanting around the river district with precious Miss Dwyer, Lena read his reports, or rather, his lack of reports. Otto paid shoddy attention to the details of the business. There were discrepancies, errors, missing income, and some months there was more money reported than there should have been. A lot more. How is it possible to double your profit without doubling your workforce? She asked herself, glowering out the window at the Blue River. The water gargled and hissed as Darcy poured another cup of hot peppermint tea. Lena knew the extract was meant to soothe her, but this was no time to relax. Otto had made an unintelligible mess of things. Why don't you take a break, Miss Hampton? You've been at it all day. We spend money on raw products, supplies, power, and staffing. Lena ticked off, ignoring her. Our expenditures don't change month to month, so unless the employees are working in the dark... Lena blew out a long breath feeling as though she could sink into the floorboards. Darcy's face went grave. Some tea? He's not paying the workers, Lena realized. My brother's not paying the employees. It was the only way the figures made sense, the only way they could increase their income without making any other changes. Darcy gave a shrill, forced laugh. Now, Miss Hampton, that's your brother we're talking about. The Hamptons are fair, honest employers. The whole of Metaltown would starve to death otherwise. Have you seen them lately? They are starving. She remembered the people working in her brother's factory. The rashes from the cold. The prominent lines in their necks and their jaws. The way they barely filled their clothing. The hungry way they looked at you through those piercing blue eyes. The way they'd give you the clothes off their backs, just to keep you warm. She shook her head quickly, noticing how her hand had gripped the scarf she'd folded on her lap. She'd washed it, of course. Who knew what kind of germs he carried? But regardless, she found herself stroking the soft fabric through her glove, reminding herself how it had lain against his neck. Colin's neck. When she'd seen him working, she'd been surprised— in hindsight, she didn't know why. Of course he was a laborer. He dressed like one, acted like one, hard and rude and arrogant. Even if he was handsome in a way that made her brother's refined friends seem as two-dimensional as bad art, he'd done nothing but ogle and annoy her in their short time together. But seeing him there, sweating, worn out, had put her on edge. She didn't know why she felt sorry for him. Honest work was a point of pride which was why she was here, digging through these files. Brows drawn together, she looked again at the spreadsheet for last month. Six workers laid off, and six new hires, and double the net income from the previous month. She was sure she was right. Otto wasn't paying them. Why would these workers continue to show up if they weren't getting a paycheck? This wasn't the Eastern Federation, where workers' wages went to support the masses. If someone worked for a living, they should be compensated. Anger boiled inside of her. Her brother would ruin their family name. Darcy fidgeted uncomfortably, her elbows pointed out like wings. Miss Hampton, 
If you're not going to say anything substantive, simply don't speak, snapped Lena. I don't want any more of that damn tea, either. Darcy frowned and placed the cup and saucer on the table. As she retreated toward the exit, Lena felt the prickling of shame. Darcy, wait. I didn't mean to be rude. I just... Darcy paused at the study door. I just want to show them there is more to me than songs and dresses, that I have a brain, that Otto isn't better just because he's a man, that I can do this. Be careful, Darcy whispered, refusing to look back. No one crosses a Hampton, not even you. But just be careful. Lena was still considering Darcy's warning when her father walked in. She stood, slyly leaving the scarf on the chair behind her, and straightened her blouse. Where's Otto? he asked his face as telling as marble. Out, I suspect, she said. Her father narrowed his eyes, and she swallowed. I have some business I need to discuss with him, he said. When will he return? He was already annoyed, which meant Otto was in trouble, which in turn meant she was in trouble. He said he had a meeting, with the foreman, I think, she lied, hurrying around the desk. You can tell me. A slight grimace crossed his face, making her feel like a too eager puppy. I've been reviewing the book since I went to the factory earlier this week. I've noticed several things I want to discuss with you. You can ask your tutor or your brother if you have any questions. Lena frowned. You could teach me. About the business, I mean. Her father's brows lifted in genuine surprise. He took a step forward, placing a hand under her chin. Had a good time in Metaltown, did you? She hated the way he played it off as if she'd gone there on some shopping trip. It was very enlightening. Good. I find a little time there is all I need. Lena stepped back. For what? He opened his arms to remind me how grateful I should be for all I have. Oh. She hung her head, feeling worse than when she'd yelled at Darcy. She was grateful. Every day her meals were prepared for her and sampled by an employee for her safety. She was driven where she needed to go, had her clothes tailored to fit her shape, and every night she fell asleep in a big, soft bed. Lesson learned. The superiority in her father's tone made her cringe. Yes, sir, she added. Good. Then tell Otto I need to speak to him. The winds are changing, it appears. The advocates attacked another supply train heading for the front lines. One of ours? The last rebel attack had been detrimental, wounding their efforts to keep back the Eastern Federation. She'd seen a report that nearly 2,000 soldiers had died, which was substantial in a war that had already claimed nearly 30,000 lives since the fighting had sparked, almost 40 years ago. That's right, he said. The wars crossed onto northern soil again, and our men need more ammo to push those bastards back across Eastern Federation lines. We'll need to increase our shipments by a quarter. Business, dear daughter, is good. His eyes sparkled like ice. Business is good, she repeated. Has anyone found the advocates? No. He gave a short, confused laugh, as if surprised she had taken interest. Tell Otto the news, will you? She forced herself to smile, though her insides withered. I'll tell Otto. That's a good girl. Otto was nowhere to be found. Lena even called on Ms. Dwyer, but was told she was out shopping with Mr. Hampton. The maid seemed pleased with the social match. When it was clear Otto had no intentions of coming back soon, Lena made her decision. Maybe her brother didn't care about the family business, but she did. And if she just could take care of some of the problems he'd let slide, her father would see her competence. He'd know she was grateful. He'd be proud of her. 
Darcy's words echoed in her mind. No one crosses a Hampton, not even you. The woman was out of line making statements like that. Lena would talk to her about it first thing tomorrow. Maybe the men in her family didn't see her as an asset yet, but they would. They just needed proof. She would give them proof. While Aja drove the electric car across the beltway, Lena practiced what she would say to the foreman. They needed to increase their output, and if that meant dedicating more resources to overtime pay, then so be it. There was a war going on, and the Northern Federation's military depended on Hampton Industries. He'd agree, of course. He was paid to take orders from a Hampton. It didn't matter which one. Maybe she'd even see Colin. The scarf he'd loaned her was in her bag. She'd return it if they had a moment alone. But that was foolish. Of course they wouldn't be alone. Technically, he was her employee. They would never again talk to each other as freely as they had in the alley when neither had known the other station. The thought distressed her, and she plucked at the black pinstriped skirt and suit jacket she'd chosen to wear. She'd changed three times before picking the right outfit, a fact that made her feel ridiculous. This was a factory. No one was going to notice the way she looked. Aja parked on the curb, activated the car's security device, and walked her through the front doors of the factory. The checkered tiles on the floor stopped abruptly as she passed through the staff entry and gave way to peeling yellow linoleum. She walked briskly to the foreman's office. Through the windows, she could see the floor below and the bodies grouped around each station on the snaking belt. The thought of those workers, most of them her age and younger, going without pay made her insides twist. She was glad they'd stayed loyal to the company. Hampton Industries wouldn't survive without them. Mr. Minnick? She knocked twice on the door, fixing her black leather gloves while she waited. When no sound came from inside, she pushed through, frowning at the mess of papers on the man's desk and several half-empty mugs scattered around the room. The noise was louder here, but still muted by the glass walls overlooking the floor. She sidestepped through the office to the walkway, where the volume increased, and moved to the railing. There, she spotted the foreman near the center of the belt, talking to Colin. He was wearing the same beige, long-sleeved shirt he had been when she'd seen him the other day. The neck was ringed with sweat, and the sleeves were rolled up to the elbows. He was taller than the foreman, broader around the shoulders, but leaner at the waist. So different from the men she'd seen in the River District. Less refined in every way, but somehow more real because of it. And she was staring. Why had she come down here? She could have just as easily called from home. She told herself she should wait in the office, but as she was turning away, she remembered that her family owned this company, and she could go where she liked. With her jaw set, she returned to the stairs, her heels clicking down every metal step. If anyone noticed her, they didn't acknowledge her presence. They kept their heads down, even the youngest of the children, who were sorting the pieces. She clutched her purse to her side, feeling distinctly invisible. When she drew closer, she could hear the foreman yelling. Colin's eyes snapped to hers, held for a moment, and then lowered. The heat in the room seemed to increase by ten degrees. Beside him was a girl, the same who had been here the other day. Only now she wore a knit cap. What showed of the left side of her face was covered by bandages. You're down in count, rat, and that's the bottom line, reprimanded the foreman. And Lena promptly forgot why she'd come here or what she'd planned on telling him. She was too shocked that he'd just referred to an employee as a rat. He looked as though he were about to carry on, too, when he noticed the way Colin and the girl had shifted their attention to her. Miss Hampton! Mr. Minnick's face grew a bruised shade of red, and the rivulets of sweat rolling down his cheeks glistened. His eyes were bright with panic. What happened to you? Lena asked, stepping toward the girl. She would deal with Minnick's behavior at another time. Are you all right? Yes, ma'am. The girl turned her face away, and to Lena's surprise, Colin positioned himself so that she was half hidden behind him. Lena lifted her chin, 
surprised that he was attempting to shelter this girl when all she had expressed was concern. Some of these workers are unpredictable, said Minnick. This one's down in count by 30 pieces over the past two days. Well, she's clearly injured, said Lena. I'm fine, ma'am, said the girl. It's just a scratch. Lena gave Colin wide berth as she approached the girl. She had thick eyebrows, horrible dental hygiene, and a mass of scars scattered over her flushed face. The heat in here had to be killing her with all those layers. Perhaps she'd just come in from the cold outside. Why is your eye covered? Did something happen? She's fine, said Colin. Then under his breath, he added, Back off, Lena. The comment enraged her. She was his superior, and he was going to get his co-worker hurt further by making her stay on the job in this condition. Had he no compassion? You need to go home and rest, she told the girl. No. The girl began working faster, churning out pieces that even Lena could tell weren't precisely right. I can do the work. I'll meet the goal today, I promise. She'll finish, assured Colin, glaring at Lena. I'll make sure of it. Well, I'm hardly going to depend on you, Lena said. They stared at each other in heated silence, and between them shot the glances of the other two. Colin looked away first, jaw flexing. You heard the lady, said Mr. Minnick. Sorry, sweetheart, you're dismissed. Take care of yourself. Wait, said Colin at the same time the girl sputtered. You can't fire me. Who said anything about firing? said Lena. Even if she'd wanted to, surely she didn't have the authority. Or maybe she did. Mr. Minnick looked eager enough to please. My apologies, Miss Hampton. I thought that's what you meant, said Mr. Minnick, motioning her off to the side. We can hold her position if you like, but we can't hire someone to take her place while we do. Keeping her on the books will slow down production. Lena thought of her father's news, that they needed to produce more weapons for the front lines. Business is good. For the Hamptons, maybe, but not for everyone. I see, said Lena, mouth going dry. She looked away from Colin's furious glare and forced her gaze to the girl, trying to focus on what her father would do. I'm sorry. On her way out, the girl bumped hard into her shoulder, knocking the bag down to Lena's elbow. The scarf inside spilled out over the edge, and when Colin saw it, he shook his head and turned away. Chapter 13 Colin Snobby little greenback bitch! Ty shouted into the night. The noise was enough to turn a few heads in front of them, but apart from some grumbled responses, no one stopped. What did you expect? muttered Colin. She's a Hampton. They'd replayed variations on the same theme since he'd met her after work at Shima's. Not that she wasn't right. Lena had cost Ty her job, and in Metaltown, if you didn't work, you ended up on the streets, and then you ended up dead. Colin wasn't going to let that happen. Ty could come stay with him for a while, if that's what it meant. He could float one more person. One more cup of water in the watered-down broth wouldn't exactly ruin the flavor. But telling himself this didn't cure the unexplainable rage he felt every time he pictured Lena's face. What had he expected? Just because they'd talked didn't mean she wasn't a Hampton. Didn't mean she had any idea what kind of damage she could do with just a few words. She was probably home now, eating a big dinner with her dad and brother in her nice, warm house. She'd probably forgotten all about what had happened at small parts. A headache was brewing right behind his eyes. Another worker would take Ty's place tomorrow, and Lena would never know the difference. But this would change everything for Ty. Well, that Hampton is going to be sorry when she's the one who's got to work the line because everyone else is either sick from the hot room or cut loose. Ty kicked an empty tin can across the street. He pictured a nearly empty small parts factory with only Joseph Hampton and his two kids on the line. It helped his mood a little. My eye's just an excuse, she went on. 
You know she came there to trim the fat. Probably was just about to pull names on who to sack when she saw me. She didn't come there just to fire you. Oh, is that right? And how would you know that? They rounded Whore's Corner to Market Alley, where the shops were bustling with the after-work crowd. You could see it on her face. On her stupid, flush face, you mean? Bit Ty. What are you talking about, her face? Who cares about her face? Her mouth is what fired me. There was no winning with her when she was like this. How's your face? She stiffened beside him. Fine. Can you see yet? Yeah, she said too quickly. Almost. Colin dragged a hand over his jaw. You should have let them take the kid. If Lena hadn't fired you, Minnick would have, just for being a hero. Ty had stopped walking, and when he noticed, he turned back. What? Lena? Colin felt his ears get hot. The boss's sister. Oh, I know who Lena Hampton is, shot Ty. Do you? Shifting irritably, Colin quickly explained the situation he'd walked into at the beginning of the week. When he was done, Ty was laughing. He might have taken this as a good sign of her recovery if she hadn't been so damn sarcastic about it. You're lucky she doesn't have you jailed for menacing, she said. Normally, he would have shrugged it off, told her, we'll see, or something like that. But he knew she was right. In the two times he'd seen Lena Hampton since their first encounter, she'd treated him like the invisible man. But she did still have his scarf. It didn't make sense. It wasn't a big deal, he said. I didn't even remember it until just now. Ty made a noise of disbelief. What did you need over here anyway? I'm broke, in case you forgot. We're going to talk to Jed about your job. Schultz? Her one visible eye widened. Do you know another Jed? Uh-uh. She stopped and turned on her heels. Brotherhood doesn't cover kids. The Brotherhood covers injuries on the job, though. And anyway, he likes me, and he knows you. He covered for you with Minnick when we went to Bakerstown. A chill ran through him at the memory of Gabe Wachowski and his father. Ty shook her head. I don't need his help. I don't need anyone's help. Shut up, he said. You don't even have to say anything. I'll talk. You just stand there and look desperate or something. Colin wasn't sure Ty even possessed such an emotion. I'm not desperate, she said between clenched teeth. You will be when you're working whore's corner. She shoved him hard on the chest, and he bumped back into a cart of tableware. A set of metal bowls clanged together and then fell to the cement. He was pissed, too. Pissed that she was so damn stubborn she didn't get it. She was thicker than blood to him, and he wasn't about to let her freeze to death under the bridge. You want me to say it? He asked, exasperated. Please, okay? Please, Ty. Come with me. There. You happy? She melted back a step, rolling her shoulders to shake it off. Fine. He sighed, almost wishing she'd kept fighting so he could burn off some of his own pent-up anger. They pushed through the crowd, stopping at the Brotherhood's door. Colin stood a little taller, remembering how Jed had told him they were alike and that he didn't need to lie. Jed had been generous to his family. He hoped he wasn't stepping over the line to ask for one more favor. He knocked on the door, throwing Ty a harsh look that told her to play nice. Iman opened the door, reminding Colin of just how big the man was. His flat face didn't show any recognition, but he did move aside and led them down the narrow hall to Jed's office. The people's man was sitting behind his desk, wearing a new suit. A fancy one, like a greenback would wear. He almost looked like a different man in clothes like that, and Colin felt a cold feeling of dread come over him, like coming here had been a bad idea. Mr. Walter, said Jed with a yellow-teethed smile. How are you, Colin? Good, said Colin. Real good. Got some new duds with the green you gave me. 
The green you earned, corrected Jed with a nod. I see that. Not too shabby. Colin felt his confidence build, even as Ty's jaw began grinding beside him. Is everything all right with Cherish? Concern warped Jed's brow. Oh, yeah, Colin answered. I actually came by for a different reason. He swallowed. Ty here was injured on the job. Well, not really on the job. The stamping mill pulled her out to fix a machine and she got some burns on her face, and then small parts let her go because her eyes all messed up. Jed's gaze shifted to Ty, and it struck Colin that he hadn't ever looked at her before just then. What a shame. Take off your hat. Let's see the damage. Ty faltered. It's just a few burns, sir. Take it off, Jed repeated. Do it, Colin hissed. What was wrong with her? You didn't say no when Jed asked you to do something. Ty glanced over at Colin, her one eye pleading. A spike of guilt drove through him, but still he reached for her hat and pulled it back. Head hung, she unwound the bandages, and his breath caught when he saw the bright red welts on her skin. There was pus, too, leaking from the blisters, and her left eye was bloodshot and unfocused. Ty had lied to him. She was blind. She was never going to see again. He wanted to hit something. He chewed the inside of his cheek, biting down hard so that he'd think of anything else but how hurt she was. Shima should have told him it was this bad. Ty should have told him. And now he was making her show it off like some battle scar. Maybe someone needed to hit him. Jed cringed. Iman, come look at this. The big man stepped forward from the door and bent down to see Ty's wounds. His expression didn't change. Colin's fists tightened. Well, that is bad, said Jed. Does the doctor say it will heal? Of course it will, lied Ty, her voice so small it made Colin flinch. That's good news, he leaned back in his chair. Colin noticed the cool tone and realized that Jed wasn't going to offer anything unless he asked outright. He took a deep breath. I was thinking you might be able to get her back in at small parts. Talk to Minnick or something. The Brotherhood doesn't extend to children's work. Colin stiffened. He wasn't a child. But since she was working at the stamping mill when it happened... The fact that it happened at the stamping mill makes no difference, said Jed. He shook his head, disappointed. You thought you could walk in here after I put those clothes on your back and ask me to break the rules? No, sir, said Colin quickly, feeling the situation taking a turn downhill. I just thought, since you'd talked to Minnick before about us being late. You thought wrong. Jad leaned over the desk, dark eyes piercing. Believe it or not, I don't owe you anything. I never thought, in fact, if anyone owes anything, it's you, Colin. Your brother has a debt, did you know that? He borrows to fund that little fix he's got. Surely your mother would be distraught if we came to your home to collect. Colin's mouth fell open. You don't need to go to my house. Now that's just rude, said Jed, suddenly indignant. After all I've done for your family, you wouldn't even invite me in? That's not what I meant. An insult like that has me rethinking my generosity. I'm sorry, sir, stammered Colin. I didn't mean anything by it. Beside him, Ty was quickly rewrapping her wounds. Panic blossomed like the first draw of blood. Coming here had been a stupid idea. Jed was going to stop the payments that kept Cherish alive. He wasn't going to help Ty, either. Things had been fine one second, and the next had spiraled out of control. Jed sighed. I know you didn't. You were just trying to look out for your friend. He sat down again, and Colin became aware of his muscles humming his organs vibrating. 
Just a word to the wise, kid. This is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Sometimes the best thing you can do is cut your losses. He glanced over Ty again. Colin went very still. Gone was the confusion. Gone was the anger. And in its place remained a different kind of fury. A dangerous kind. Is that the Brotherhood's official opinion? He asked. Colin, muttered Ty. Jed smiled. Of course not. If you paid your dues to the Brotherhood, I'd give you the Brotherhood's official opinion. But I'm afraid you don't. You just reap the rewards. Colin stepped forward, but Ty grabbed his shoulder. He tried to shake free, but she wouldn't let go. Then Iman had his collar and was dragging him down the hallway, out into the gray light of Market Alley. Colin made for the river with Ty on his heels. He didn't speak to her. He couldn't even look at her. The shame was almost worse than the fury, and he was ready to rid himself of both. He stalked down the crumbling sidewalk, past the pay-by-the-hour motels, to abandon the road. The dive on the corner was alive with neon lights and already full of metalheads, laborers mostly, avoiding going home. Lacy's where they served penny shots of corn whiskey and never pretended the stuff was safe to drink. The bouncer outside was meaty and marked up the forearms by half-finished tattoos. Before Lacey's, Rico had worked at small parts. Exposure in the hot room had made him sick, and Minnick had turned him out to find the only work he could, food testing. A bad batch had messed up his lips, and as a consequence, he wore a perpetual sneer. Lacey had hired him because he looked like a monster. Hayden in there? Colin barked. Rico rolled his head to the side. You going to cause me trouble if he is? No, Ty answered for him. Rico's sneer deepened as he inspected her face. Keep staring, Ty challenged. I'll make sure your eye matches mine. Colin pushed past them inside scanning the bar and the patrons huddled over their dirty glasses. Behind them was standing room only. The laughter was already turning raucous. Call in, Zeke called from over in the corner. Martin was there with him, and a few others from small parts. Colin didn't stop. He wove through the bodies toward the back, to where Hayden was sitting on a fold-out metal chair, dealing cards onto a wooden crate. Four other guys watched his hands, waiting for him to slide a card and cheat. Colin felt his control snap. The fury rolled through him, blocking out the lights, blocking out the other people, blocking sound and reason. He lunged over the makeshift table, grabbed Hayden by the shirt, and hoisted him to a stand. Cards and money scattered across the plank floor. What the? Colin hit him, hard enough to crack his nose. His knuckles flared with the pain, but he didn't care. He wheeled back to hit him again, but Hayden had lowered, and he charged straight into Colin's gut, knocking the air from his lungs. Colin crashed into a group behind them and hit the floor. Glass cracked somewhere near his head. He swung up, connecting with Hayden's side. A grunt filled his ear, brought on a dark satisfaction. He hit his brother again and again. Hayden's elbow swung back and knocked him hard enough in the temple to make his vision waver. And then the weight was suddenly absent. Collins sucked in a tight breath. No trouble, my ass, growled Rico, holding Hayden upright in a headlock. Zeke's arms latched under Collins and heaved him up. His brother's eyes were red-rimmed, his dark hair matted with sweat. The blood ran freely from his nose. He swiped at it with the back of his hand. Fighting had erupted around them, a chain reaction of explosions. Glass shattered, voices raised. Colin saw Ty taking a swing at a guy in a chem plant uniform. Martin pulled her back. Get out, ordered Rico. Work it out outside. Hayden and Colin were shoved out the front door, into the empty street and the frigid night. Inside, the fighting raged on. I was on a streak, said Hayden. You cost me half a day's wages in there. Colin got right back in his face, sick when the sticky sweet smell of nitro wafted off of him. Why don't you ask Jed Schultz to spot you then? I hear he's been loaning you all kinds of green. 
Hayden fell back, brows hiking up his forehead. Where'd you hear that? Where do you think? From Schultz himself, when he was telling me he could cut the money for Cherish if you didn't pay up. It was close enough to the truth, and Colin wanted nothing more than to make Hayden crumble. You don't want to mess around with Schultz, little brother. Hayden's voice was low. Oh, that's perfect, said Colin. Go ahead, try to tell me what to do. You can't even take care of yourself. It's pathetic. Hayden turned away like he was going home, but stopped and came back to Colin, squinting and pointing. Everything's so easy for you, isn't it? So goddamn easy. Colin's head fell back. Easy? Nothing was easy. His mom was sick, and his brother was a junkie, and his best friend was half-blind. He was the idiot, yet again, wanting everyone to be something they weren't. Yeah, everything's real easy, Hayden, he said bitterly. Glancing back through the bar window, he found Ty still standing, yelling something at Rico. She was all right, at least for now. But things were changing. She'd had her fair share of scrapes, but what had happened with her eye was different. It made her vulnerable, and he'd never thought of her that way before. He forced a heavy breath, standing side by side with his brother, facing the black water that lapped against the concrete barrier beneath the bridge. A train was rolling down the tracks at the shipping yards on the edge of Bakerstown, and the sound carried over the distance. He wondered if Lena could hear it all the way in the river district and then felt stupid for even thinking it. I'll get clean, said Hayden. Okay. He wondered if he sounded as skeptical as he felt. The minutes passed. Colin knew he should go home, check in, take care of things, try to get a few hours sleep in before work tomorrow. He cringed when he remembered that Ty wouldn't be there with him. He hadn't worked a day without Ty by his side in four years. It's not so damn cold on the water, said Hayden, chin digging into his collar. Sometimes when the tide was out, we'd lay out on the dock in the sun. That kind of warm goes straight to your bones, keeps you heated half the night. Colin felt a pull deep inside of him. He wanted to feel that kind of warmth, the kind that burned off the chill and the sickness and the hunger, and the crushing defeat that he couldn't help anyone he wanted to help, including himself. But at the same time, he wished Hayden would just shut up about it, because he was sick and tired of stories that never came true. You coming home? Colin asked. Hayden's eyes shot quickly to the door, then back to Colin. Yeah. Now? Now. Hayden grumbled a curse as they turned up the street. You messed up my back, little brother. Good. Chapter 14 Ty Ty wandered the streets with no particular destination in mind. The shadows were thick this time of night, and she watched them like they were living, breathing monsters, rather than the shrouds of the sick who wandered aimlessly from Beggar's Square. No Bakerstown cops crossed the tracks to Metaltown, not that they would have kept the streets safe anyway. Knife in hand, she walked faster, feeling the blisters begin to bite at her heels and the cold claw under her collar. She was tired of Lacey's, sick of the noise, and sick of people staring at her face. She could have gone to Shima's, but the sublevel apartment was cramped, and Ty didn't want to be a burden. She wasn't an invalid, after all. She'd used up all her green from the last payday. Even if she had been able to forget what had happened last time, the board and care was out. If she'd stayed on at small parts until the end of the week, she might have been all right. But kids who got fired didn't get to claim their wages. That was Minnick's rule. So she walked, heated by her hatred for Lena Hampton. Hampton might not have been the one to dump the acid on Ty's face or sick those mutts on her at the board and care, but her hands were still dirty. It was her people who owned stupid small parts, who allowed for knotheads like Minnick to take advantage— her people, who let Jed Schultz's brotherhood protect the adults, but not the kids. Now there was nothing for her to do. No one hired a girl with one eye. 
and the Brotherhood would never cover her as an adult because she'd been injured before eighteen. The despair clung to her back, sharp nails lodging in her muscles. She moved faster, trying to outrun it. Lena Hampton had fired her, ruined her. Ty remembered that pathetic puppy dog look on Colin's face when he'd said her name. That had been its own special brand of betrayal. He just couldn't figure out where he belonged. Well, she was tired of reminding him. It was long past midnight when she reached the familiar stone statue of St. Anthony. One thin stone arm stretched before him, the other broken off some time over the years. He looked eerie in the dark, like a corpse in the streetlight. Ty quickly skirted by into the projects. Twelve floors high, Keeneland Apartments was on the verge of ruin. The brick siding was crumbling, the windows almost completely boarded up. Graffiti marked everywhere within reach, and the fire that had scorched the west corner had become a hole for squatters since the owner, some pig-faced greenback from the river district, refused to fix it last year. Ty hustled around the outside of the building, clamoring through the weeds and empty bottles toward the fire escape. Just to the left of it was the dumpster, and the smell coming from it was enough to make her gag. She froze when she heard several voices back near the statue. Someone broke a bottle against the stone, making her shudder. Laughter echoed off the brick siding as they moved on. She climbed the fire escape to the second floor and huddled in the shadows below the window. There wasn't much warmth coming from inside, but it was enough to take the edge off. She felt safer here, with her back against the wall. She felt safer knowing he was close. Her eyelids grew heavy. Her arms pulled inside the sleeves of her shirts, wrapping around her bare stomach. Her knuckles grazed the two matching scars beneath her knife hilt, reminding her of a nun at St. Mary's who told her when she'd gone to take a bath that she shouldn't let people use her body to put out their cigarettes. If that's what had happened, Ty couldn't remember. Probably better that way. A hacking cough from within the apartment roused her, but when it quieted, she drifted again. Get up, she told herself. Don't fall asleep. The woman's hand was cold and dry like bones, not warm like her mother's, not full like her father's. It grasped her fingers so tightly she recoiled, but couldn't shake it loose. Come on, the woman's voice shook, and that brought hot, fierce tears to the girl's eyes. They were outside a stone building, the damp shadows clinging to their skin. The woman knelt down, scooped up icy mud water from a puddle, and sloshed it into the child's hair. It bit into her scalp and dribbled down her face. Her dress was ripped, too. The collar shredded, leaving only her stained underskirt. The sounds were too much like growls in this strange place. The cold made her shiver so hard she could barely stand. Finally, the woman knocked on a dingy wooden door, told the girl to stay put, and ran. She cried then, wailed, her tiny bare feet frozen to the step. She wanted her mother. After several moments, the door was unbolted, and a lady appeared in the lamplight, a sour look on her face. She was dressed all in black, her hair and neck hidden by a scarf. She only shook her head disapprovingly and then picked the little girl up. Ty surged to her feet, a rattling at the window above turning the remnants of that strange, familiar dream to dust as she sprung for the fire escape. She was too late. The plywood board was lifted off the frame and pulled inside, and the sharp curse from within had her freezing in her steps. Trying to kill me? Colin whispered. He had a waste basket tucked under one arm as he stepped over the ledge to the platform. Instantly, he replaced the board, coughing once as the cold air hit his throat. Ty couldn't think of anything to say. Her tongue felt too thick. Dawn had come, and she'd stupidly fallen asleep outside Colin's door. For all the times she'd come here, she'd never been so lax. He was wearing his work trousers already, the pants Jed had bought for him. They reminded her of what had happened the last time they'd gone to the Brotherhood's office, and she forced herself to look away. What are you doing? he asked. You crash out here again? Her teeth chattered. 
No, just walked over. He went to the ledge and turned the wastebasket upside down, spilling half a dozen bloody rags into the dumpster below. Ty's heart clenched. If I was flush, she said, I'd get her medicine. When he rubbed his eyes, she noticed how tired he was. For an instant, she let herself wonder what it would be like living here with them. She could help him take care of the family. If I was flush, he said, a small, sad smile playing over his mouth. I'd get your eye fixed. Her throat tied in knots. She crossed her arms over her chest. I was thinking I might talk to Hayden about a job at the chem plant. Maybe she'd talk to him about some other stuff, too, like getting himself together. One brow lifted. They only hire over 18. You know that. Of course she knew that. People say I look older. Couldn't hurt to ask. You know, he paused, frowned. You know you can stay here, right? Ma says it's fine. She felt her spine zip up. I can take care of myself, thanks. He leaned against the rail, sighing. Can you? I mean, you know I've got your back, but who else does? What are you talking about? I've been thinking, he said. About Jed. She groaned. Oh, here we go. Just listen. He chewed the nail of his little finger. Jed started the Brotherhood because no one was protecting the workers. They were getting beat up and fired and not getting their pay. And? And? It sounds a whole lot like small parts, right? I mean, you've worked there since you were a kid. Never missed a day. And Minnick goes and sacks you the second you get hurt. On the job, no less. Minnick didn't fire me, Hampton. Anyway, I started thinking. Why doesn't small parts have a brotherhood? Because brotherhood is just for adults. She didn't know where he was going, but the scheming in his voice made her nervous. I mean our own brotherhood. Why doesn't small parts have something like that? A charter? The Hamptons would smash it. Why? Because we're kids, said Ty. Because we're nobodies. Colin was pacing now, tapping the wastebasket under his arm like a drum. Well, this nobody makes 80 detonators a day, and I'm pretty sure a bomb's just a hunk of metal and nitro without that. So what are you saying? You want to stop making detonators to teach them a lesson? They'd fire you faster than they fired me. They can't fire all of us. Ty laughed. All of us? You mean all the workers at small parts? I'm pretty sure they can, prep school. And do what? Hire a new set of workers? Who's going to train them? Minnick? Ty abruptly stopped laughing. He did kind of have a point. But this was crazy. How are you going to convince over a hundred workers to stop their jobs? Colin grinned. I'm not. You are. They met at Lacey's after work, when dusk had lit the Metaltown sky a bruised yellow-gray. Ty had been sick with nerves since this morning, but she'd come anyway, because as much as she thought their plan wouldn't work, a small part of her hoped it did. Rico had boiled water for her in silence. When the parasites had all burned off, he poured it into a cracked mug and set it on the bar. Rico didn't like to talk much, on account of the pain in his mouth when he spoke, but it made her feel a little better being around him. His face was damaged, too, and he'd still managed to find work. Colin stood beside her while she slumped on the stool, gripping the mug so hard her hands shook. Chip settled in the front row, looking doubtful that this would be as entertaining as she had promised. Martin and Zeke had come, and Matchstick, who was forced to stand in the back because he was so tall. Others, too. A girl named Agnes Ty had known from St. Mary's, who mostly kept to herself. Slim, who worked in batteries. No Neck, whose ears rested right on his shoulders. And even some of the guys from the warehouse. 
All in all, there were 19 of them. Hardly enough to break small parts, but still more than she'd expected. They quieted on their own, all watching Colin expectantly. He cleared his throat. So, like you've all probably heard by now, Ty got pretty worked over at the stamping mill a few days ago, he said loudly. Ty could feel their eyes boring through her and bristled at the attention. Small parts fired her, and you know nowhere else is going to take her with her eye all messed up like that. You blind, Ty, called Martin. Maybe now you can finally kick her ass, joked Zeke, slapping him on the shoulder. Several people chuckled, but Ty felt too sick to join them. At the stamping mill, there's rules the Brotherhood enforces when someone gets hurt on the job, continued Colin. They get three days' leave and a doctor's care. And most important, their job gets held while they're gone. The boss can't hire anyone to fill it. But it's small parts if you get hurt. You get fired, said Chip. Colin eyed him, annoyed, but the murmurs of agreement around the room returned his focus to the plan. At the chem plant, they get protective eye masks and gloves, and they can't dock your pay whenever they feel like it. The foreman can't rough you up without the Brotherhood roughing him up. Ty noted the distaste in his voice, but doubted that the others knew what Jed Schultz had said to Colin when he'd asked for help. It was important that Colin point out the good parts of the Brotherhood, like they'd discussed, rather than the dangers of it. They needed people to want to join them, not get scared off. That true, Hayden? asked Zeke. Everyone looked back to where Colin's brother stood beside Matchstick. Hayden jerked up awkwardly, but his eyes were clear. It was strange seeing him sober. Colin went rigid, obviously surprised he'd shown. Yeah, said Hayden. Yeah, he's got it right. My sister works at the uniform factory, said No Neck. He'd just been transferred to the hot room after a year in plastics, and his eyes were already bloodshot. They get two breaks a day. Small parts, we only get one, and only for five minutes. Barely get to the front of the line at the can in five minutes. More nods of agreement. I don't see folks at the stamping mill pulling doubles and not getting paid for it, said Agnes. We get sacked if we don't work them, and then stiffed when we do said Henry, a musclehead who worked in plastics. I say we torch the place and be done with it. That can be arranged, called Matchstick from the back. One of the defective detonators was swinging around his pinky finger by its thin copper wiring, and he grinned as the others broke into laughter. Ty couldn't believe how the mood in the room had changed. She lifted her chin for the first time, pushing her hat back off her forehead. Colin smirked down at her. Maybe he'd been right. Maybe people would make a stand. Maybe she'd even get her job back. Pissing and moaning is one thing, said one of the boys from shipping. But this is the kind of stuff that gets us all sacked. Nothing good comes out of it. What if it could, said Colin, stepping forward. Nobody over 18 puts up with this crap. Why should we? Because we're grunts, argued the same boy. Ty had a tough break. Could have happened to any of us, but that's the way it is. She knew the risks when she took the job. She took the job because there wasn't another one, said Colin. And Ty swelled at the bite in his tone. Look, alone, we're just like Ty. Sacked and homeless and... I get it already, inserted Ty. Minnick is one man. There's over a hundred of us at small parts, Colin continued. If we tell him we want changes, he'll fire us, said Martin, plain and simple. Colin glared at him as the others began to protest. I was quitting anyway, called Matchstick, puffing his chest out. Once I collect my inheritance, that is. It was an old joke in Metaltown. Years ago, before Ty could remember, the owner of the food testing plant had died. His kid had gone missing likely killed by the same illness he'd tried to destroy. Hampton himself had posted a reward for information, but no one had dared to collect. 
Only a fool went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the big boss and demanded money. Several people fought Matchstick for the title, all demanding that they were the rightful heir. That was how the joke always went. You know I got your back, Ty, interrupted Zeke. But I got my sister to look out for. I can't be getting myself fired just because you did. You understand. I understand, said Ty, hands gripping the mug again. I understand you're full of it. Don't be like that, said Zeke, frowning. Be like what? Honest? Stop, Colin hissed at her. Of course you have to take care of your sister, he said evenly. But don't say you got my back if you've only got hers, Ty finished, skin hot. Chip burst to his feet and stood beside her. There was fire in his eyes as he glared back at the crowd. Colin stood his ground. How would you like it, Zeke, if you were in Ty's place right now and she was the one saying sorry about your luck? Come on, man, groaned Zeke. If we stand together, we can look out for each other, said Colin. They can't run a factory if all the workers refuse to work. That got some laughs. Ty felt a familiar itch inside of her. Soon her hands were fisting and her eyes had narrowed to slits. All the workers, mocked Nonak. None of us work, just to make a point. Why not? asked Colin. We can keep taking it, or we can crew up and do something about it. Martin was shaking his head. You're talking about organizing a press. Ty had heard of a press. Once upon a time, the stamping mill had pressed for rights. They'd refused to go into their factory and instead stood outside and blocked the doors, stopping production completely. They even got their own shirts made. The stamping mill press had been organized by the stamping mill charter, a group of workers tired of their boss's crap who joined up to make things better. The Brotherhood, they called themselves, led by Slick Jed Schultz. That's right, said Colin. We hold out, stop working, and press the boss for what we want. Since when did you get so goddamn noble? chided the second shipping boy. Since I figured out, no one gives a damn about us. What about Jed Schultz? What's he got to say? Who cares? shot Colin. He hunched suddenly, Adam's apple bobbing. A hush came over the room. Colin had spoken blasphemy. Ty wanted to stuff the words back in his mouth. Even if Jed was slippery as the grease in his hair, you didn't badmouth him in public. That was dangerous. Jed Schultz must believe the same thing, otherwise he wouldn't have started the Brotherhood, she said. But it was too late. Sorry, guys, said Martin. But thumb pave better than no pay. One by one, they fell into their old conversations, their old jokes, their old fights, and Ty and Colin melted onto their bar stools, defeated. I got your back, said Chip to Ty. I'll pledge right here. Pledge to what? muttered Colin. Pledge to the code, he said, as if this were obvious. Street code. Ty smiled, despite herself, and the movement hurt her face. Street code. That said you didn't beat up on kids smaller than you. That if you didn't call dibs, your stuff was up for grabs. And if you shared food with someone, they owed you later. And that said if someone said they had your back, they had your back. Chapter 15 Lena Lena's room sparkled. Her clothes were refolded or straightened on their hangers. The floor had been scrubbed. Her sheet music on the stand was organized and filed away. Everything was in its proper place. There were staff members to do the housework, of course, but with her mind reeling, Lena had demanded to do it herself. She scrutinized the mirror over the dresser, searching for streaks in the glass. Every time she thought it was perfect, she noticed another one and had to start over. It had been this way since Aja had driven her home from Metaltown the previous afternoon. From the cage before the window came a high trill. Lena glanced up. Her yellow bird stood out sharply against the black night outside. 
It's not my fault, she answered. The bird cocked his head to the side, then jumped to another wooden dowel. It's not. She collapsed on the parlor chair, groaning at the tight muscles in her lower back. Letting that girl go was the ethical thing to do. What if she'd hurt herself more? What if... She balled her rubber cleaning gloves and tossed them across the room. She'd been so flustered by what had happened, she hadn't even told Minnick he couldn't call the employees rats. Managers have to make tough decisions. That's the bottom line. The small parts factory cannot afford to fall behind right now. The bird trilled again, and she could hear the accusation in his song. Then why haven't you told Otto or your father what you did? Why haven't you been able to stop thinking about the look on Colin's face when you fired his friend? I don't have anything to be ashamed of, she said, hating the defensiveness in her tone. In fact, I'll go downstairs right now and tell father. The idea lifted her spirits. Maybe this would show him that she cared more about the company than Otto. She quickly changed into some casual slacks and a soft blue blouse and was padding down the stairs barefoot before she remembered that she wasn't wearing gloves. She hesitated but didn't stop. Riding high on momentum, she searched the second floor, not finding him in his bedroom or his office. Perplexed, she returned to the stairway, taking the steps down to the ground floor, and passed through the kitchen with its broad marble countertops and cherry cabinets. The sound of muffled voices in the parlor froze her in her tracks. It was late, but not unreasonable for her father to hold a meeting. Still, she was usually informed of such things, so she would know to stay out of the way. Curiosity had her tiptoeing to the swinging door. She pushed it gently, ears attuned to the conversation in the next room. For five hundred units, I'll expect a little more, my friend. There was ice in her father's tone. A little more, sputtered another man. I get the feeling it's always a little more with you, isn't it, Hampton? Lena recognized the voice, but couldn't place it. War is expensive. That it is. A sigh and the clink of ice in a glass. The business of war, he mused. Tell me, Hampton, are you as cunning with the Eastern Federation as you are with your own people? Lena's stomach tightened. Her father had no contact with the Eastern Fed. The two federations had been in hostile negotiations over food and water rights since before she'd been born. When he'd served on the assembly, he'd supported legislation to increase the North's military, to keep their way of life protected. A defensiveness rose within her. To suggest her father was communicating with the enemy was to imply he was a traitor. My business with the Eastern Fed is my own, answered her father. Tonight, let's focus on what we can do for each other. The other man laughed and placed himself in Lena's memory. The stranger who had watched her sing and asked why he should enter into business with her father. Very well, he said. In order to keep our little rebellion in action, we'll need five hundred units of artillery delivered by railway, in unmarked crates to Billington. It's quiet there. We'll run no risk of this going public. Oh, and without armed security this time, if you please? I'd hate to have our shipment steered toward your front lines. That hardly does us any good. Another clink of ice within a glass. General Aquila was pleased with the last shipment, I take it? Aquila? Lena recognized the name. He was the leader of the advocates. A cold dread whispered across her nerves. I assume so. He did take the product, didn't he? The man gave a short laugh. The breath locked in Lena's throat. The groaning of a leather chair. Someone was getting up. Half of the payment now, half upon receipt, the man continued. That ought to fuel this damn war for another eight months, at least. Lena's hand slipped, and the door whined softly on the hinges before she caught it. She eased it back on the jam, wincing as a second passed in silence. And if it doesn't, said Lena's father, then we'll be in touch. She could hear the smile in his voice. 
The meeting was drawing to a close, and Lena had heard enough. Heart pounding, she darted silently to the stairs and ran up to the top floor. Only in the safety of her room did she finally release the breath burning inside her lungs. Billington was in the Northern Federation, near the border of the Yalen Mountains. Her father was arranging to ship weapons there, quietly, in order to support a rebellion. But not just any rebellion. He was supporting the Advocates, the very group responsible for destroying the Northern military's supply train. The Radicals who would see the North, her father's own Federation, fall and turned over to a bunch of starving farmers who had no business running it. Even as she processed this, she doubted it. Her father was a powerful man, maybe the most powerful in the Northern Federation. He employed thousands of workers and supported their military with weapons and supplies. He was a patriot. It made no sense to betray his own people. No sense to fund the group who would see him taken from power in the name of fairness and equal rights. Unless he then planned on sending more weapons the other way shifting the tides back and forth at will. War was a business, as the man had said. Her ears could not deny what they had heard. Her heart could not deny the dread squeezing it. Hampton Industries was selling weapons to their enemies to keep itself in business. Business is good. Footsteps on the stairs stopped her from pacing and automatically she pulled back her hair and inhaled several deep, composing breaths. It was likely the maid, checking to see if she needed anything. She could not appear flustered. Nothing could appear out of order until she figured out what was going on. Two successive knocks, and her father pushed into the room. Lena's eyes shot to the floor, and she concentrated on slowing her heart. Up late, aren't we? he asked. Oh, are your gloves in the laundry? She hurried to the dresser and slipped an extra pair on from the drawer. As she picked up her comb, her hands shook. She couldn't think of what to say. Her father wandered to the window, unbuttoning his suit jacket and leaning down to face her bird. Do you remember when I got you this? She unlatched her long braid and began combing through the strands, watching him in the mirror's reflection. Yes, sir. You were so happy that day, as a child should be, a songbird for my songbird. Her shoulders lowered an inch. We built the cage together. He laughed. Yes, we did. I'm surprised you remember. Of course I remember, she said quietly. When he smiled, she felt the blush stain her cheeks. This was not the man she'd heard downstairs. In a surge of relief, she realized she'd misheard. Her father was a good man, a grateful man, like he'd told her. She was wrong not to trust him. Your mother used to sing to you as a baby, he said wistfully. Lena felt her heart skip a beat. He never shared anything about her mother. She did? Yes, he said. You were so little, you'd fit right here in my arm. He crooked his arm to show her. The first time I saw you, I couldn't believe how much you looked like her, how fragile you were. Lena's hand had paused mid-stroke. Her father had never before spoken so tenderly. You're still so fragile, he said. He undid the latch and in a quick move grabbed the bird, holding it firmly in his hand. The brush fell from Lena's hand with a clatter, and she quickly righted it. Forcing herself to be calm, she crossed the room to where her father stood, a serene look on his face. Softly, he stroked the bird's belly while its head twitched side to side. A sob rose in her throat. Do you have what it takes to be a Hampton, Lena? Yes, of course, she said, her voice cracking. Her eyes stayed glued to her little yellow bird. The friend who sang with her, who listened when she needed to talk, who she never once had dared to touch. His chest was rising and falling too fast. Please, she said, you're hurting him. 
You will hurt people, Lena. I can. I did, just this week. I thought you said you wanted to learn about the business, he said, squeezing tighter. I thought you wanted me to teach you. Please, Daddy, she pleaded, the tears stinging her eyes. Then you must be willing to learn. One clench of his fist, and the bird's neck was broken. Lena's hands covered her mouth, the tears streaming down over her covered fingers. She stared at her bird's poor, lifeless body as her father placed it back in the bottom of the cage and latched the door, leaving it there for her to gaze upon. Chapter 16 Colin In Ty's absence, Minnick temporarily moved a kid named Henry up the assembly line until he could hire a replacement. Henry was big. Colin's height, but built like a tree trunk. Perfect for plastics, which was where he'd come from, but crap for the intricate work that fuses required. He was all thumbs, which meant Colin ended up doing both their jobs. He'd had it good with Ty. She was quiet, efficient, and dependable on the job. She knew when to talk and when to get busy. And best of all, he didn't have to explain every little thing to her. Part of him thought he should just let it go meet half his quota, and blame the loss on Henry. Maybe they'd let Ty back then. But what did that prove? That he'd been all talk last night at Lacey's. That he didn't really give a damn about anyone but himself. Which made him just like all these other cowards who wouldn't stand up for one of their own. Hell, if he was really Ty's friend, maybe he would have quit with her. But two missing workers didn't make an impact like fifty. Or a hundred. There had to be a way to get them to see. He was still mulling over options when Martin's voice carried over from batteries. On the floor. A moment later, the foreman appeared, red in the face and practically steaming. He stomped down the stairs and yelled across the belt to Colin and Henry. Think he wants you, said Henry morosely. Colin tensed. Apparently, this day could get worse. As much as he'd wanted to stand up for Ty, getting fired was about as much fun as a kick to the face. Damn. He grabbed his handkerchief from the table and stuffed it in his pocket, then wiped the white chalk on his hands off on his shirt. Minnick turned back up the stairs without an explanation, and as Colin followed, he tried to think of how he was going to explain to his ma why he couldn't help her with rent. At the top of the stairs, he followed Minnick into the office raising a brow at the big foreigner, Lena's bodyguard, standing with his arms crossed across his massive chest. You're lucky she doesn't have you jailed for menacing, Ty had said. His muscles grew tight, his spine straight as a ramrod. Little Greenback had sure taken her time telling Daddy. He never should have talked to her. Let's get this over with, Colin said. No point in sitting down or making himself comfortable. Getting cut loose was one thing, but if she wanted him jailed, she had another thing coming. He studied his exits, ready to bolt. Someone wants to see you, said Minnick. Not quite as freakishly happy as when the boss was around, but not his normal sneering self, either. I can see that. Outside, said the bodyguard. He looked angry. Oh, right, said Colin. I get it. I just step outside, and then what? Minnick's jaw twitched. You tell us, kid. Miss Hampton would like a word with you, said the man. And you'll treat her with the utmost respect. Or else, Colin taunted. Or else I'll break your legs, said the man. Like that wasn't the plan all along, he muttered. He wiped the sweat off his forehead with the back of his hand. Lena wanted to see him? Right. More like this guy and a few of his friends wanted to send a message. Where was Ty when he needed her? He was glad his boots were already laced up tight because he doubted they were going to let him go back to the lockers to get his knife. He might not have been a Bakerstown pansy, but he could still run. Let's go, he said 
adrenaline pumping. The man disappeared through the door that led to the front of the building, but before Colin could follow, Minnick snagged his arm. What's your game, rat? I'd tell you, Minnick, said Colin, but I don't think you'd understand. Minnick squeezed Colin's wrist until his fingers started to tingle. His other fist was ready to strike. If he was going down, he might as well go down in flames. I understand that you're stepping on toes, rat. Big toes. Jed Schultz kind of toes. Heard he's gunning for you. What'd you say, huh? What's got that white knight all riled up? Colin jerked out of his grasp, feeling the blood drain from his face. Don't know what you're talking about. Minnick smirked. Sure you don't. Someone had gone to Schultz after last night. They'd probably told him about the meeting, how Colin wanted to start his own brotherhood, how he'd said he didn't care what Jed thought, as if he weren't on bad enough terms with the man already. Colin turned away and pushed through the door. This wasn't the time to lose focus. He had more pressing issues. It occurred to him that maybe the Brotherhood was who would be waiting outside. Slowly, he entered the empty lobby of the building. There was nothing here for him to grab, nothing to use as a weapon. He looked outside, but the street was empty. Hiding, he thought. Someone's out here waiting. But all he saw was that sleek electric car parked on the street, and the Hamptons' man standing beside it. Warily, he pushed through the doors outside, feeling the cold air punch all the sweat-soaked patches in his shirt. His heart was pounding. He crossed the street. The man opened the car door. Inside was Lena Hampton. Word traveled fast. Even the boss had heard what he'd said last night at Lacey's. Doing one final survey of the area, he leaned down to face her. You wanted to see me? She was wearing a soft-looking sweater and pants that showed the shape of her legs. Her eyes were bright with worry, the kind that had had him talking to her in the first place. Still, not altogether sure he wasn't about to get jumped, he drew in a slow breath and reminded himself to keep a safe distance. Please sit, Colin. The tentative way she tried his name on for size had him scowling. She patted the seat beside her with one satin glove, making him realize how little skin she showed. Just that thin, graceful neck and her pretty face. I'm fine right here, he said. Trouble followed this girl. She'd been the one to cut Ty loose and was probably about to do the same to him. Oh, of course. Her chin dropped. I just wanted to return this to you. She reached into the purse at her feet and removed the scarf he'd given her. Damn. He hadn't thought she'd kept it, but seeing that she meant to give it back stung a little. Realizing it was best to get this over with quickly, he scooted in beside her and pulled the door closed, feeling immediately warmer inside the small compartment. Outside the window, her man glared at him, and he raised both hands to show he wasn't doing anything worthy of a leg breaking. She offered the scarf again, nearly shoving it into his lap. It's yours. He wasn't so sure he wanted to keep the memory of this encounter wrapped around his neck. But you said you'd get it back when I saw you next. And I didn't. Her mouth formed a small O. She unfolded the scarf, refolded it, and then tried to hand it to him again. I'm sorry for the delay. I'm sure you've been missing it. It's a scarf, he said, and then gave a short laugh. You think I can't afford another one? I'm sure I'll survive somehow. The color brightened her cheeks. He liked that more than he cared to admit. That's not what I meant, she said. I'm not used to people giving me things. Somehow I doubt that. No, gifts, that's what I mean. Unless I could pay you? What did you have in mind? Her eyes grew wide, and she glanced to her bodyguard, still outside. Take it easy, he said. I was joking. You don't get out much, do you? 
I've been here twice this week already. Yeah, he frowned. I remember. She straightened, turning more to face him, and when she did, her knee bumped against his. She apologized, then backed into her door to widen the space between them. That's why I wanted to speak to you, actually, to talk about what happened. And here I thought you just wanted to get me in the back seat. He drummed his fingers on the driver's compartment directly in front of them. Are you never serious? He snorted. Are you really dragging this out? Dragging what out? Aren't you here to fire me? What? No. No, I'm not here to fire you. I just wanted to talk to you. Wanted to see if that girl had found work. And if not, maybe I could help her find something. That'd be nice, since she got hurt on the job and all. He bit the inside of his cheek, not meaning to have been so free with his words. Lena's mouth dropped open. She did? I thought... Why didn't Mr. Minnick tell me? Probably because he's the one that sent her to the stamping mill where it happened. Lena's face, drained of color, fell into her hands. He blinked down at her, surprised that she was genuinely upset. When she sat back up, several hairs had slipped from her braid. She looked better that way, like she wasn't trying so hard to be perfect. It'll be all right, she said in a way that made him think she was talking to herself, not him. It won't be hard to find her something else. There are plenty of jobs that don't require a lot of experience. She had years of experience, he scoffed. You think we're born knowing how to wire fuses? That's not what I meant, she said. I meant that the work she was doing... It's not exactly skilled labor. Her face turned red. His probably did, too. So anyone can do it. I'm not saying that. She cringed, likely because she was saying that. I didn't mean to offend you. I know. That's what makes it worse. She clasped her hands over her lap, squeezing to the point of shaking. I'm sorry. I've really made a mess of things. That wasn't my intent. He shrugged. Don't take this the wrong way, Lena. He paused, checking her response to the use of her name. But what do you care? You're a Hampton. She's nothing to you. None of us are. She stared at him. You don't know me. Yeah, I'm beginning to get that, he said quietly. I'm talking too much. She looked flustered again. Please tell the girl that I'd like to make up for things. A moment of awkward silence passed. Okay, he said. He could already imagine how well that would go over. Lena's back straightened, her chin lifted. You don't believe I'm good for it. Does it matter if I do or not? Yes, she answered. You should trust your employers to keep their word. Her tone was so genuine he almost pitied her. She really believed that this was the way it worked. The fence around her house must have been sky high to keep her so sheltered from the real world. Trust is a hard promise to keep, he said slowly. Trust is earned, she said. I understand that. He scratched his jaw, suspecting this was an act, and curious what she had to gain if it was. He was a nobody at the factory. He hadn't been there half as long as some of the others, and he sure wasn't Minnick's favorite. He was just a guy she'd met on the street, a tiny piece of the big Hampton machine. Winning his allegiance was useless. But winning hers might not be. If she really did intend to help Ty, maybe she could help all of them. Minnick didn't listen. Otto Hampton didn't care. But Lena had the positioning to make things happen. Goggles and suits in the hot room, maybe. Clean water for the workers. She'd bat her eyes at Daddy, and they might even get overtime pay. I'll tell her you want to talk, he said. Good, she said, and thank you for your time. And just like that, he'd been dismissed.
He pulled the door open and stepped outside, right into Otto Hampton. Startled, he jerked back. Otto was wearing a collared shirt, neatly pressed, and his short, dark hair was greased to the side. He was standing beside Lena's driver, thumbs tucked into his trouser pockets. Hope I didn't interrupt, said Otto. Colin's shoulders rose. Otto! Lena jumped from the passenger side. What are you doing here? Surprised, sister, asked Otto. Mr. Minnick works for me, as you seem to have forgotten, as do the rest of the employees. He sent an appraising glare Colin's way. Lena's surprise iced over. She marched around the car until she was standing between them. I reviewed your reports, Otto. It appears as though I'm not the only one forgetting things. Colin was impressed. Maybe he knew even less about her than he thought. Otto Hampton snorted, his expression slick with arrogance. Does father know about this? He tilted his head toward Colin. About what? Say it, Colin silently dared, if you're man enough. Oh, this is rich. Otto cracked a smile. He's going to defend your honor. Rage, hot and sudden, struck him. Otto's smart mouth was about to earn him a broken jaw. Lena turned to Colin, her eyes pleading. Go. You've been excused. Excused? The fun never ended with this family. Yes, go back inside, said Otto, before I change my mind and have you arrested for assault. Colin looked to Lena once more, and only when she nodded did he start walking. And one more thing, said Otto, slapping his palm on Colin's chest. Colin looked down at it slowly, imagining how he could break each finger. Next time you put your hands on my sister, at least have the decency to bathe first. Colin mustered a cold smile. Without a word, he walked back inside. Chapter 17 Tie Days lasted forever when you had no green and no work. Ty waited in the alley outside small parts at closing time, but no one came out. An hour passed, and still the doors stayed locked. Just before dark, she walked to Beggar Square and got a cup of broth and some corn mash from the line. But when she returned, there was still no movement. Come on, Minnick, she groaned. She hated overtime when she was working, but now that she wasn't, she sort of missed it. There was something calming about knowing where you were supposed to be and what you were supposed to be doing. She had been good at her job, and everyone knew it. Now what did she have? Nothing. She kicked a broken bottle against the door, and as if by magic, the chain inside rattled and it swung outward. She recognized the faces. Harker, TJ, and a quiet kid Colin called Loudmouth. None of them looked at her. They wanted to play the high and mighty game? Fine by her. She didn't like them anyway. When Colin emerged, the load on her shoulders lightened. He spotted her across the alley and walked over, yawning and stretching his arms. Take all night, why don't you? She said. Miss me, Ty. Kiss my ass. She spat on the ground. Thought maybe another supply train had been taken out and Minnick was making me work a double. At the mention of the advocates, he groaned. They were all still burned from the extra work they'd had to do last time the rebels had struck, only to have more overtime stuffed on. But something else was bothering him. A few days ago, he wouldn't have had to tell her. She would have known because they would have been together. But now she felt a space between them. Zeke tore out of the exit, his face set and furious. He was running by the time he reached the street. Late to pick up his sister said Colin. Ty snorted, remembering the way he'd used her as an excuse not to make a stand against Minnick. Too bad for him. Martin came up behind them. How the vacation, Ty? She wove her fingers, stretched them before her. Wouldn't know. Spent all day at the train station loading boxes. 
It was half true, anyway. She'd been to the train station looking for work, and when they turned her down, she'd gone to the uniform division. She'd spent four hours in their lobby before the foreman finally came out and told her they didn't need a girl with one eye. Ty looked away when Colin's brow lifted. You hungry? Starved, he answered. Hayek still got his cart out, called Martin. When they reached the street, it became obvious that most of the others had the same idea. Ty was hungry again. The broth and mash hadn't done much to quiet her grumbling stomach, and she began taking stock of everything hanging low enough that she might be able to grab without the old man catching on. Colin was surveying the line before them, brooding. Spit it out already, said Ty, tired of him holding back secrets. He pulled his hat down over his ears. You hear anything today about last night? No. Why? Think someone told Jed Schultz what happened at Lacey's. Someone did, in fact, said a man behind them. Ty spun around, her knife already palmed, before she realized Jed himself was standing three feet away. Beside him were Iman and three more men from the Brotherhood. They were big, dressed like greenbacks, and didn't look particularly friendly. Mr. Walter, said Jed, flashing a fake smile. His harsh gaze was pointed at Colin. Mr. Schultz. Colin's ears turned faintly pink. Ty placed herself on his left side, where he was weaker, even though it kept her blind on the outside. A mix of fury and fear scored through her. After their last meeting in Jed's office, she didn't know what to expect. She became aware that the line had gone quiet, Everyone's eyes were upon them. Some concerning news has come my way, said Jed. Unexpected news. Colin didn't say anything. Jed leaned back, hands in his hip pockets. Do you know what an organized press is, Colin? Ty's shoulders jerked. Colin was right. Someone had ratted to Jed. I've heard of it said Colin carefully. Do you know what happens to workers that press when they don't have a charter? When Colin didn't answer, Jed took a step forward. They get fired. They lose their jobs. And then they go hungry and lose their homes. Do you know what happens to the man that leads them? Colin stood his ground, silent. He gets blamed for all those hungry stomachs and cold nights on the street. Some of us are hungry now, said Colin. Ty bit down on the inside of her cheek. I know what it's like to want to help, said Jed. I know better than anyone, and so I've been thinking. He glanced behind them, making sure everyone was listening. Here it comes, thought Ty. Jed opened his arms. Small parts would be a welcome addition to the Brotherhood. We can look out for these people. Take that heavy burden off your back. Slick. So slick it made Ty feel slimy. He wouldn't be offering unless it helped him somehow. Behind her, people had begun to murmur. Colin contemplated this. We'd get the same rights as the other factories? A doctor and pay when we work overtime? Of course said Jed, eyes gleaming. I'd make sure you get everything you need. And what do you get out of it? He asked. Jed's smile faded. The satisfaction of helping the children, of course. And our money, said Ty. Jed barely glanced over. There would be a small fee, he acknowledged. Members pay dues. Of course, mumbled Ty. I got to pay you to watch my back, shot Chip. Ty hadn't heard him approach. He stood on her bad side where her head was still bandaged. Get out of here. She pushed Chip behind her, willing Jed to forget his face. The street lamps flickered on. I'll bring the paperwork tomorrow, said Jed with finality. He turned. Wait said Colin. You didn't answer the kid's question. Why should we pay you when we can do the same thing ourselves? 
Jed turned slowly. Because I talk to Hampton, and you do not. You need me. No, said Ty, feeling all eyes turn her way. There was no going back now. She took a bold step forward. You need him. You need all of us. You wouldn't get paid otherwise. It was all coming together, all making sense. If I recall, you were fired, weren't you? This doesn't affect you. Ty's face went red. She could still feel his disgust when he looked at her eye. She could still see it on his face. Why now? You were doing fine without small parts. Why do you care now? Jed ran his tongue over his top lip. Keep your dog on a leash, Mr. Walter. He spoke in a low, threatening voice that only Colin and Ty could hear. That's your second warning. Colin's chin lifted. You haven't seen her off the leash, believe me. The smirk on Jed's face faded and was replaced by the same darkness Ty remembered in his office. Well, consider this. Her smart mouth just got your mother kicked out of the Brotherhood. You know what that means? No more protection. No more charity. Ty felt a shimmer of fear work through her. You can't do that! Beside her, Colin shifted, teeth grinding. Oh, believe me, said Jed. I can do anything I want. He backed up and looked slowly around the crowd of workers. All right, let me try this again. Tomorrow, small parts will join the Brotherhood. You'll pay your dues, and if you don't, I'm sure they'll find a place for you in food testing. The anger was rolling through Ty, hot and heavy. Jed Schultz thought he could walk in here and flex his muscles after years of ignoring them, thought that everyone would bend to his whim, just because he said so. Who did he think he was, a Hampton? The other workers said nothing. How were they not furious? She couldn't tell if they were afraid of losing their jobs or relieved by Jed's offer. What's wrong with you guys? She said. Ty, shut up. Martin hissed behind her. We don't really want the press, he added, loud enough for Jed to hear. Ty flinched. That's good to hear, son, said Jed. We're looking forward to tomorrow. He turned, the others on his tail, and made for the front of the line, where a somber Hayek gave him his choice of anything on the rotisserie. That arrogant prick, Ty growled. Martin glared at them before walking away. Shut up, Ty, said Colin quietly. He just threatened your jobs. He wouldn't look at her, and the sick feeling inside of her spilled over. Colin didn't have the money to buy the supplies Cherish needed. If he lost his job at small parts, she'd die even faster. Ty had done that to him. It was her fault. I'll get some green. Don't worry. Cherish, she'll be okay. Ty took a step forward. I swear I'll help out. You believe me, right? Back off, he said. Her chest tightened, the muscles wrapping tighter and tighter around her ribs, making it difficult to breathe. Colin! But he had already turned and was walking away. Chapter 18 Lena Lena paced across the study, awaiting her father. She expected him home any minute, and she intended to intercept him before Otto did. Her brother was the worst kind of bully. The way he'd treated Colin was intolerable. The sneer in his tone when he'd told him to bathe. The accusation that they'd been doing something inappropriate together. She'd covered for her brother enough. He'd gone too far, and it was time her father heard of it. She smoothed down her sweater hands pausing over her slim waist. As much as she hated Otto's methods, she found herself worried. Meeting with Colin alone had been a risk. She'd known that to begin with. She hadn't meant to confess the things she had, and she certainly hadn't expected him to speak so frankly now that he knew who she was. It should have been insulting. Her family employed him. He was from Metaltown, and she was a Hampton. 
Yet the only reason she'd gone to him in the first place was to prove to herself that she wasn't like the rest of her family. She thought of his scarf, hidden in the adjacent bedroom beneath her mattress. The front door opened. Lena's heels clacked against the hard wood as she jogged down the stairs toward the foyer. When she reached the bottom, her heart sank. There, beside her father, was her brother. Otto shrugged out of his jacket and placed it on the coat rack. Come to greet us at the door, Lena? How very sweet. She swallowed, ignoring him. Father, I... I'd like a drink, he told the maid. He didn't look at Lena as he swept into the parlor. What did you say? She hissed at Otto. Her brother's eyes twinkled. Who says I said anything? She tailed after Joseph, Otto gloating at her heels. In the parlor, the maid delivered a tumbler of corn whiskey to her employer and then quietly took her leave. Otto collapsed on one of the leather couches lining the room. The light was low, but did not hide the hard lines etched around her father's eyes. Joseph tossed back the first drink, then went behind the bar to serve himself another. What were you doing in Metaltown today? He asked without looking up. She slowly filled her lungs, summoning control. I went to speak to an employee regarding a girl I fired earlier in the week. A girl you what? Otto lurched up, shoes clapping against the tiled floor. You fired someone without running it by me? You didn't even notice, said Lena. I'm not interested in that, said her father. I'm interested in why you were outside the factory, alone, with the help. She didn't like the way he said help, as if Colin was no different from their maids or any of the other workers. I wasn't alone. Aja was there. And I've dealt with Aja. A beat passed, and Lena's mouth fell open. You let him go. Aja had been with the family for years. Could I have done any different? Her father came around the bar, a hint of flush showing on his neck. Aja did nothing wrong. I told him to take me to Metaltown. He works for me, not for you, Lena. Though apparently you can be quite persuasive. Her chin pulled inward. What is that supposed to mean? Her father came close, grabbing her chin harshly and lifting her face to his. Gone was the gentle reminiscence of the previous night when he'd talked about her as a baby. This was the man who'd held her bird, the only gift he'd given her, only to crush it in his fist. Father? Otto had risen and was standing several feet away. The concern in his voice frightened her. Otto should have been enjoying himself. Stay out of this, Joseph said evenly. If you had any self-respect, you would have managed this yourself. I didn't do anything. The tears burned Lena's eyes, but she blinked them back. I just want to speak to him. Don't lie to me. His level, emotionless tone made her insides tremble. Do you know what it looks like? You rolling around in the back of my car with one of them? She lifted her chin, forced herself to be still. It's not what you think. Otto, tell him. Otto said nothing. A sharp pain lit up her jaw as her father squeezed harder. His eyes were black and bottomless. She became unable to remain a statue. Scratching at his hands, she tried to pull him off, but her satin gloves slipped. An image of her nanny flashed through her mind, the only person in this cold house from whom she'd ever felt love. But looking into her father's stare, that love felt wrong, undeserved. He's a worker, Lena. Do you want to spend your days hunched over a sewing machine or stamping metal? You wouldn't last five minutes. He breathed in slowly, then out nostrils flaring. I think she understands, said Otto weakly. I didn't do anything wrong. Her voice cracked. You fraternized with an employee, said Joseph. You told me you wanted to learn the business. You wanted to take on responsibility. But all you wanted to do was play in Metaltown. You lied to me, Lena. 
I trusted you, and you made a mockery of our family. A great rage rose within her, like a tidal wave blocking out everything behind it. She shook herself free from his hold, his thumb and forefinger leaving aching points on either side of her jaw as her narrowed gaze burned up at him. I lied? I'm not the one selling weapons to the other side just to prolong this stupid war. I wonder how long ago the fighting might have stopped if not for your clever interference. A year ago? Longer? Tell me, father, do you leave the crates of artillery unattended on the supply trains, or do you have them delivered all the way to General Aquila's doorstep? His hand came down hard against the side of her face. So hard she felt her brain rattle, and her joints and muscles temporarily give out. She hit the ground on her hip, tumbling on her side, vision wavering, static in her ears. He'd hit her. He'd never hit her before. The shock gave way to fear and rage and disgust, creating a potent, suffocating mix in her lungs. Small gasps were all she could afford, but she closed her lips. Her hot, burning skin became a mask to hide the horror beneath. She willed steadiness, calm. Maybe it was stubborn, or maybe it was just her Hampton blood. Either way, she kneeled, smoothed down her skirt, and rose on shaking legs. Joseph's head had fallen forward. His hands rested on his hips. He looked exhausted. This life you love so much has a cost, he said, raising his chin. This house, these things. He held his arms wide, but they collapsed again at his sides. Without the war, we have nothing. A weak laugh slipped from her throat. These fine things were theirs because they'd funded the enemy. This house was built on the backs of workers who weren't even paid half the time. If this was what this life cost, she wanted none of it. We already have nothing, she said. Without looking back, she walked from the room, slowly as her legs were still unsteady. She climbed the stairs, entered her bedroom. With numb hands and a numb heart, she reached beneath her mattress for Colin's scarf, and within it, a doll, given to her long ago by the only person who'd ever really cared about her. Her eyes landed on the birdcage before the window. Empty now, since the maid had removed Lena's only friend. She went to gather some things and reached for a silver-backed hairbrush on her dresser. How much had that cost? A day's wages at one of her father's factories? A week's? Enough to send the girl she'd fired to the doctor, at least. And yet, it wasn't even one of her most prized possessions. If she lost it, she'd just get another. She left it where it was. She needed to get out. Out of this cold house. She'd crossed a line downstairs, told the truth, and been punished accordingly. This family didn't honor honesty. Northern Federation soldiers were dying at the hands of well-armed advocates, just so she could wear nice clothes and eat clean food. Everything she touched felt tainted. She'd never been less hungry. She wanted to give everything she owned away. Her feet carried her down the stairs to the door where her coat hung. She grabbed it and calmly walked outside into the freezing black night. No one chased her. No one called for her. She didn't expect them to. She found the carriage house and the car in the garage. The keys were hanging on a rack on the wall, and with shaking hands she took them and pressed the button to open the door. She'd never driven before, but it couldn't be that difficult. She'd seen Aja do it enough. Scan the key. Start the ignition. When the car began to roll back, she tested her foot on the brake, yelping when the vehicle jolted to a stop. Setting her grip on the wheel, she eased off the pedal this time, backing down into the circle and pressing the button that said drive. The steering was sensitive, and the car jerked each time she shivered. Away, she thought. Anywhere but here. Some of the streets were familiar, others not. Squinting into the black, she drove on, never slowing, never stopping. There were no cars on the road this late anyway. Soon, she recognized the beltway that led to Metaltown. The factory, she thought. She could go to the factory. It might be open. Panic chipped through the numb shell encasing her heart. If it wasn't open, 
She didn't know where she would go. She didn't even have her nanny's address anymore. Not that it was right anyway. No, she would just keep going. Keep going until the Tri-City was so far behind her, she couldn't even remember what it looked like. She would be fine on her own. She was strong. She would be strong. Anywhere was better than her own house. A figure in the road caught her attention, and she slammed on the brakes, swerving across the empty lanes. She was thrown into the side window, spun and spun until her stomach was in her throat, and she was sick with dizziness. The rear of the car hit the median with a metallic crunch. The back window shattered, sending a blast of cold air into the compartment. And then everything went still. She was shaking, every part of her. She couldn't breathe. She couldn't think. Someone came running at the window. Through the thin glass, she heard footsteps. Terrified, she searched for something she might use to defend herself. She hadn't brought a diffuser. She didn't have anything. Glass, she thought. She was just reaching over the seat to grab a shard of broken window when the driver's door was yanked open. A startled cry burst from her throat. Lena? She spun toward the familiar voice. In the moonlight, she could see his face, the shadows on his jaw, the surprise in his eyes. The thin scar cutting through one eyebrow. For a fraction of a moment, she wondered what he was doing there, and then realized she didn't care. Her hands covered her face, and she screamed silently, rocking back and forth, yielding to the twisting inside of her. Are you hurt? he asked. She felt his hand on her back, sliding down to her hip then another on her ankles, moving them from the floorboards. She couldn't catch her breath, couldn't find her Hampton mask to hide beneath. Every jagged, raw emotion spilled from her uncontained, and trying to collect the pieces just made her feel more fractured. Okay, she heard him say, voice soft. Come on. He slipped one arm under her knees and the other behind her back. She felt her body shift beyond her control, and then her cheek was against his shoulder, and he was lifting her to the front of the car. He sat her on the hood, where she curled into a ball, knees against her chest, hands gripping her shins. The cold air wedged itself between them, and when she looked up, she saw he was standing a few paces back, arms crossed over his chest. Her whole body was quaking so hard he seemed to vibrate, but she couldn't stop it. What are you doing here? She forced herself to breathe, the shuddered breath ice cold in her throat. Dodging cars, he said with a frown. Makes it harder when they don't use their headlights. She knew she'd missed something. I've never driven before, she said. You don't say. She realized how insane she must have appeared. It disgusted her, how little pride she had. She fixed her gloves and slid down the front of the hood to stand. As if he'd been waiting for this, he shot forward, gripping her elbows. You should sit a while. You're shaking. The flush crept up her cheeks. Gradually, he released her arms, and she found he was right. She nearly tipped over. He didn't reach for her again. He stayed where he was, pulling his coat tighter across his chest. What are you doing here? He asked. It's not been the best day. She glanced up at him. He pulled off his hat and scratched his head, then replaced it. No, it hasn't. She wrapped her arms around her chest, shivering, though now from the cold. She probably looked ridiculous, blotchy cheeks and smeared makeup, but she didn't care. He didn't seem to either. He held something out to her, and when she stepped closer, she could see that it was his scarf. He gave her a small smile, and she hesitated before taking it unsure if she should put it on. Thanks. Again, she said, laughing once awkwardly, and then wincing because she sounded so stupid. The doll within fell to the pavement, but before she could reach it, Colin had stooped beside her. Bent low, with the shards of glass reflecting the moon like diamonds, they found themselves face to face. His gaze caught hers, deep and steady, and though her breathing slowed, her heart beat harder. Where did you get this? He asked. Oh. She remembered herself then and grabbed the rope toy, tucking it into her coat pocket. 
My, um, nanny made it for me when I was little. Ah. No witty remark? She huffed. No comment about the poor little rich girl and her nanny? I guess I'm fresh out. His lips straightened as if he were trying not to smile. Stick around, though, and I'm sure I can come up with something. A laugh bubbled up, sealing the ache beneath her collarbone. Less than an hour ago, her father had struck her, and here was this metal town boy who didn't even know her trying to make her feel better. She looked back at the small, wrecked car. The tire that was pressed against the medium had popped. The rim rested directly on the ground. She couldn't even run away without making a mess of things. He cleared his throat. Your family's probably wondering where you are, he said. I can take you somewhere to call them. Doesn't look like you're going anywhere in this. He kicked the deflated tire. I can't go back, she whispered. The truth settled over both of them, cruel and cold as the metal town night. He stepped closer, making her heart trip in her chest. Come with me, then. I... She frowned. Could she go with him? What would her father say about that? Realizing it didn't matter, that she didn't care, she made her decision. Okay. It's a walk, he said. Sure you can handle it in your poor little rich girl shoes? She smiled down at them. I think I can manage. Chapter 19 Colin By the time they had reached the end of the beltway, Colin had herded Lena to the opposite side of the street. Every step he had taken closer to her, she'd moved subtly away, like the wrong end of a magnet. The game amused him, though he doubted she even knew they were playing. Stealing a glance in her direction, he found her chin buried in his scarf and her gloved hands deep in her coat pockets. She'd stopped trying to fix her hair, and it hung loosely over her shoulders and back. Not that anyone cared, but he thought it looked better that way. He didn't ask what had made her run away, but the bruise still forming on her jaw gave him a good idea. Thinking about someone laying a hand on her burned him up. Surprised him a little, too. He wasn't sure when he'd started thinking that the Hamptons were all on the same side. It was possible he'd never considered they weren't. The fog from the chem plant may have muddied the shape of the moon, but it brought up the temperature and took the edge off the chill. Fifty feet below them, a single train began to chug down the tracks. It was striped head to toe with green graffiti, the mark of McNulty's gang. The heavy sigh of the engine filled the night. It's late for a train, isn't it? She asked quietly. She had paused by the edge of the sidewalk and leaned over the railing, gazing down on the parallel tracks below. He thought of all the times he and Ty had come here, wishing they were someplace else. Ty would kick his ass all the way across the bridge if she knew what he was doing now. She'd be right, too. Lena Hampton's business was not his business. He needed to stay out of it. And first thing tomorrow, he would. Supply cars, he said, moving beside her. When she didn't scoot away, he inched closer. Probably taking weapons to the front lines. The fighting's getting worse, I heard. When she stiffened, he stifled a groan. Stupid, bringing that up. She probably didn't want to talk about her family's business right now. She'd taken off in the middle of the night for a reason, after all. How did you hear that? She side-eyed him from above his scrunched scarf. Longer hours means a big order's coming through. Big orders of weapons usually mean more fighting. Oh. Her gaze locked on the trains again, so intently that he wondered if she knew more about the war than what had come through the factory line. Is there more fighting? Last I heard, the North was winning, he snorted. I mean, we have to, right? We've got the best weapons. Word on the line was that the North was getting closer to pushing the Southern lines back, that soon the Eastern Fed would surrender and the advocates would disband, but then they'd get more orders. It seemed the war would never end. Lena gave a bitter laugh and sort of crumpled in on herself. Do you even know why we're fighting? 
Her words may have been snobby, but her voice was heavy, sad. Colin thought back to the lessons he'd learned in school in Bakerstown. They'd watched movies about it, Eastern soldiers in their black and red uniforms raiding houses, taking anything they wanted. People in jails crying for the northern feds' help. Hungry people waiting in lines for cornbread, which was probably contaminated anyway. It had been shocking, until he'd moved to Metaltown and seen the same thing. Because they're the enemy, he said, chewing his chapped bottom lip. That's what people always said, anyway. They're the enemy, she said. How do we know we're not the enemy? What if we're the ones who are wrong? He supposed there were two sides to every story. Still, he couldn't figure her out. She should have wanted this war. Her family was getting rich on it. Maybe you should join the advocates, he said, then held up his hands when she spun toward him. Just a joke, he added. Slowly, she turned back. No one wins, she said. And it made him think of small parts and tie and even the advocates facing up against the whole Northern Federation, how none of them ever seemed to get ahead, no matter how hard they tried. I know, he said. That's why I'm getting out of here. She turned to face him. You are? Sure, he said. There's this place on the coast, Rosie's Bay. You heard of it? She shook her head. Our coastline is prohibited. The oil spills ruined it. Not all of it, he said. Rosie's is way up north. There's sand there and fishing boats and these little houses. They're on stilts because the tide goes in and out underneath them. That sounds nice. There was a smile in her voice. Yeah. Soon as I finish up some stuff here, I'm heading out. Oh. He thought she might have sounded a little disappointed, but he probably made it up. She ran her hands up and down her arms, and he thought of how she'd trembled when he'd pulled her from the car. Part of him hadn't wanted to let her go, but the bigger part remembered what she was capable of. She was a roaming disaster. She'd almost run him over to prove it. He pushed his hands deeper into his pockets. Is that what you were doing walking to Bakerstown in the middle of the night? Finishing up some stuff? Her voice had taken on a sharp edge. He couldn't bring himself to tell her that he'd tried to get the workers to make a stand against her company, or that Jed Schultz was a common criminal, no better than McNulty over in Bakerstown, or that he couldn't go home because he wasn't ready to face his ma and explain to her how he and Ty had gotten her kicked out of the Brotherhood. He never wanted to make things harder on her, but that was all he seemed to do. He leaned back against the railing. Lena still refused to look at him. You caught me, he said. I was on my way to rob the cat's tail. The bar right beside Gabe Wachowski's house. He picked out a loose thread on his coat sleeve. Her eyes darted to his. You're kidding. Of course I'm kidding, he said. Cat's tail has security guards. I was going to hit up the liquor store across the street. She laughed and then covered her lips with her hand. Before he thought about what he was doing, he reached for her wrist, drawing her hand gently away from her face. He'd never met a person who tried so hard to stuff their own happiness back down their throat. She tracked the motion of his arm, caution pinching the corners of her eyes. It's all right. He didn't know why he said that or why he'd touched her again. Whatever was happening here, it was definitely not all right. His hands returned to his pockets where they belonged. She chewed her bottom lip. He stared at her mouth. I suppose it's easier to be a thief if you're charming. She stared at the ground between them. Am I charming? He leaned closer. Her lips quirked up, then down. Then suddenly she backed away, chin jutting toward him. You're after money. That's why you helped me back there. I didn't bring any, okay? I'm not after your money, he said, a little irritated that she'd brought it up. He knew if he pursued, she'd bolt, so he stayed where he was. Did she think money was all he wanted? What did he want? 
It had already occurred to him how reckless it was to be alone with her. Ty was right. Lena could say anything she wanted about what had happened here. That he'd attacked her, robbed her, worse. If she did, he'd be dead before dark tomorrow. How could I be so blind? She glanced back at the car, across the beltway. Lena, I don't want your money, he repeated. You crashed your car. I didn't even know it was you. And once you found out it was, it didn't even cross your mind you might get a reward? It might have crossed his mind. I just wanted to make sure you were okay. Not everyone thinks in terms of payout. Her hip cocked to the side. She crossed her arms over her chest. They do where I'm from. Well, I guess you left for a reason, didn't you? He felt like an ass when her eyes glassed over with tears. Lena, I... He took slow steps toward her. Look over there. He pointed across the beltway toward Bakerstown. The lights in the center of the city still twinkled. I used to live out there. My brother and I went to school and came home and did homework and hung out with our friends. We ate dinner together at night like a family. And then Cherish got sick, and my brother and I had to work. We couldn't afford our place anymore, so we moved out to Metaltown. Sometimes I come out here and look across the bridge and just wish. I don't know. I just think about those times, okay? That's what I was doing tonight. Just walking and thinking. He swallowed a breath. He hadn't told anyone that. Not even Ty. She studied him for a long time. He would have cut off his own finger to read her mind. It's not always better over there, she said finally. He glanced over. From this side, he could see the bruise on her cheek more clearly. I hope you hit him back. Her posture went more rigid, if that was possible. Hit who back? Right. Pretend nothing happened. She was just like Ty when she'd lost a fight. Here. Face me. He turned her, feeling her tense beneath his hands. Gloves off. No. She clasped her hands behind her back. His brows lifted. Okay. Gloves on. No problem. Lift your hands up like this. He showed her how to guard her face, and slowly she mimicked his stance. Elbows in. Stagger your feet. There you go. She was a quick study. Now swing. What? She dropped her arms. I'm not going to hit you. I know. He smirked. You couldn't if you tried. Her eyes narrowed. She lifted her hands back up and swung, nearly tipping over. He caught her around the waist and righted her. Told you. She swung again. Thumbs in, he cued, dodging to the side. Follow through with your shoulder. She bounced a little, trying to copy him. Cute. Come on, he said. I know three-year-olds that can scrap better than you. She swung again, dropping her guard hand, and he reached in and tapped her once on the nose. Got you. Her eyes narrowed and her nostrils flared. She locked her jaw, and the growl that came from her throat nearly made him laugh out loud. But she jumped at him with a burst of speed and kneed him hard, right between the legs. For thirty seconds there was nothing but pain. The worst kind. The kind that made you wish you'd never been born. When he opened his eyes, he was on his knees and elbows, trying not to puke. I got you, she said. He winced. You got me. As they entered the heart of Metaltown, he made her walk close. He kept to the more heavily traveled streets, but hugged the shadows, not wanting anyone to see the way she was dressed. Mostly just junkies were out now, trying to scrounge up a way to stay warm. They weren't generally trouble. I'm going to put my arm around you, he said. She missed a step. Why? So people know you're with me. She stared at him, but before he could explain that she didn't exactly blend in, she nodded. He liked the way her small body fit against his. She smelled like vanilla, sharp and sweet. 
He rubbed one hand up and down her bicep, feeling her withdraw just slightly from his touch, then settle into him. She did a good job keeping up and didn't once complain about the heels on those shoes she wore. Maybe she was less fragile than he thought. It's rude to stare, you know, she said without looking up at him. Not where I'm from, he said. Take it as a compliment. He was careful not to be so obvious after that. They came to Market Alley and Colin walked faster, refusing to look at Jed's office in the back. The Brotherhood would absorb small parts tomorrow. It should have made him happy, but it didn't. It stuck in his jaw like sour candy. Jed was a bastard and a liar. He wasn't one of them. He may have come from the streets, but he didn't honor the code of it. He wondered again who had ratted them out. They rounded the corner between the two brick buildings. The doors to the basement apartment were down a few steps, and metal fire escapes rose above on both sides. Look familiar? he asked her. She glanced around, relaxing a little when she saw the way was empty. This is where we met. Is this where you live? He scratched his head. Not exactly. Part of him wanted to bring her home, but it probably would have run her off. Shima's place was nicer than his, less crowded, cleaner, more what Lena was used to. Who was he kidding? Nothing here was even close to what she was used to. I'm not staying with you? I mean, I didn't mean to assume... She wriggled. You can let go of me now. She wanted him to stay. This is the safest place I know, he said. He didn't want to let her slide away. Soon she'd realize he was trouble, that Jed was after him, and that he'd tried to get the others to stand against small parts... There'd be no more backseat chats then, no more talks on the beltway, no more forgetting, just for a little while, the heavy weight of Metal Town. He knocked once on the door before he said something stupid. Wait, before we go in, I need to tell you something, she said, fidgeting from side to side. Something bad. And things were going so well. He took a deep breath, bracing for what was to come. My father was angry that I met with you this afternoon. Otto told him, and... He assumed things had happened that certainly had not happened. Colin tilted his head. What kind of things? Things, you know. She circled her hands. Anyway, I... I think Otto might try to take it out on you. He'd like to see him try. Still, a knot tied in his gut... I can handle myself. He might fire you, she said in a small voice. I tried to tell them the truth, that I called on you and that you didn't do anything wrong, but they wouldn't listen. I'm so sorry. He thought about small parts, about Jed Schultz and Minnick, about Ty and how no one else would stand up for her. I'm probably going to get fired anyway, he said. Her chin shot up. You shouldn't go back. It's not safe. You're worried about me. I am not, she said, frowning. Don't be silly. Slowly, gently, he touched her face, pressing his cool skin against the heated patch below her eye. Was that why she'd been hurt? Because of him? No one but Ty had stuck their neck out for him before. I don't have much of a choice. If he didn't go to work, Otto and Lena's father would use it as proof that Colin was hiding something. Were they right? He'd broken the rules the second he'd offered to bring her here. Anyone in their right mind would have taken her straight home. Her eyes were so bright when she was angry, and her cheek was even softer than he thought it would be. He moved closer, feeling the warmth of her, hearing her breath catch. Her lips parted. The door behind him swung out, and Shima blinked at him. For God's sake, Colin, it's the middle of the night. She pulled her shawl closer around her shoulders. If it's Hayden again, I swear I'll beat that boy myself. Lena stepped out from behind Colin, her mouth open in surprise. Shima? Chapter 5 
Chapter 20 Ty Colin hadn't gone home. Ty waited outside his place for an hour before heading to Lacey's, but no one there had seen him either. She felt sick over what had happened. She'd known Jed was trouble from the beginning, but Colin hadn't believed her. Now he was on the warpath, stopping payments to Colin's mother, forcing the workers at small parts to join the Brotherhood. He was more dangerous than she'd ever imagined. Her stomach clenched again. She'd known he was trouble, and she'd mouthed off to him anyway. In public, no less. Now Colin's family was going to pay for it. Not if she could help it. She was going back to Jed Schultz. She was going to do whatever it took to make things right. He wanted her to apologize? Fine. She'd eat crow. She didn't have to believe it. She walked fast back toward Market Alley, pausing when she saw a man coming up from Factory Row. He was broad in the shoulders and looked to be sober from his even gait, which meant he'd be harder to beat in a fight. With her eyes, she couldn't chance the trouble. Ducking into the shadows, she held her breath and waited as he approached from across the street. Something moved behind her. A scuffle on the sidewalk brought the knife from her belt to her hand. She stayed low, peering into the darkness. A bottle rolled across the hard ground. Maybe it was a cat on the prowl. It was hard to tell with half her vision. Whatever it was moved closer. One in front, one behind. A quick glance up the road revealed that the man was still far enough away not to have seen her. Run or hide, she had to choose fast. Making her decision, she charged the shadows behind her, heart in her throat, hoping to catch whatever tailed her by surprise. She collided with a boy almost half her size and pinned him to the ground. Get off! He squeaked, reeking of garbage. Chip? Of course it's Chip. What are you doing out here? Ty rolled off to the side, pulling him into a sunken doorway. Shh. I looked for you at Beggar Square, but you never came. He wiggled in her grasp. Shut up. He finally went still. The man up the street slowed and Ty could make out his white chem plant uniform pants below his coat. He passed the stamping mill, pausing to gaze in their direction. A moment later, he continued on, disappearing around the corner of the building toward the Brotherhood office. Who is that? Chip whispered. Hayden, whispered Ty. Why was Colin's brother coming to see Jed this late? She knew Hayden had gotten into business with him. That's why she and Colin had gone to Bakerstown in the first place. Despite the knowing, his presence here, now, didn't sit well with her. Go back to the board and care, she told Chip. No, he said stubbornly. I got your back. The reference to his pledge to street code pulled at something deep in her chest. Chip, you're tracking that guy, huh? Why are you following him? Is he going to the Brotherhood? She shook her head. I don't have time for this. Stay back here. She kept low and ran across the street, staying beyond the stretch of the yellow street lights. She inched around the corner, but the way was clear. The carts from the day were absent. The door to the Brotherhood was wide open, the lights within burning. Curiosity taking over, she tiptoed closer, catching laughter from within and footsteps from behind. Go, she mouthed to the kid. He mocked her and continued on, holding an old rusty fork in one hand like a shank. Half of her meant to turn back. If Chip had her back, she had his, and this put him in danger. She should have taken him to the board and care and dumped his skinny ass in the kid's room, but she remembered her last time there and wondered if he wasn't safer by her side. Giving up, she crept forward, honing in on the voices. Holding her breath, she looked around the corner. Three jackets hung on a standing rack in the hallway. Cigarette smoke gathered at the ceiling. Against all good judgment, she snuck inside. What's wrong, boy? Run yourself dry already? Jed asked. What do you have for me tonight? Nothing. Ty's hand closed around her knife at the sound of Hayden's voice. 
Oh, come on. You know that's not how it works. Is your brother planning to organize or not? He's not doing anything. That's not what you said last night. I was wrong last night. Listen, Jed. Mr. Schultz, corrected Jed. Hayden cleared his throat. Mr. Schultz, whatever you've got going on with small parts, Colin's got nothing to do with it. I was off last night. I wasn't thinking clear. And you are now. Is that right? There was a pause, and then a crack as something hit the wall. We can't have a charter organized at small parts. Do you understand? Jed's voice was low, menacing. I understand, choked Hayden. Ty was torn. Colin's brother was being roughed up, and he would have counted on her to step in. But if Hayden was the leak, she couldn't possibly help him. He'd ratted them out. He'd put Colin in danger. Her loyalty was to Colin, always. I'm not certain you do, said Jed. Those kids build parts of bombs. The steel mill builds parts of the same bombs. The chem plant, where you work? Guess where that nitro goes. Into a bomb, sir. The same bomb. Jed told him. Every factory in Metaltown works together to make one product. So do you know what will happen if those kids refuse to work? Every other factory in town will have to stop production until we find replacements. This town will shut down. Hell, I might as well gift wrap it for McNulty. Another crack, and she could hear Hayden's groan and labored breaths. So they'll all join the Brotherhood, he gasped. They get what they want. You get their dues. Everyone's happy. This is what happens when you take too much nitro, boys, said Jed. A few other disembodied voices chuckled at the joke. Nobody's happy unless Hampton's happy, and Hampton's not interested in giving kids rights. He's interested in profit. But he supports the Brotherhood everywhere else. Wrong, said Jed. He supports me. You think a rich mug like Hampton couldn't shell out double for every one of those workers? But he doesn't have to, because I make sure his workers think they've got as good as it gets. He pays me good money to keep them quiet. Whatever it takes. Ty's brows scrunched together. Jed Schultz was taking bribes from the Hamptons? That didn't make sense. He was supposed to be on the side of the workers, a representative of the people, not the other way around. But he was a greasy liar. She'd known that from the moment she'd first laid eyes on him. He was taking money from both sides, dues from the workers and payments from the boss to stay in his employees' good graces. He'd been keeping Colin's family quiet with green to buy new clothes and clean water. Gifts, so they never questioned his loyalty. She remembered the fear in that Bakerstown man's face when she and Colin had run Jed's errand. What had happened to them for refusing the money? And you're going to stay quiet, too, aren't you, Hayden? Continued Jed after another crack against the wall. Yes, sir. Of course, sir. Because you know what happens to your little brother if you don't. Ty jerked, then froze when Chip pulled down hard on her arm. She glanced his way for the first time, seeing that he'd emptied the coat pockets from the rack and held three wallets in his little hands. Swearing under her breath, she grabbed one, ripped it open, and lifted the bills. He followed her lead, replacing the wallets back in the pockets. She'd heard enough. She had to find Colin fast. Before Hayden was turned out, she'd stuffed the green in her coat, grabbed Chip's collar, and pulled him outside. They didn't stop running until they hit St. Mary's. Chapter 21 Lena Lena sat on the edge of a sagging couch, tapping her heels. Her eyes fixed on the peeling wallpaper opposite her and the brown water stain that ran from the ceiling to the floor. The room was small, much like the entryway at her estate, but with two couches crammed within and a patchwork quilt tossed across the floor. Two children were sprawled out in the middle of it, one no more than a few months, 
the other a toddler. Both were fast asleep. It made sense that Shima still watched children. She'd been Lena's nanny for as long as she could remember. But for some reason, seeing these children made her insides prickle. It felt like she and Otto had been replaced somehow. Shima came out of her bedroom with a steaming mug. She changed from her nightclothes into a shabby black dress and combed her hair. Lena hadn't meant to intrude. She'd never felt that way with Shima before. It's just hot water, said Shima tentatively. I know you like steamed milk before bed, at least you used to, but I'm fresh out. Lena doubted she was fresh out. By the looks of this place, she didn't even have an ice box. Lena shifted, the borrowed clothes rough against her skin. Shima had made her change when she'd begun picking shards of glass out of her sweater. Thank you, whispered Lena, afraid of waking the children. Her old nanny sat beside her a few feet away and passed over the mug. Her gaze lingered on Lena's dirty black gloves. Are your hands still... They're fine, said Lena quickly. They're just cold, that's all. Shima jumped up and returned with a knit quilt. She mimed wrapping it around Lena's shoulders, and Lena nodded, unable to sit back and relax. For the last hour, they'd teeter on the edge of formality, neither sure how to begin. The last time they'd seen each other had been one of the worst days of Lena's life. That was until today. A car wreck. Shima shook her head. I can't believe your father let you drive alone. Thank goodness Colin was there. Yes. Thank goodness Colin had not disagreed when Lena had said she'd simply been out for a drive. Shima slowly reached for her cheek, brushing her thumb along the bruise. Her look was not that of concern, but pity, and Lena suspected she knew the mark had not been caused by any accident. You're so lovely, Shima said. More lovely than I remember, and I thought that was impossible. That was all it took for Lena to unravel. She hiccuped a sob, the tears gathering in her tired eyes and spilling down her cheeks. Oh, Lena. Shima wrapped her arms around her, and for a moment, Lena was a child. Otto had just bullied her, but it was all right. It was all okay now because Shima was here and she would fix it. She didn't need to explain what had happened. With Shima, she never would. She buried her face against the woman's neck and cried until all the tears were gone, and even then she didn't pull back. She stayed in her arms and found comfort in her soft hum and the gentle stroking of her hair. Why don't you rest? Shima said after a long while. It's late, and you've had quite a day. First thing tomorrow, we'll get you back home safe and sound. Lena pulled away, feeling the cold air brush her cheek. I'm not going back. She hadn't known it was true until that moment. Shima's golden eyes, the eyes Lena had always trusted, grew wide. Lena, you have to go back. I can't. Lena felt her throat closing. She sipped the hot water and it burned her tongue. Maybe I could stay here with you? Just for a little while. If it's all right, I mean. Shima scooted closer, the crow's feet around her eyes even more pronounced. She hadn't had those before, nor had she ever been so thin. Your father must be so worried. He isn't. Trust me. Shima's thumb pressed against her temple, something she used to do when Otto had pushed her too far. Your father can be hard-headed. She chose the word carefully. But he's your father. Which meant what exactly? That it was okay that he was a traitor? That it was fine for him to strike her? Even if Shima didn't know the details of what had brought them back together, Lena didn't like what she implied. Just because he was her father didn't mean he could do whatever he liked without consequence. If he'd taught her anything, he'd taught her that. She stood up, looking for somewhere to place the mug. She never should have come. Colin had been trying to get rid of her, and while Shima's care may have been comforting once, it was not any more. I should go. Where, she had no idea. She'd run out of options. She hadn't had many to start with. Shima stood, reaching out and taking her hands. Stay. 
We'll talk about this in the morning, okay? Just rest now. We'll figure it all out. Her grip was gentle, thumbs moving over Lena's wrists. Her smile was soft and sincere. Lena was exhausted, and despite her pride, Shima was right. She needed rest to form a plan. Slowly she sat, then curled into a ball on the thin cushion. She rested her head on the hard arm of the couch and let Shima pull the blanket down beneath her feet. It'll be all right, Shima said. When Lena's eyes were closed, she went to her bedroom, leaving the door cracked. Lena could hear the whine of the mattress as she sat upon it, but though she listened, she never heard the blankets move or the rustle of sheets as Shima lay down. Tired as she was, it was a long time before she finally fell asleep. In the morning, Shima made porridge that was so bland Lena could barely swallow it. She wondered what her father and brother were eating. Omelets made from eggs imported from their farmlands outside the city. Grapefruit and freshly squeezed juice, all tested by a servant to ensure their safety. The three of them would sit at the table, each consumed by their electronic readers, waiting for the cook staff to clear their settings. She wondered what Darcy would think when she didn't show up for tutoring. She'd probably be relieved. Instead, Lena was surrounded by children. Two more came in the early hours of morning, jumping and screaming as if they'd woken that way. One boy pulled another girl's hair, and Shima made him sit in the corner. A little girl played with a rope doll. The same doll Lena had in her coat pocket, folded neatly in the corner. The same doll she refused to take out. Just after breakfast, a knock came at the door. Shima made her way there, a child attached to one leg. She squeezed Lena's shoulder as she walked by, but it settled her stomach only a little. The long night was over, and the morning had brought even deeper uncertainty. She didn't know where she would sleep tonight, but it wouldn't be here. This house was too full. She was in the way. Besides, if her father knew she'd come here, to a woman he'd dismissed from his service, Shima would be in trouble. Lena didn't know what he'd do, but after their fight yesterday, he seemed capable of anything. It was better if she didn't linger. Miss me, Shima? Colin came in like he owned the place and was immediately attacked by one of the children, a boy named Ben, if she remembered correctly. Colin kissed Shima on the cheek and hoisted a giggling Ben over one shoulder. Oh, because it's been so long. Shima rolled her eyes. You want some breakfast? Sure. Colin tossed Ben down on the couch and grinned at Lena. Her heart stuttered, remembering last night too clearly. Everything from the way he'd taught her to throw a punch to how his fingertips had brushed her cheek outside Shima's door, before she reminded herself it was just a smile. It didn't mean anything. It shouldn't have meant anything anyway, because she had about a hundred bigger things to worry about today, including finding food and a place to sleep tonight. He placed himself in her line of vision, refusing to let her avoid his gaze, and she remembered other things too, like how her father had accused her of rolling around in the back of his car. Though he'd been wrong, and though she didn't want to care what he thought, she still placed the folded blanket on her lap as a barrier. How you holding up? he asked. Fine, she said. And you? Never better. Shima handed him a bowl, and Lena couldn't hide the cringe when he stuffed a big, heaping spoonful of gruel in his mouth. She lowered her voice. Have you thought more about what I said last night? He leaned down conspiratorially, eyes flicking from side to side. The part where you called me charming? The part where I told you to stay clear of the factory. He took another bite. Right, that part. I thought about it. She waited expectantly while he took another bite. Could he be serious about nothing? I'm still going, he said finally. You need to reconsider. You're cute when you're worked up. You know that? He was messing around again. Still, Lena fixed her hair, wishing she had a comb. Colin? warned Shima from across the room. She was eyeing him like any of the other children who'd broken the rules. Colin tapped the spoon against his bowl. 
There's some stuff going on today. Something I need to do. A shadow of doubt passed over his face. What's going on? She hadn't heard Otto mention anything new happening at the factory. Not that he would, anyway. He didn't meet her gaze. Nothing you need to worry about. She planted her fists on her hips. No? And why is that? Because it involves the workers. I see, she said. And do you think I wouldn't understand because I'm not a worker? I think you got a different factory tour than the rest of us. Her chin lifted. Mr. Minnick showed me everything. He laughed, bringing a flood of heat up her neck. Aren't you always on your best behavior when the boss is around? She wouldn't know. She'd never had a job before. Not before she began researching a role in Hampton Industries, anyway. But she knew the way she acted when her father was in the room was vastly different than the way she was with Darcy. And if this was what Colin meant, she had a keen desire to see the differences for herself. What exactly goes on when I'm not there? She asked. Believe me, he said. You don't want to know. Her curiosity deepened, along with the lines between her brows. Is there trouble at the factory with the workers? Is that what you mean? Trouble with... Your salaries, perhaps? She visualized the forms she'd seen in her study, the discrepancies in pay. In her mind, she cursed Otto again. He took another bite, swallowed. Is the management doing something they shouldn't? His head tilted slightly. Now, why would you say that? It was her father's factory, one she'd wanted to run one day. She knew he was making terrible, dangerous decisions when it came to sales, but had thought that Otto's neglect was the extent of the problems on site. But Colin was alluding to more issues, maybe even larger than what she'd already discovered, and though part of her knew it was unwise to probe after how she'd left things in the River District, she felt a burden of responsibility to know just how bad things were. I'm going with you she said, placing her back to Shima. Any amusement in Colin's face faded. Now that is a really bad idea. Why? It's my factory. Exactly. He lowered his voice. What do you think your father will do if he sees me bring you in? He never goes there, and Otto won't even be awake for another two hours. Besides, I'll be going in with you, as a worker. As a worker, he repeated, dumbstruck. You want to work at small parts? I want to see what you see. She put her hands on her hips. You don't think I can handle it? You wouldn't last five minutes, her father had said. Um, Colin tapped his spoon against the bowl again. I don't think I said that. Well, lucky for me, it doesn't matter. I don't need your permission. It irritated her that he thought she couldn't do what he did. She might not have lived in Metaltown, but the River District wasn't exactly the safest place either. You should stay here. His voice was harder without the sarcasm. Lena's going home today, said Shima, approaching them. Her blood began to run hot. I am not going home, and I'm not staying here. I am perfectly capable of making my own decisions. Colin and Shima looked to each other for support. I'm going with you, Lena said. That's final. She followed him through the employee entrance and into a dingy locker room that smelled strongly of body odor. The place was crowded, and people kept bumping into her without any awareness of personal space. A few of them said hello to Colin, a dark-skinned boy about her age that he called Zeke, and a little kid who said someone named Ty was looking for him. Colin kept chewing his pinky nail, something she realized he only did when he was nervous. It made her realize how truly dangerous this could be for him. In all her life, she'd never considered that she might be more dangerous to a boy from Metaltown than he was to her. He stripped down to the thermal he wore on the floor, and when he lifted his arms over his head, the hem of his shirt rose, revealing a pale, smooth belt of skin. 
Even after it was gone, the image still lingered inside of her. Though it was warm, she refused to take off her borrowed sweater, as if she had been the one exposed. Stay close to me, he said between his teeth. Follow me when I clock in. She kept on his heels, heart pounding as she passed the check-in station. Her eyes stayed down as she made it through the metal detector. A thrill filled her. She'd never imagined in a million years that she'd be sneaking into her own factory. Now she could see exactly what it was like to work under Otto's rule, and he wouldn't be able to deny it later. If she saw him later. She still hadn't figured out where she would go next. When she left the house, she'd left all her belongings. She didn't have money to go to a hotel or rent an apartment or hire a car. She didn't even have money for food. Surely she couldn't live and work in Metaltown. Her stomach sunk at the thought. Unless she went home to face her father, she didn't have much of a choice. The line moved forward, and soon they'd reached the foreman. She'd braided her hair back and wasn't wearing any makeup, but even so, her pulse spiked when the foreman snagged her wrist. She looked down at his hand, fighting the urge to shake him off. Who are you? he asked. She slipped free, hung her head. Mary, sir, she said, coming up quickly with the name. From the uniform factory. Uniform factory? The foreman mocked, making her wish she'd set another division. You blind? This is small parts. Colin stopped in his tracks and sent a wary glance over his shoulder. They sent me as an extra, she said quickly, keeping her eyes down. They said you needed more hands on the line because there was more work coming through. The story fell from her lips as if it were practiced, but she wasn't even sure she was using the terms correctly. Still, she knew how to play a role under pressure. She'd entertained her father's party guests, after all, and they were some of the most dangerous men in the whole country. A sub, you mean? Colin suggested, glaring over his shoulder. They send you to sub in for someone? Call it what you like, she tossed back. I just do what I'm told. Minnick's face had seemed stuck in a frown, but at this, the lines around his mouth and eyes relaxed. You're damn right you do. Hear that, rats? Mary here is gonna do what she's told, just like the rest of you. There were some mutters ahead, but no one looked back. The foreman pulled up his pants, but his belt buckle disappeared below his paunch as soon as he released them. Haven't hired a replacement for fuses. You work hard today, I might consider keeping you on, if you make your quota. Understand? No messing around. I don't know how they do it at the uniform division, but here, you don't pull your weight, we say goodbye. Understood, sir. I won't mess around, sir. Thank you. He grinned, revealing yellow, crooked teeth. He snapped his fingers at Colin. You show her how it's done. She falls behind, it's on you, got it? Come on. Colin grumbled, motioning for her to follow. The main room opened up to the floor. The machines were already loud and cranking. She remembered the volume from her last time here, and it was already warm. As they went down the stairs, it occurred to her that she'd made a huge mistake. She didn't belong here. She wasn't trained. She'd never worked a day of labor in her life. But when she thought of home and the things her father and brother had done, she thought maybe she didn't belong there either. Colin motioned her to the station where she'd seen him before. Wincing at the memory of firing the girl, she ducked under the belt and took a place beside him. Opposite a big boy, Colin called Henry. Mary, Lena said, introducing herself. I'm a sub from the uniform division. Colin quirked a brow, impressed. They all look as good as you over there? Henry asked. Lena's mouth fell open. Colin chuckled. What? Henry grinned. Just asking. Shouldn't you be getting back to plastics? Colin asked him. He smiled again at Lena. I will, soon as the boss tells me to, and not a moment sooner. Colin just shook his head. He showed her how to wire the detonators by sticking a small copper wire into a narrow metal rod. 
He asked her again to take off her gloves, but she refused. Still, she wished she could. Her hands were sweating fiercely within them, and they made the task cumbersome. For every piece she completed, Colin finished five. Frustrated, she tried to pick up the pace, but she kept screwing up. Lose the gloves or we won't make quota, he said. She locked her jaw and ignored him. The heat increased. She longed to take off her sweater, but Henry kept staring and winking whenever she caught his gaze. At the end of the second hour, she stretched her back. Standing on the cement floor had made her heels begin to ache, and she longed for a glass of water. When's our break? she asked Colin. You had one, he said. All last night. What about lunch? Sorry, Mary, he said. No lunch today. Her mouth grew dry. A water girl came through, ogling Colin unabashedly. Lena passed. There were clearly things floating in the jug the girl had strapped over one shoulder. She might have fished it straight from the river. Lena's head was pounding. You all right? Colin asked. One brow, the one divided by a scar, arched. She hated that he was waiting for her to give up. She wiped the sweat from her forehead and pushed on. That area behind the curtain, what is it? The hot room, he said. Don't go near it. It'll singe your hair off. Don't tell me what I can and can't do, she answered, temper on edge. But she worried what he meant. She waited for noon, then drifted nonchalantly toward the hot room. Thick plastic strips blocked a clear view, and she blinked back the tangy burst of chemicals that assaulted her senses as she drew the strips back. Inside were a dozen workers near her age, dressed the same as Colin. They stood around a table where a line of metal cylinders waited for their unprotected hands. She opened her mouth in shock, tasting the sour air. No gloves, no masks. Her father would have to be informed immediately. This was unacceptable, inhuman treatment. A thought sank its teeth into her. What if he already knew? And then, as she watched, a boy darted to the corner, leaned over a trash can, and vomited. Less than a minute later, he was back at his station. Does this look like social hours, sweetbread? Lena spun, the hard plastic sheaths slapping together behind her. Mr. Minnick glared down at her, his face red. Immediately, she lowered her gaze, skirting by him. Don't recognize me. Please don't recognize me. He didn't. And not just because of the way she was dressed, or her disheveled appearance. Something was off about him. As she passed by, she caught a strong whiff of something like cigar smoke, but more potent. She shot across the room to go to the bathroom, but two other girls had the same idea, and when Mr. Minnick caught her in line, he locked them all out with a sneer and a reminder that every minute wasted belonged to him. She dragged herself back to their station. The minutes drew together. Her vision became blurry. She would have killed for a cold glass of water and a sandwich. The heat became unbearable, and the stench of working bodies and chemicals that infused every part of Metaltown made it even worse. Her stomach turned. It's like this all the time? She asked, but she already knew the answer. Welcome to small parts, said Henry. You don't look so good. Go home, Lena, whispered Colin. He looked angry. Tell Minnick who you are. He'll call your family. I have nowhere else to go. I'm not leaving. He shook his head. The wires poked holes in her thin gloves, and the sensitive pads of her fingers bled through. She didn't stop. The ache between her temples turned to a throb. She didn't stop. Quitting time came and went. She didn't stop. Nearly two hours after the plant should have closed, Mr. Minnick reappeared at the top of the stairs. On the floor, shouted someone from her left. The blonde boy she'd seen before working in batteries. He hadn't noticed her when they'd run into each other this morning. On the floor, Colin called on. Lena's back objected when she straightened. Two men appeared at the top of the stairs, Mr. Minnick and a man with long hair that she recognized from her father's party. 
the one her brother had paid for what she'd assumed was a gambling debt. Listen up, rats, called Mr. Minnick. You all know Schultz is here to talk to you about the Brotherhood, so don't look so surprised. Wrap your crap up and get your scrawny asses in line. One by one, the machines shut off. Lena blinked back the dizziness and pushed away when Colin placed a steadying hand on her elbow. Are you done proving you're tough? He asked. Not quite, she said, still wavering. He pointed her toward the stairs. Go home, Lena. Things are about to get ugly. She mustered her best pithy look and shot at his way. What was she, a child? Exhausted, she followed him up the stairs, straining on every step. She was starving and wanted nothing more than to fall into her bed at home and sleep. Anger scalded her insides. She couldn't do anything right, not even day labor. The boy she recognized from the battery department approached. The sweat made his short blonde hair look crunchy. He glanced back at her. Who's she? Just a sub, mumbled Colin. She kept her eyes trained on the back of his heels, relieved when the boy took Colin's word for it. If she could just get past them, to the bathroom, to the foreman's office, anywhere, she could hide, wait until they were all gone, then figure out what to do. I thought Minnick hated Schultz, said the battery boy to Zeke. He does, said Colin. If we sign up for the Brotherhood, Minnick won't get to work us to the bone like he likes. Lena wondered what the Brotherhood was. It sounded like a cult. She had seen the man beside the foreman, Schultz, but never had heard his name associated with a Brotherhood before. Zeke leaned in, lowering his voice. I heard Minnick hates Schultz because Schultz beat the holy hell out of him when he was a shell. Minnick was a shell? Colin asked. Battery Boy's face scrunched. What's a shell? A fill-in worker, said Zeke. No skills, no nothing. Just some bum off the street who's so hard up he's willing to work for half our wages. Half of nothing, Battery Boy mused. I think that's still nothing, Zeke. She wondered what they did make. In all her research, she hadn't found a pay scale. Since she was technically a substitute on the line today, that should have entitled her to wages at the end of the day. But something told her not to hold her breath. What happened with Schultz? Colin asked as they crowded forward. Schultz led the stamping mill press way back when. And while they weren't working, Hampton hired all these replacement shells to do their jobs for cheap. Minnick was one of them. Schultz and his crew worked them all over pretty good, and there's been bad blood ever since. So Schultz can press, but we can't? Asked Colin. Lena perked up. Colin wanted to stage a protest? She felt a bite of betrayal, but could only blame herself. She was the one who'd walked into this situation blind. We don't want to, said Battery Boy. Come on, leave it alone already. Colin grumbled something as they got in line. Lena knew she should leave. She didn't really work here. And besides, Mr. Schultz might recognize her. Still, interest had her standing close behind Colin. Doesn't look like they hate each other anymore, commented Battery Boy. Someone's got his fix, that's why, said Zeke under his breath. As Lena drew closer, she saw what he meant. Mr. Minnick's eyes were bloodshot and too open. His cheeks were too rosy. His right shoulder kept twitching. Was he using drugs? At work? Automatically, she recorded this in her mental files, wondering if a time would come that she could tell Otto, or even her father. Mr. Walter!